The Life of Monkey D. Luffy, One Piece. Monkey D. Luffy, also known as Straw Hat Luffy, and commonly as Straw Hat, is the main protagonist of the manga and anime One Piece. He's the founder and captain of the increasingly infamous and powerful Straw Hat Pirates, as well as one of its top fighters. His lifelong dream is to become the Pirate King by finding the legendary treasure left behind by the late Goldie Roger. He believes that being the Pirate King means having the most freedom in the world. Born in Fusha Village, Luffy accidentally ate the Gomu Gomu no Mi at age 7, which turned his body into rubber. He also met red-haired Shanks, who owned and gave Luffy the very straw hat that has become Luffy's signature accessory, having gifted it to the boy as part of a promise for them to meet again someday. Luffy is the son of the revolutionary leader Monkey D. Dragon, the grandson of the marine hero Monkey D. Garp, the sworn brother of the late Fire Fist Porkas the Ace, and revolutionary chief of staff Sabo, and the foster son of Curly Dadan. He is one of the few people in the world that carry the will of D. Luffy has gone up against numerous global powers around him, starting with fighting the most powerful pirates in the East Blue and moving to clashes against the Marines, Seven Warlords of the Sea, World Nobles, and even the Four Emperors of the Grand Line. Emerging victorious in majority of these battles, Luffy's accomplishments and heritage have caused him to be labeled as a dangerous future element, earning the wrath of the Fleet Admiral Sakazuki, the Marine Headquarters, and even the World Government. Luffy also has a penchant for attracting followers and has unwillingly been named the leader of the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, consisting of seven pirate crews who swore to come to his aid whenever he wishes. After learning of this and his exploits against the Big Mom Pirates, the press has labeled him the fifth Emperor of the Sea, though many prominent figures consider this to be exaggerated. These acts, among other things, have given him his current bounty of 1 billion 500 million berry. Having had a bounty of 300 million berry before he arrived at the Saubadi Archipelago, Luffy is one of the 11 rookie pirates who simultaneously reached the red line with bounties over 100 million berry, which was received from the situation in Arabasta a group which would go on to be referred to as the worst generation, with the addition of a twelfth. Welcome to the Imagi! In today's video, we're going over the life of Monkey D. Luffy. We're almost at a million subscribers, and we'd really appreciate it if we hit it by the end of the summer, so if you enjoyed this video, you know, just check out if you're subscribed. YouTube sometimes unsubscribes users from channels, so even if you think you're subscribed, you might not be. The Imagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, also please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media accounts. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. And with all of that out of the way, let's finally get into the video. Birth and Childhood Luffy was born in Fusha Village to Monkey D. Dragon and an unknown woman. Dragon left Luffy in the care of his grandfather, Monkey D. Garp, who did many dangerous things to Luffy to make him stronger, like throwing him down a deep ravine, leaving him alone in the wild, and tying him to a balloon. Shanks and the Straw Hat when Luffy was six, Shanks and the Red Hair Pirates stationed themselves in Fusha Village. While they were there, their sniper Yasop frequently told Luffy that he had a son his age named Usopp. Luffy wanted to join the Red Hair Pirates, and after they had been in the village for nearly a year, he stabbed himself under his left eye to prove he was tough enough to be a pirate. Welcome to the Salty Spittoon. How tough are you? I had a bowl of nails for breakfast this morning. Without any milk. Uh, right this way. Sorry to keep you waiting. Spongebob should have just stabbed his left eye. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, Luffy and the Red Hair Pirates then went to the party's bar where Luffy continued to get Shanks to let him join them unsuccessfully. He found the Gomu Gomu no Mi in a chest and ate it with his meal, not knowing what it was. As he did this, the mountain bandit Higuma and his gang entered the bar and demanded sake. The bartender Makino informed them that the red-haired pirates had consumed all the sake available, and when Shanks offered them the last bottle, Higuma smashed it against his head. Shanks only responded by cleaning up the mess, and Higuma abused him some more before leaving. Luffy was outraged that Shanks didn't retaliate, and Shanks grabbed his arm when he tried to leave, causing it to stretch. The red-haired pirates realized in shock that Luffy had eaten the devil fruit they took, and revealed to Luffy that he would never be able to swim for the rest of his life. The Red Hair Pirates later set sail and Luffy enjoyed his new rubber body. One day, he was sitting in the party's bar when Higuma's gang returned. Luffy picked a fight with him and they quickly overpowered him. Before Higuma could kill Luffy, the Red Hair Pirates then arrived and Lucky Roo shot one of the bandits that threatened them before Ben Beckman defeated the rest of Higuma's men by himself. However, Higuma threw a smoke bomb and escaped to the sea with Luffy. There, he kicked Luffy overboard and a sea king known as the Lord of the Coast came and ate Higuma before going to eat Luffy. However, Shanks then arrived and saved Luffy before scaring away the sea king. 
However, Luffy was left deeply saddened due to Shanks having lost his left arm in the process of saving him. Later, the Red Hair Pirates prepared to depart Fusha Village for good, and Luffy had decided that he would instead set sail on his own. Shanks teased him about being too weak, and Luffy declared that he would become the Pirate King and form a stronger crew than Shanks's. In response, Shanks gave Luffy his straw hat, telling him to return it once he had become a great pirate. Luffy's new family, bandits and brothers. After the Red Hair Pirates left, Garp took Luffy to Mount Kolubo and placed him in the care of the mountain bandit Curly Dadan and the Dadan family. He introduced Luffy to Dadan's other ward, Port Gas the Ace, but Ace was cold towards Luffy. Every day, Ace would travel away from the Dadan family hideout, and Luffy attempted to follow him. Ace would put obstacles in his path to stop him, but Luffy continued following him. Eventually, Luffy made it to Grey Terminal, where he found Ace counting money with a boy named Sabo. When Luffy went up to them, Ace and Sabo captured him and talked about killing him to keep their secret safe. Porchemi of the Blue Jam Pirates then came walking through the woods, and as Ace and Sabo hid from him, they left Luffy to be captured. Porchemi took Luffy to his base and interrogated him about the money Ace and Sabo had stolen from his crew. Luffy refused to answer, even when Porchemi nearly beat him to death with spiked gloves. Ace and Sabo then came to the base and freed Luffy, with Ace beating Porchemi. After this incident, Luffy, Ace, and Sabo became friends and went on many adventures together, becoming known throughout the Goa Kingdom. One day, they went to a restaurant in Goa and broke out without paying. As they ran away, a man called out to Sabo, though Sabo didn't respond. After escaping the city, Luffy and Ace forced Sabo to tell them who that man was. Sabo admitted that the man was his father and a member of Goa's nobility. He had run away from his family due to their preoccupation with maintaining their status. Luffy, Ace, and Sabo then shared their dreams, deciding to sail as pirates to achieve them when they turned 17. They then exchanged sake cups to become sworn brothers, solidifying their bond. The three brothers continued adventuring and honing their abilities with Luffy struggling to attack properly with his devil fruit. However, their time was cut short as Sabo's father had the Blue Jam Pirates capture Luffy and Ace to force Sabo to return to his family. Sabo agreed to return on the condition that the Blue Jam Pirates didn't harm Luffy and Ace. After Sabo left, Blue Jam put Luffy and Ace to work, moving boxes around Grey Terminal. A few days later, Blue Jam told the two brothers to help him burn down Grey Terminal that night. Luffy and Ace refused, and Blue Jam asked about the location of their treasure. They didn't tell him, causing him to tie them to a pole in Grey Terminal. As night fell, the Blue Jam pirates set Grey Terminal ablaze, and Ace managed to free himself and Luffy as flames surrounded them. The Blue Jam pirates then confronted the duo with getting the location of their treasure, but Ace knocked most of them out with Hao Shoku Haki before the Dadan family came to the rescue. Luffy fled Grey Terminal with the Dadan family, while Ace and Dadan stayed behind to fight Blue Jam. The following day, Ace and Dadan returned to Mount Kolubo, heavily injured but alive. However, Dogra later told Luffy and Ace that Sabo had been killed by a world noble while setting out to sea, leaving them devastated. Luffy went to the coast and cried all night, and Ace came to him the next morning. Luffy made Ace promise that he wouldn't die, swearing to become stronger. For the next seven years, the two continued adventuring and training to get stronger, with Luffy learning to throw effective long-range punches with his stretching. A 14-year-old Luffy then bid farewell to Ace, who sailed out to sea as a pirate upon turning 17. Three more years passed before Luffy became a pirate himself, and he bid farewell to the Dandan family before going to Fusha Village to say goodbye and set sail. When the Lord of the Coast emerged to confront him, Luffy punched it away with Gomu Gomu no pistol. As he sailed, Luffy plotted to recruit 10 crewmates, get a Jolly Roger, and become the Pirate King. Romance Dawn Arc The first thing that Luffy came across on his voyage was a whirlpool, which pulled his ship in. Luffy managed to survive by hiding in a barrel which washed ashore on Goat Island. The Elvira Pirates' cabin boy, Kobe, rolled the barrel to a storehouse, and some of his crewmates went to open it, causing Luffy to knock them out as he emerged accidentally. Luffy asked Kobe for a ship, and Kobe gave him a boat he had made to escape, revealing that he was serving the Elvira Pirates against his will, but was too afraid to try to get away. Luffy didn't think much of Kobe's lack of resolve, telling the cabin boy that he intended to become Pirate King. Kobe's captain, Alvira, then came and destroyed the boat, but as she confronted Kobe, the cabin boy found the resolve to stand up to her. Luffy was impressed with Kobe and intercepted Alvida's attempt to strike Kobe with her mace. The mace didn't affect Luffy and he knocked out Alvida with one punch. Luffy then told the Alvida pirates to get him and Kobe a boat, and they complied. As they sailed, Kobe was concerned about the fate Luffy would meet when sailing on the Grand Line, known as the Pirate's Graveyard. Luffy replied that he would assemble a powerful crew, starting with the powerful bounty hunter, Roronoa Zoro. With Kobe's navigation skills, they made it to Shellstown, where Zoro was being held captive by the Marines led by Captain Morgan. After eating at a restaurant, Luffy and Kobe prepared to split up at the Marine base. Luffy looked over the wall and saw Zoro tied up, and Zoro offered to help him if he was freed. 
Luffy and Kobe then watched as a little girl named Rika climbed over the wall to feed Zoro some rice balls. However, Morgan's son Helmeppo then came and stopped her, having his marine guards throw her over the wall. Luffy caught Rika, and as Helmeppo's group left, he climbed over the wall to talk to Zoro. Zoro refused to join Luffy's crew, saying Helmeppo had promised to let him go free if he could survive without nourishment for a month. However, he asked Luffy to feed him Rika's rice balls that Helmeppo had smashed into the ground and told him to tell Rika that they were delicious. Luffy returned to Shellstown and relayed the message to Rika, and she revealed that Zoro was imprisoned after protecting her from Helmeppo's dog. Helmeppo then came into town and announced to the citizens that Zoro would be executed, and when Luffy questioned his promise, he revealed that it was a lie. Luffy then punched Helmeppo, and as Kobe held him back from attacking him more, Helmeppo said his father would get revenge on Luffy. Luffy then went back to the marine base to recruit Zoro again. When he found out that the marines had confiscated Zoro's sword, Luffy went to find them and offered to give them back if Zoro joined his crew. Hearing voices on the roof of the base, Luffy stretched his arms and pulled himself up. However, he sent himself flying over the top and grabbed the ropes that the marines were using to erect a statue of Morgan, causing the statue to fall and break. Luffy then captured Helmeppo and ran inside, telling Helmeppo to give him the location of Zoro's sword. Helmeppo did so, and Luffy used him as a shield to keep him from being shot by the marines. Luffy went to Helmeppo's room, where he saw three swords. Seeing Zoro and Kobe being confronted by Morgan and the marines outside, Luffy took all the swords and jumped out the window, intercepting the bullets being shot at Zoro and Kobe. Luffy's rubber body absorbed the bullets and sent them flying back at the marines. Zoro said that all three of the swords were his, and agreed to join Luffy if they survived this battle. As Luffy tried to untie Zoro, Zoro told him to give him his swords instead. Zoro cut himself free to intercept the charging marines, and Luffy kicked all of them away. As Morgan told his subordinates to shoot themselves, Luffy attacked the marine captain and quickly overpowered him. Helmeppo then threatened to shoot Kobe, and Luffy turned to attack him, turning his back on Morgan. However, Luffy was able to punch Helmeppo as Zoro cut down Morgan. To the pirate's surprise, the marines celebrated the defeat of their captain. Luffy, Zoro, and Kobe then went to eat at Rika's family's restaurant, but the marines came and told them they had to leave. They questioned if Kobe was going with them, and Luffy started talking about Kobe's past to goad Kobe into hitting him. This plan worked, and Kobe joined the marines. As Luffy and Zoro set sail, Kobe and the marines came to the coast and saluted them as thanks for freeing them from Morgan. Orange Town Arc as they sailed toward the Grand Line, Luffy and Zoro realized that neither of them had any navigation ability. They quickly grew hungry and Luffy attempted to catch a bird flying above them, only to be dragged away by the bird. The bird flew over Orangetown where the buggy pirates shot a cannonball at it. The bird dropped Luffy into the cannonball's path, blasting him onto the ground between a woman and a group of buggy pirates chasing her. The woman greeted Luffy as her boss, causing the pirates to attack him to find a treasure map she had stolen. They knocked Luffy's hat off, causing him to defeat them quickly. Afterwards, the woman asked Luffy if he wanted to join her, saying her name was Nami, and she stole from pirates. Luffy refused to join Nami, and they went into a house as she told him that she was planning to use Captain Buggy's treasure map to reach the Grand Line and rob even more powerful pirates. When he found out that Nami was a skilled navigator, Luffy asked her to join his crew, but she refused due to hating pirates. However, Nami said she would go with him if he went with her to visit Buggy. Luffy did so, but to his shock, Nami tied him up and offered him to Buggy as a prisoner, causing Buggy to put him in a cage. As the Buggy pirates partied on the roof of the tavern, Luffy tried biting through the bars and pleading to be let go. Buggy decided to execute Luffy with a buggy ball, and he leveled an entire row of houses to demonstrate its power. He told Nami to fire the buggy ball at Luffy, but she decided not to and rebelled against the Buggy pirates. As the Buggy pirates went to attack her, Zoro arrived and stopped them. Zoro then cut Buggy into pieces, but Buggy revealed that he could separate his body at will with the Bada Bada no Mi, as he stabbed Zoro with his disembodied hand. Luffy then called Buggy Big Nose, causing Buggy to send one of his hands to cut Luffy with a knife. However, Luffy caught and broke the knife with his teeth, and he had Zoro and Nami flip the cannon around and fire the Buggy Ball at the Buggy Pirates. Afterwards, Zoro picked up the cage and dragged Luffy away from the tavern. In front of a pet food store, they stopped in front of a dog named Shushu, Luffy poked Shushu to see if he was alive, causing Shushu to attack him. Nami then found Luffy and Zoro and gave him the key to Luffy's cage, but Shushu immediately ate it. As Luffy was shaking Shushu, Mayor Boodle came and told him to stop, explaining why Shushu stood in front of the store. Buggy subordinate Moji then came to confront Luffy on his lion, Richie, and Richie destroyed the cage in a single attack. The lion then hit Luffy through a house and onto the street behind it, though Luffy was unharmed. Luffy then walked back to find Zoro, and he saw that Moji had set the pet food store ablaze. He confronted Moji and Richie and defeated the lion by spinning his arms around before grabbing his face and spinning him face first into the ground. 
Luffy then grabbed Moji and defeated him with one punch to the ground. Luffy went back to the store and gave Shushu the pet food that Moji had taken. Boodle had enough of Buggy's tyranny and went to fight him, and Buggy demolished many of the buildings around them with a Buggy Ball. Zoro emerged unharmed from the destruction, and Luffy intended to help Boodle. Nami agreed to work with him, even though she still refused to be a pirate. Luffy came to the tavern where he removed Buggy's disembodied hand from Boodle's neck. Boodle protested against the pirates helping him, and Luffy knocked him out because he was getting in their way. Luffy insulted Buggy again, and the pirate shot a Buggy Ball at him. However, Luffy ballooned himself with Gomu Gomu no Fusen and sent the Buggy Ball flying back, demolishing the tavern. Buggy emerged from the wreckage and threw Moji at Luffy, and Luffy easily kicked him aside. Luffy then confronted Buggy and dodged the clown's long-distance knife strikes with his disembodied hands and legs. Buggy split off his body parts to dodge Luffy's attacks and managed to graze Luffy's face and damage his straw hat with a knife before stabbing the straw hat again. Luffy was enraged to see Buggy damaging his hat, which Buggy recognized as he was once on the same ship as Shanks. Luffy punched Buggy in the stomach, telling him to never compare himself to Shanks. Buggy split himself into many pieces and flew them around to prevent Luffy from attacking him, but Luffy noticed his feet on the ground and tickled them. While Buggy was caught off guard, Nami attempted to hit him with a bag of treasure, but he grabbed it instead. However, Luffy ran up and kicked Buggy in the face, and he saw Buggy's map to the Grand Line fall to the ground. Buggy then attempted to reform his body, but only got his hands and feet back as Nami had tied up his other parts. Luffy then hit Buggy with Gomu Gomu no Bazooka, sending him flying off the island. Luffy and Nami gathered up Buggy's treasure, with Nami agreeing to join the crew and find more treasure. They returned to Zoro and were confronted by the citizens, who were concerned with Boodle. Luffy admitted that he was a pirate and had knocked out the mayor, causing the citizens to chase after them in anger. However, Shushu then stopped the citizens from chasing the Straw Hats, and Luffy left Buggy's treasure behind for the citizens to rebuild their town. Later, Nami found out that Luffy left the money behind and got mad at him, but then left. Syrup Village Arc the man in a chest. Nami fixed Luffy's straw hat, and Luffy and Zoro wondered what they should do next. When they spotted a nearby island, they immediately rode toward it despite Nami's protests. Luffy and Nami disembarked on the seemingly uninhabited island, leaving Zoro to sleep on the ship. Luffy and Nami met several strange animal hybrids, and a man called out to them from afar, calling himself the island's guardian and telling them to leave. Luffy and Nami ignored him, causing him to shoot Luffy. They then spotted the Guardian, a man named Gaimon who was stuck in a treasure chest. Luffy and Nami talked to Gaimon and told them about their voyage, and he warned them that they would likely die trying to conquer the Grand Line. Gaimon then told them that he was once a pirate, and he had attempted to find treasure on this island on top of a cliff. However, he fell off the cliff and into a chest, and his crewmates had left him on the island. He couldn't even reach the treasure again due to being stuck in the chest. Luffy and Nami offered to go and get the treasure for Gaimon, and Luffy pulled himself up to the cliff face. He said nothing once he got the treasure, and Gaimon understood that the chests were empty. Luffy asked Gaimon to join his crew and find the One Piece with him, but Gaimon decided to remain behind on the island and continue taking care of the animals. The Straw Hats then bid farewell to Gaimon and sailed off the island. Sarah Village Arc, Meeting a Liar Nami told Luffy that they needed a plan ahead to find a real ship and more crewmates before they headed to the Grand Line, and she plotted for them to sail to the nearby Syrup village. When the Straw Hats made landfall, they noticed the Usopp pirates spying on them from atop a cliff. The captain, Usopp, tried scaring them away by claiming he had 80 million men, but they knew he was lying. They went with him to the village restaurant, and he said their likeliest chance of getting a ship was by asking Kaya, a bedridden girl who lived in a mansion. Usopp offered to join the crew as their captain, but they refused. Usopp then left to see Kaya, and the Straw Hats came to her mansion and climbed over her gate and met her and Usopp at her window. However, Kaya's butler, Klahador, then came and confronted the group, saying he and Kaya could not give the Straw Hats a ship. He then degraded Usopp for being the son of a pirate, and as Usopp punched him, Luffy remembered hearing about Usopp from Yasop. Klahador forced the Straw Hats and Usopp pirates off their property, and Luffy left Zoro and Nami to find Usopp on the cliff over the coast. There, he revealed to Usopp that he had met his father. However, Luffy and Usopp then spotted Klahador meeting with Jango on the beach below and overheard them plotting to murder Kaya so Klahador could inherit her fortune. They found out that Klahador was actually the pirate Kuro, and his crew, the Black Cat Pirates, was planning to raid Sir Village during Kaya's assassination. Luffy shouted at the duo that they had heard them, and Jango hypnotized Luffy to put him to sleep. Luffy fell off a cliff and was unharmed but remained asleep, so Kuro and Jango believed him to be dead and left him there. Luffy was found by Zoro, Nami, and Usopp's underlings, and he told them about Kuro's plot. As they headed back to Syrup Village, Usopp came and lied to his crew that he had lied about the impending pirate attack. 
As night fell, Usopp and the Straw Hats camped out on the beach, and Usopp swore to fend off the Black Hat Pirates, with the Straw Hats offering to help him. They decided to wait for the Black Hat Pirates at the path to the village and put oil on the path to impede their progress. However, they then heard the pirates coming from the north, and Usopp realized that they were heading towards Syrup Village from the opposite coast. Eventually, he and Zoro managed to make it to the North Pass and beat back the Black Hat Pirates. Jango hypnotized his subordinates to get up and become stronger, but Luffy fell under the hypnotism as well and charged towards the pirates. He easily beat all of them up and ripped off the stem and figurehead of the ship to swing at them, but Jango then hypnotized him to fall asleep, causing him to collapse with the stem pinning him to the ground. Luffy was eventually woken up by Nami stepping on his head and rejoined the fight to which Kuro had arrived. Luffy started battling Kuro. Kuro dodged Luffy's attacks with his sheer speed and stood on Luffy's outstretched arm, allowing him to run on it and kick Luffy in the face. However, Luffy managed to intercept Kuro's left hand cat claws with a rock, allowing him to rip them off. In response, Kuro initiated his ultimate move, Shakushi, in which he raced around the clearing at a blinding speed and indiscriminately attacked both Luffy and his subordinates. However, as Kuro slashed Luffy across his chest, Luffy was able to grab onto his jacket and slam him to the ground. Luffy then wrapped his arms and legs around Kuro and headbutted him with Gomu Gomu no Kane, defeating him. Luffy threw Kuro back to the Black Hat Pirates, allowing them to run away. He then collapsed due to blood loss and was caught by Nami. Later, Luffy, Zoro, and Nami were eating at the village restaurant when Kaya came to offer them a ship. She took them to the coast where she and Mary presented them with a caravel named the Going Mary. Usopp then came rolling down to the coast to start his own voyage, but the Straw Hats told him to come aboard and join them. They then sailed away on the Going Mary and partied as a crew of four. Barati Ark, The Floating Restaurant As the Straw Hats sailed on their new ship, Luffy drew his vision of the crew's Jolly Roger, but Usopp drew a final version due to Luffy's poor art skills. Later, as the Straw Hats sat indoors, the bounty hunter Johnny came on board and caused a commotion. When Luffy came out, Johnny revealed that his partner Yosaku was on the verge of death, and Nami recognized that Yosaku had scurvy, and so instructed Luffy and Usopp to give him some lime juice. After Yosaku regained his strength, the Straw Hats decided that they needed a cook before going to the Grand Line, and the two bounty hunters told them that they could find one to recruit at the floating sea restaurant Baratie. Two to three days later, the Straw Hats reached Baratie. The Marine Lieutenant Fullbody pulled up alongside them and had his crew fire a cannonball at the Mary. Luffy deflected the cannonball with Gomu Gomu no Fusen, but accidentally sent it flying into Baratie. He was then apprehended by Baratie's staff and taken to the head chef, Zef. And since he didn't have money to pay for the damage, Zef made him work in the kitchen for a year. Luffy protested against this sentence, causing Zef to attack him. However, their scuffle inadvertently caused them to fall through the floor. They fell into the seating area where they saw the sous chef Sanji beating up Full Body. Gin of the Krieg Pirates then came into the restaurant from Full Body's ship, but was forced out by the cooks due to not having any money. However, Luffy later watched from afar as Sanji secretly fed Gin outside and decided that Sanji would be his crew's cook. Luffy then approached Sanji and Gin and attempted to recruit the former, but the sous chef declined. After hearing of Luffy's goal, Gin warned him against going to the Grand Line. Two days later, Gin brought his captain Don Krieg to Baratie, and Sanji fed the starving pirate despite the other cook's wishes. However, Krieg then attacked Sanji after returning to full strength and decided to take over Baratie to take his crew back to the Grand Line after being chased out. Luffy challenged Krieg to prevent him from conquering the Grand Line before him, and the cooks intended to fight as well. As Krieg went out, a commotion suddenly started outside, and Luffy, Zoro, and Usopp went to check on Johnny and Yosaku. The bounty hunters were left hanging on the edge of the Baratie as they revealed that Nami had taken the crew's treasure and the Going Merry. Intent on having Nami as his crew's navigator, Luffy told Zoro and Usopp to take Johnny and Yosaku's ship and chase after her. Zoro, Usopp, Johnny, and Yosaku then left to pursue Nami, with Luffy staying on Baratie to fight the Krieg pirates and recruit Sanji. Baratie Arc, Battle for the Baratie Luffy pulled himself towards the Krieg pirates and hit several of them at once with his outstretched arms. He watched as Baratie's front deck expanded and the cooks rushed into the battle. As Sanji battled Gin, Luffy charged toward Krieg to fight him but was forced back as Krieg rapidly fired stakes at him. Luffy tried charging again while Krieg was distracted but to the same result. Luffy rushed toward him again and kept running even as stakes hit him. Krieg shrouded himself in a spiked cloak when Luffy geared up to punch him, but Luffy simply punched through it and injured his hand to hit him. Krieg got up and repelled Luffy, but Luffy then kicked him in the head. 
Krieg continued to try to hit him with explosions, but Luffy swung around the mast in the wreckage and barraged Krieg with attacks. Krieg was unharmed due to his steel armor and stood atop the mast as he unleashed bombs on the wreckage below. But Luffy then jumped over him in midair and slammed both his fists into his chest with Gomu Gomu no Bazooka, which finally broke his armor. Although now injured, Krieg quickly responded by shooting an iron net around Luffy so he could throw him into the sea. However, Luffy managed to get his legs out of the net and twist them around until he clasped Krieg's face with his feet. He then spun Krieg around and slammed him into Baratie's deck with Gomu Gomu no Uzuchi, defeating him. Luffy landed in the ocean but was quickly rescued by Sanji. Luffy woke up on a bed in Baratie and Sanji told him that Gin had hoped to meet him again in the Grand Line. Luffy asked Sanji to join the crew, and Sanji wished to remain at Baratie, but did tell Luffy that he dreamed of going to the Grand Line someday to find the legendary sea all blue. The Baratie cooks then fed Luffy and they abused Sanji to try to get him to leave. When Sanji went outside, they told Luffy to take him as a crewmate, but Luffy refused until Sanji himself accepted. Yosaku then swam to the Baratie and told Luffy that they had tracked Nami's course to an unbelievable island. Luffy immediately went to head off and Sanji then agreed to join him. Luffy and Yosaku boarded a small ship belonging to Sanji and Sanji bid a tearful farewell to Zeph and his co-workers before he set sail with his new captain. Arlong Park Arc Encounter with the Worst Man of the East Blue as Yosaku took Luffy and Sanji to Nami's location, he told them about the Seven Warlords of the Sea, one of three organizations with power over the Grand Line. He revealed that one of them, Captain Jinbei of the Fishman Pirates, had unleashed a fearsome fishman known as Arlong into the East Blue, and Nami had likely gone to his base at Arlong Park. Luffy was intrigued to hear of fishmen and drew a picture of what he thought one would look like. As Sanji prepared food for them, the giant sea cow Momu approached the trio's ship. Luffy punched Momu to keep it away from their food but only made it mad. Sanji tried to feed Momu but then beat the sea cow into submission after it wanted to eat him as well. And so the crew made Momu pull them to Arlong Park. Momu eventually reached Arlong Park and crashed into the shore, sending Luffy, Sanji, and Yosaku flying over the island on their ship. They landed in a clearing and crashed into Zoro in the process. And as the four of them recovered from the landing, Johnny ran toward them and revealed that Nami had killed Usopp. Luffy refused to believe Johnny and was about to attack him when Nami approached them. She confirmed Johnny's report and told the Straw Hats to leave the island, saying she only pretended to be their friend to steal from them for her real Captain Arlong. Johnny and Yosaku decided to take her advice and leave, but Luffy chose instead to lie down and take a nap. Sometime later, Usopp came across Luffy's group and revealed that Nami had only pretended to kill him to save his life from Arlong. He believed that Nami had an ulterior motive for working with Arlong. Nami's older sister, Nojiko, then approached the Straw Hats and told them that they should leave this island, but she offered to explain everything before they did. However, Luffy had no interest in hearing her explanation and so walked away. Luffy walked to Kokoyasi village, and he watched as Marine's 16th branch Captain Nezumi led a raid on Nami's home to confiscate the money she had stolen. Luffy asked Nami if he could help during the commotion, but she angrily told him she wanted nothing to do with him before running away. Nami later returned to try to stop the villagers from going to attack Arlong, but failed. She then started stabbing her Arlong pirate's tattoo when Luffy grabbed her arm to stop her. Nami tried to get Luffy to leave, but she eventually broke down and asked for him to help as he stayed. Luffy accepted this request as he put his straw hat on her head and headed for Arlong Park. And when he reached Zoro, Usopp, and Sanji, they immediately went along with him. Luffy then punched through the gate to Arlong Park and asked which fishman was Arlong. Arlong Park Arc, Destruction of Arlong Park After Arlong identified himself, Luffy beat aside two of his subordinates before punching the fishman. Hachan then summoned Momu to come to their aid, and although the sea cow was afraid of Luffy and Sanji, Arlong intimidated it into attacking. However, Luffy planted his feet in the concrete and grabbed onto Momu's horns. He then spun it around Arlong Park, taking down several of the Arlong pirates before hurling the sea cow into the ocean. Luffy was unable to get his feet out of the concrete though, forcing his crew to protect him and try to pull him out as they fought off the Arlong pirates. Luffy attempted to punch Arlong but missed, and the fishman tore off a chunk of the concrete that Luffy was stuck in and threw it into the pool, causing it to pull Luffy to the bottom. Luffy could do nothing but hold his breath and couldn't hold it for long enough as he fell unconscious and started swallowing water. Nojiko and Genzo swam down to Luffy and pulled his head above water before taking turns holding it and pumping his chest to force the swallowed water out. Eventually, Luffy regained consciousness and Sanji managed to go down and destroy the concrete chunk, causing Luffy's body to fly out of the pool. Luffy pulled himself toward Arlong and punched him with a variety of attacks that inflicted minor damage. 
Arlong mocked Luffy for his physical inferiority as a human and questioned what skill sets Luffy had in comparison to his crewmates. Luffy simply replied that his skill set was beating Arlong. Arlong then attempted to bite Luffy with his powerful teeth, and Luffy tried breaking them only to find that the fishman could instantly regrow them. Luffy knocked out multiple sets of Arlong's teeth and tried to use them as weapons, but his attempt to bite Arlong did little damage due to his lesser jaw strength. Arlong responded by biting Luffy in the shoulder, but Luffy managed to dislodge the fishman's jaw by slamming him into the ground, preventing his arm from being bitten off. Arlong's attacks forced Luffy up the tower, and the fishman eventually hit the pirate through the wall and into a room on an upper level. Arlong revealed that this room was where Nami spent the last eight years making sea charts for him to use to take over the East Blue, and Luffy grew enraged as Arlong spoke of Nami as little more than his property. After shattering one of the blades on Kiribachi, Luffy started destroying the equipment in the room to prevent Nami from ever going there again, knocking them through the walls and causing them to fall to the ground below. Arlong bit Luffy's neck to stop him, but Luffy grabbed his nose and snapped it out of place. He then stretched his leg up and smashed Arlong through the floor with Gomu Gomu no Battle Axe, sending him crashing all the way to the ground and defeating him. The destruction caused by the attack resulted in the tower collapsing, but Luffy emerged from the wreckage victorious and declared that Nami was now his crewmate. Nezumi then stepped in with his men to announce that he would be taking the Arlong Pirates' money as well as the credit for their defeat, but the Straw Hats beat them up. As they swam away, Nezumi promised revenge on Luffy. Later, Luffy was with Zoro as the latter had his wound from Mihawk stitched up, and the doctor and Nako recommended that they find a doctor for their crew. The pirates and villagers then partied into the night, and Luffy encountered Genzo at a gravesite while looking for a raw ham melon. Genzo made it clear to Luffy that he would kill him if he made Nami stop smiling. On the day of departure, Johnny and Yosaku bid farewell to the Straw Hats as they resumed their lives as bounty hunters. As the Straw Hats waited for Nami to come aboard, she told them to start sailing from the back of the crowd of villagers. She then raced through the crowd and leaped onto the Mary, and Luffy laughed as she revealed that she had pickpocketed the villagers. Logue Town Arc Nami purchased the newspaper as the Straw Hats were sailing, and the crew discovered that Luffy had received a 30 million berry bounty as his bounty poster slipped out of the paper. They decided it was time to head straight for the Grand Line, and came across an island known as Logetown that was close to the entrance. Nami revealed that it was the site of the Pirate King Gold Roger's execution, so when the crew docked there, Luffy went to go see the execution platform. Luffy reached the execution platform and climbed up it. A police officer ordered him to come down but was then attacked by Alvida who had become much thinner after eating the Sube Sube no Mi. Alvida said that she now admired Luffy after being defeated by him, but he didn't recognize her. After she revealed who she was, the Buggy Pirates then made their entrance. Buggy revealed that he had formed an alliance with Alvida to get revenge on Luffy, and sentenced him to a flashy execution as Kabaji trapped Luffy by forcing him to the floor and putting a block on his neck. Buggy asked Luffy if he had any last words, and Luffy proclaimed to the crowd that he would become the Pirate King. Zoro and Sanji arrived and attempted to rescue Luffy, but with Buggy's sword swinging towards his neck, Luffy could only smile and accept his death. However, lightning then struck and destroyed the execution platform, which incapacitated Buggy but left Luffy unharmed. Zoro and Sanji then dragged him away from the approaching horde of marines and ran back to the Merry as a thunderstorm began. On the way, they were confronted by the marine Tashigi, and Zoro stayed behind to fight her. Marine Captain Smoker then confronted them and used his Moku Moku no Mi abilities to grab Luffy with a plume of smoke. Luffy tried attacking Smoker, but the Marine turned his body into smoke to pass through the attack before subduing Luffy. However, a mysterious wanted man known as Dragon then came to stop Smoker, and a powerful gust of wind forced Smoker away from Luffy. Luffy and his crew managed to run back to the Mary and set sail. As Nami navigated the crew through the powerful storm, she told them that the entrance to the Grand Line was past the lighthouse in front of them. Sanji brought a barrel to commemorate this moment, and each of the Straw Hats proclaimed their dream while placing one foot on top of the barrel. Once each of them had done this, they destroyed the barrel and headed for the Grand Line. Alabaster Saga, Reverse Mountain Nami navigated the Straw Hats up the Reverse Mountain where the four ocean currents converged, creating an upward draft. They came to an unexpected surprise, which was a gigantic whale in their way. Fortunately, Luffy was able to slow down the Going Merry before it could hit the whale by firing a cannon. However, in the process, Luffy's favorite seat, the Going Merry's figurehead, was broken. Angered by this, Luffy punched the whale's eye to the shock of the rest of Luffy's crew. In response to Luffy's attack, the whale swallowed the Going Merry. While inside the whale, Luffy accidentally bumped into two strangely dressed people and into the whale's stomach as the whale began thrashing at the red line. 
Within the whale's stomach, Luffy was reunited with his crew and witnessed the scene between the two people he bumped into earlier and an old man living in the whale. From the scene, Luffy learned that the duo, Miss Wednesday and Mr. Nine, were planning to kill the whale for food and not even allow the old man, Crocus, to stand in their way. Seeing this and Crocus' attempt to save the whale, Luffy took out the two troublemakers. For doing this, Luffy and his crew were led out of the whale by Crocus. As Luffy's crew and ship were led out through a canal in the whale and outside to a nearby cape, Luffy and his crew were told about Laboon's tale. From it, Luffy learned that Laboon had been waiting for over 50 years for some pirate friends of his who left him behind in the cape to journey the Grand Line. Luffy also learned that after Laboon heard in disbelief that the pirates might have abandoned him, the whale was ramming the mountain itself in a futile attempt to reunite with them. Seeing Laboon's loyalty, Luffy decided to ease the lonely whale's pain by ramming the Going Mary's mast into an open wound. Having caught the whale's attention, Luffy and the whale began to battle. However, in the middle of it, Luffy told Laboon that they would have to put the fight on hold since he was planning to travel the Grand Line. With this statement, Luffy touched Laboon's feelings and the whale agreed. Having given hope once again to Laboon, Luffy painted a crudely drawn painting of his Jolly Roger on Laboon's scars as a symbol of their pact to meet once again. After rekindling Laboon's hopes once again, Luffy and the rest of his crew suddenly realized that their compass wasn't working. With that matter at hand, Luffy and the rest were then taught by Crocus about how the Grand Line works and how they needed a special compass called a log pose. Fortunately, Crocus had an extra one for Luffy and his crew to use. In the midst of what was happening, Luffy and his crew also encountered again the two people who tried to kill Laboon. Learning that these two needed to report back to the company they were working for, Luffy and the rest were requested by them to give them a ride back to their island of Whiskey Peak. Though a bit suspicious, they learned that Whiskey Peak is on one of the paths that the Straw Hats needed to follow to travel the Grand Line anyway. Thus, Luffy and his crew took the two aboard and sailed towards Whiskey Peak, leaving Laboon with the promise of returning once again. Alabasta Saga Whiskey Peak Arc Upon arriving in Whiskey Peak, Luffy and his crew were caught by surprise. Though the two people they took aboard left before they could land, Luffy and his crew were welcomed graciously by the townspeople of Whiskey Peak. There, Luffy and his crew were treated as gods with a grand party. Luffy even ate more than the cooks could put out. Eventually, Luffy passed out from all the excitement of such a celebratory day. However, when he woke later that night, Luffy came to a shocking sight. Scattered everywhere before Luffy were the beaten up bodies of the townspeople that served him and his crew. Upon learning from one of them that they were defeated by Zoro, Luffy thought that Zoro attacked them as an act of ungratefulness. Confronting Zoro, Luffy and his first crewmate collided into battle that apparently nothing could deter them from. The two were so immersed in their battle against one another that they completely ignored and defeated two other people in the same scene, Mr. Five and Miss Valentine, who were apparently distracting them for some reason. It was only when Nami stepped in and interrupted their fight that the two calmed down to listen to reason. Luffy then learned everything that happened while he was asleep. He also learned that one of the two strangely dressed people that tried to kill Laboon before, Miss Wednesday, was actually Princess Nefertari Vivi of the Kingdom of Alabasta in disguise. From her, Luffy learned that she, her pet dog Karu, and loyal retainer Igarum had infiltrated a secret criminal organization known as Baroque Works in order to learn the organization's reasons for meddling in their country's affairs. Also from Vivi, Luffy and his crew not only learned of Baroque Works' scheme to take over Alabasta, but also that the criminal organization was led by none other than one of the seven warlords of the sea, Crocodile. Having gotten involved in all of this, Luffy and his crew decided to help Vivi by taking her and Karu to Alabasta while Igarum distracted Baroque Works with a disguise. However, in the midst of this plan, Luffy and the rest witness Igarum's ship engulfed in an explosion. Miss All Sunday, Crocodile's partner and vice president of Baroque Works, suddenly announced herself as she sat on the Going Merry sails. Fortunately, apart from the tense formalities between them and her, Luffy and his crew didn't have to fight her as she let them go for her own reasons. Having survived from the ordeals of Whiskey Peak and gaining a mission to help a princess, Luffy and his crew sailed away from Whiskey Peak to their next destination, Little Garden. Alabasta Saga, Little Garden Arc Luffy and his crew eventually arrived at Little Garden. The jungle island fascinated Luffy, not only because of the adventure it could provide, but also because it contained all sorts of prehistoric animals, which ranged from saber-toothed tigers to dinosaurs. Luffy decided to venture out of their ship and explore. Vivi and Karu decided to travel with Luffy to escape her boredom. Luffy learned that the reason the island was like this was due to the Grand Line's unique environmental conditions. The islands within developed much more differently than they normally would, and the very island they were on was still in the dinosaur era. As Luffy ventured the island with Vivi and Karu, the three soon discovered something much larger than the dinosaurs on the island. 
In the midst of Luffy messing around with the Brontosaurus, the other members of the crew met a giant. Meeting Dory, Luffy and his companions were invited over to the giant's place. There, Luffy was treated to some dinosaur meat and got acquainted with Dory. From the giant, Luffy learned that he was staying on Little Garden in order to settle an argument with another fellow giant, Brogi, in battle. As the matter was being discussed, the island's volcano erupted, signaling the next match between giants. With it, Luffy witnessed a titanic clash between two giant warriors that awed him. Eventually, the match ended in a draw and Luffy continued talking with Dory. Learning further about Little Garden's magnetic field from Dory, Luffy also learned about two of his crew staying with Brogi. Just as things seemed to be going well at the moment, something suddenly shocked Luffy and those with him. A barrel of sake that Dory was drinking exploded. Since the sake was taken from Luffy's ship and given to Dory by Brogi, Luffy and his crew were suspected of sabotaging the barrel. With this, Luffy and Dory got into a fight. Fortunately, Luffy was able to knock Dory down. However, with this sudden turn of events, Luffy started to suspect that his crew were not the only ones on the island as neither they nor Brogi would do such a thing. Before Luffy and those with him could do anything else, the volcano erupted again and Dory got back up. With the next match being signaled and knowing that the giant's fight was tainted by someone else, Luffy tried to convince Dory not to go. However, Luffy's words didn't reach Dory's ears due to the giant's pride and Luffy was pinned down by Dory with the giant's home. Unable to get out of his predicament to help Dory, Luffy suddenly encountered Usopp who had wandered into Dory's home. Reunited with his crewmate, Luffy and Vivi recounted what had just happened and were likewise filled in by Usopp. As Luffy and his companions were figuring out what to do next, they heard the awful scream of Dory being defeated by Brogi due to the tainted fight. Angered even more by this, Luffy was filled with more determination to find out who dishonored the giant's fight. Fortunately, Luffy didn't have to wait long to find out who it was, as two of the perpetrators of the crime, Mr. Five and Miss Valentine, suddenly came before Luffy and his companions, bringing a beaten up Karu who had separated from Luffy and Vivi at an earlier time. Because of his current predicament, Luffy was unable to aid his companions and was hit by an explosive kick caused by Mr. Five's Bomu Bomu no Mi powers. Unable to protect Vivi from these Baroque work agents, Luffy and the other two with him were left for dead. As Luffy and the two with him were lying, they decided to get revenge for the atrocity caused by the Baroque Works agents. They eventually got back on their feet and charged immediately to where the Baroque Works agents were holding their friends. Luffy and company arrived and found that their friends were being made into wax statues by Mr. Three's Doru Doru no Mi powers. Luffy engaged in battle with the artist while his comrades battled with the rest of the agents. Despite some complications from Mr. Three and his partner, Miss Golden Week, Luffy was able to free his captured friends with a little help from Usopp. After finishing off Mr. Three, Luffy rejoined the rest of his crew to the marvelous relief. Due to the giant's weapons being worn out from 100 years worth of fighting, Dory was actually okay and had instead passed out from the wound inflicted. With everything done, Luffy and the rest went back to Dory's place to treat his wounds. As Luffy and everyone were resting from the ordeal and wondering how to deal with the island's magnetic field, they were rejoined by Sanji who brought with him some great news. From Sanji, Luffy and the rest learned that not only did Sanji trick Crocodile into thinking they were all dead by pretending to be Mr. Three via Den Den Mushi Call, but the cook also brought with him the solution to their current problem, an eternal pose to Alabasta. With the eternal pose, Luffy and crew bid their farewells to the giants and set off. As Luffy and crew sailed off from Little Garden, they were provided by the giants with an act of gratitude. With help from the giant's strength, Luffy and crew were able to pass through a giant goldfish and sail on. Alabasta Saga, Drum Island Arc. After Nami suddenly came down with a terrible sickness, the crew decided to alter their course from Alabasta and instead look for a nearby island to have Nami treated by a doctor. The crew was suddenly attacked by Wapol, who demanded their log pose. The crew fought back and Luffy knocked him off their ship so they could continue forward as Wapol's crew cursed them and warned them that they would get their revenge. The crew eventually arrived at a snow-covered land called Drum Island, which was renowned for their advances in medicine. There, the current inhabitants tried to scare away the crew until Vivi lowered her head with Luffy in humility. The leader of the islanders, Dalton, told the villagers to take the crew to the nearest town while Zoro and Karu stayed behind on the Going Merry. At the village, Dalton told the crew about the witch of the island, Dr. Kureha, who was the only doctor left on the island. To make matters worse, there was no way to contact her as she lived on top of the mountain in the castle previously occupied by King Wapol. Hearing this, Luffy and Sanji decided to carry Nami up the mountain to the castle. On the way up, Sanji, Luffy, and Nami ran into some lapan, which are man-eating rabbits. Sanji fought off the lapan so as Luffy, while carrying Nami, could not attack or be hit at the risk of Nami being injured as well. Later, the lapans caused an avalanche, forcing Luffy and Sanji to escape downhill. 
Fortunately, the group was about to run into a sharp and rocky cliff when Sanji rescued them by kicking them out of the way, but Sanji was knocked unconscious in the process. Luffy, now carrying Nami and Sanji, later saved a buried Lapan. Soon, Wapal caught up to Luffy and attacked him after Luffy showed his back to them. Unable to attack, Luffy tried to flee. However, Chess and Kuramarimo caught up and were about to strike Luffy. At that moment, a large group of Lapan saved him in repayment for Luffy saving one of them earlier. When Luffy climbed the mountain and reached the top, he nearly fell and was rescued by Chopper, who then took the three pirates to Dr. Kureha. Later, Luffy and Sanji awakened and saw Chopper for the first time. They tried to cook and eat Chopper until he turned into a giant form and smashed them down, which greatly impressed Luffy. The Straw Hat captain asked Dr. Kureha to join his crew, but she declined. Finally, Wapol arrived at the castle and began arguing with Dr. Kureha when Luffy suddenly punched him hard. Wapol then retaliated by using his Baku Baku no Mi powers to turn into a house with cannons and fused Chess and Kuramarimo into Chess Marimo. Wapol then shot Dr. Hiraluk's flag, a symbol that Chopper highly values. Wapol fired once again, but Luffy protected the flag. Eventually, the fight began and Chopper started battling Chess Marimo while Luffy fought Wapol. However, Luffy was distracted by Chopper's fight because of Chopper's ability to transform into several different forms thanks to the Rumble Ball, letting Wapol escape into the castle. After Chopper won, Luffy went into the castle and kicked a now thin Wapol who was harassing Nami. Wapol decided to open the weapons room and eat the weapons, but Nami had stolen the key. Wapol then tried to eat Luffy but was stopped so Wapol turned his tongue into a cannon for one final attack, but Luffy dodged it and sent him flying, causing Wapol to get stuck in the roof. Luffy then, ignoring Wapol's pleas for mercy and empty promises, sent him flying far away. The Straw Hats regrouped at the summit and Dalton thanked Luffy and Chopper. After some persuasion, Chopper decided to go with Luffy and his crew with Dr. Kureha's blessing. As the Straw Hats left, Dr. Kureha initiated Hiraluk's finished research, a powder that makes pink-colored snowfall. The Straw Hats formally welcomed Chopper to the crew and continued on to their planned destination, Alabasta. Alabasta Arc, in Okama, a brother, and a desert crossing. With Chopper on board, Luffy and his crew journeyed onward to Alabasta with Vivi and Karu. A few days later, while fishing with Usopp and Karu, Luffy and crew picked up something strange as they passed through a sulfuric steam of an undersea volcano. The thing they accidentally picked up was an Okama known as Mr. Two Bon Kure. Having passed the steam at the same time Mr. Two's ship was passing through, Luffy and his fishermen accidentally hook the Baroque Works agent. Not initially knowing who this person was, Luffy and some of his crew immediately became friends with this flamboyant man as he put on a show for them with his Mane Mane no Mi. It was not until Mr. Two's crew came to pick him up that Luffy and his crew realized that he was an enemy. Fortunately, since Mr. Two didn't likewise know who they were, Luffy and his crew were spared at the time. However, since they were fortunate to meet such an opponent ahead of time, Luffy and his crew decided to take measures to protect themselves from his powers. Taking advice from Zoro, the crew wrapped bandages covering an X on their left wrists. This was so they could tell whether the person before them was the Okama in disguise or not. Upon arriving at the port of Nanohana in Alabasta, Luffy immediately ran off ahead of his crew in search of food. Not caring for the recklessness of his actions, his search for food led him to a restaurant. In his haste to get to the restaurant, Luffy accidentally slammed two men straight through the back of the restaurant and through several houses. To his surprise, one of the men he knocked into was Smoker. Recognizing the Marine, Luffy instantly ran away and was soon being chased by Smoker and his Marines all over town. In the midst of the commotion, Luffy was saved by the other man he knocked over, his brother Ace. Regrouping with his crew back in the Going Merry, Luffy explained things to them about Ace. As Luffy was talking, Ace appeared and momentarily asked Luffy and the other Straw Hats to join the crew he was under, the Whitebeard Pirates. Though Luffy bluntly refused the offer and even stated that he would fight against Ace's captain, Edward Newgate, for the position of Pirate King, the brothers parted ways on friendly terms. Ace also aided Luffy by obliterating some Baroque Works billions and their ships. After sailing across the Sandora River and reaching the other side, Luffy and his crew began their journey to Yuba where Vivi hoped to persuade the rebel leader, Koza, and his troops there to stop the senseless violence. Upon landing, there was a little incident where Luffy defeated and acquired 100 Kung Fu Dugong apprentices. Though he couldn't bring such a large group along with him, he had formed an everlasting deep bond with the creatures. As Luffy and his crew were further explained by Vivi about the Dugongs, they passed through the once green town of Erumalu and were further enlightened regarding the problems and conspiracies facing Alabasta. After traversing across the huge desert of Alabasta and acquiring a new companion, Matsuge the Camel, Luffy and his fellow travelers reached Yuba. 
There, they discovered that the town was plagued by sandstorms and deserted except for one old man. This old man, Toto, was an old acquaintance of Vivi, and from him, Luffy and the others had learned that the rebels had moved due to the drought and sandstorms in Yuba. Though Toto was initially hostile to Luffy's group, thinking that they were people wanting to join the rebellion, he changed his attitude towards them once he recognized Vivi and offered them shelter for the night. As the rest took up Toto's offer, Luffy decided to help Toto in his desperate search for water to restore the oasis of Yuba. Though slightly incapable of digging and falling asleep midway in digging, Luffy's efforts had helped Toto dig up some water. The next day, as Luffy and the others prepared to travel to the rebels' new base, Luffy was given some of the water he dug up as a present from Toto. With this, Luffy and the others departed Yuba. Just as they were beginning their journey to Katorea, the rebels' new base, Luffy did something that surprised the rest of them. He announced to all of them that he quit. As Luffy's comrades asked him to stop with this seemingly childish act, he told them his reasons. He explained that even if they stopped the rebels, they wouldn't stop Crocodile. To completely solve the matter, Luffy explained that Crocodile himself must be defeated. As Luffy surprised everyone with his insight over the entire situation, Luffy told Vivi that her desire to save everyone was naive as people die. This little statement started an argument between the two of them, which escalated in a small fight. As Vivi explained herself and told Luffy that risking her life to save everyone was the only thing she could do, Luffy asked her why she wouldn't risk the Straw Hats lives as well since they were her friends. Having stated this, Luffy moved Vivi to tears with his statement of trust and friendship. Seeing her in this state and seeing how she was the one who wanted Crocodile to be defeated, Luffy asked her where they could find him. Alabasta Arc, Meeting Crocodile at Rain Base Having understood each other, Vivi told Luffy and his crew where to find Crocodile. Rain base. Regardless of the fact that officer agents would be waiting there, Luffy and his group pressed forward to confront the warlord. Upon arriving at Rain Base, Luffy and Usopp were sent by the rest to ask for some much needed water after much journeying in the desert island. However, upon finding water in a bar, the two accidentally encountered Smoker and Tashigi. Soon enough, another large commotion was caused with Luffy and his crew being chased all around by the marines. However, Luffy and some of his crew managed to escape from the pursuing marines and headed into Crocodile's casino, Rain Dinners. Though Luffy and his crewmates with him managed to get into the casino, they entered without Vivi to help them identify what Crocodile really looked like. To make matters worse, Smoker had caught up with them and started chasing them all around the casino. As they were running around, Luffy and those with him were tricked into falling through a trap door by the casino staff. Having fallen for the trick, Luffy and the others, including Smoker, found themselves trapped in a sea stone cage. As they were pondering their current predicament, they were greeted by Crocodile. Having finally met the one who orchestrated the whole mess in Alabasta, Luffy and the others with him were unable to do anything because of the cage they were in. As the situation developed with Vivi being brought before Crocodile by Miss All Sunday and the powers of the Devil Fruit Crocodile ate, the Suna Suna no Mi were revealed, Luffy and the rest learned of Crocodile's awful master plan as he mockingly explained it before them. As it went further, Luffy and the others found themselves being placed in a little game the Warlord decided to challenge Vivi in. Due to the events being carried out, Luffy and the rest needed to get to Alubarna, the capital of Alabasta, fast in order to stop the upcoming war. However, because of Luffy and those with him being stuck in a cage, Vivi would have to get the key that Crocodile presented and threw into a pit where it was being eaten by Bananawani. Explaining further that he decided to flood the room they were in, Crocodile presented Vivi the choice between getting to Alubarna in time or saving Luffy and those with him before the room completely floods. As Crocodile was explaining this challenge to Vivi, Luffy overheard Toto being mentioned by the Warlord and soon learned that it was Crocodile that was causing the sandstorms that plagued Yuba. Angered by Crocodile's cruelty, Luffy urged Vivi to get the key so that he and the rest can beat Crocodile. Despite Luffy's encouragement, a single Bananawani proved too much for Vivi. Though all seems lost, Luffy and everyone heard a Denden Mushi ring amidst the ensuing chaos. Recognizing Sanji's voice calling from the Denden Mushi, Luffy and the others realized that there was still hope as Sanji and Chopper weren't captured. As events unfolded with this new development, Luffy and the rest found themselves depending on Vivi finding someone from the outside to get them out. In an attempt to free themselves, Luffy and the others tried to coax one of the Bananawani into biting open the cage. Though their attempt at breaking the cage through this failed, their hopes were, however, revived as Sanji finally showed up at the scene. With him, the key that Crocodile was found alongside a familiar foe, Mr. Three. Though the Baroque Works agent that came out of the Bananawani threw the key, Luffy and the others with him were, however, still able to escape the cage via Mr. Three's wax power. As the room flooded and they escaped, Luffy told Zoro to grab Smoker along with them. Having saved the Marine, Luffy and his companions were allowed to go free to get Alubarna. 
As they were thinking of a way to get to Alabarna fast, they were greeted by Chopper who brought Hasami, a giant crab friend of Matsuge whom they could ride on. However, just as they were getting aboard, Vivi was literally hooked by Crocodile. Fortunately, Luffy freed her just in time as she was taken away. With Vivi safe, Luffy told his crew to go on as he faced off the Warlord himself. As Luffy prepared to face Crocodile, he was told that the Warlord would humor him for three minutes. After that, Crocodile would leave for Alabarna to complete his scheme. With the time limit in mind, Luffy fought ferociously against his opponent. Though he attacked the best he could, it was however apparent that no matter how much Luffy attacked, he could not damage Crocodile. As they continued to fight one another, Luffy's arms was dehydrated by Crocodile. Using the water given by Toto, however, Luffy was able to restore himself. Remembering the old man, Luffy declares that no matter how much Crocodile attacks Yuba with sandstorms, it will never be destroyed. As Luffy declared this, his three minutes were up. As the three minutes ended, Luffy witnessed Crocodile decide to do something horrible. Spurred on by Luffy, Crocodile created a massive sandstorm and sent it towards Yuba. Seeing this new development, Luffy desperately tried to stop Crocodile. Unfortunately, in the midst of all this, Luffy was impaled by the Warlord and left for dead in the sand. Despite being heavily wounded and buried in the sand, however, Luffy still struggled with the will to fight. As he struggled, in a surprise turn of events, Luffy was suddenly pulled out by Miss All Sunday. Having been pulled out from his sandy grave, Luffy was left in the care of Pell, the hero of Alabasta that the Baroque Works agent defeated a while back. Alabasta Arc battling Crocodile for the second and third time. With Pell's help, Luffy was able to recover from his wounds and get a ride to Alabarna via Pell's devil fruit, the Tori Tori no Mi, model Falcon. Through various events that happened in the city, by the time the two arrived at Alabarna, a great battle was being waged by the rebels and the royal army in the city square with a sandstorm covering the place. As they arrived, they got just in time to save Vivi, who was dropped by Crocodile from the palace walls. With Vivi safe, Luffy flung himself up the walls to face Crocodile again. During his previous fight, Luffy noticed that water made Crocodile unable to turn into sand as he and the water barrel that Toto gave were pierced by Crocodile's hook. Realizing this, he brought a huge barrel of water to aid him in his rematch against the Warlord. As Luffy thus fought Crocodile again, he soon realized that his barrel of water could easily be jeopardized. Figuring this out, Luffy decided to switch tactics by drinking all of his water and storing it within himself, essentially becoming what he dubbed Mizu Luffy, which means Water Luffy. While this new tactic infuriated his opponent, it however proved effective for Luffy. Though Luffy was aided greatly by water this time around, the fight however just made his opponent really mad. Though Luffy was able to evade Crocodile's devastating powers of erosion, he unfortunately got caught by his opponent. As Crocodile's hand held Luffy, he was severely dehydrated and was once again left for dead. Fortunately, however, some water bubbles that Luffy misfired earlier revived him from his near-death state. Rejuvenated once again, Luffy set off in search of his foe. Learning from Tashigi while on his search, Luffy headed to Royal Alabasta Tomb. As he ran, the wound from his chest unfortunately opened, and Luffy, feeling unusually faint, briefly fell unconscious. Recovering himself, Luffy noticed the passageway and ran down into the tomb. Eventually, Luffy caught up with his foe once again in the collapsing ruins. Encountering each other, the two fought each other again. However, having been severely wounded from his previous matches with Crocodile, Luffy used his own bloody body to negate Crocodile's powers this time around. As the battle continued, Luffy kicked Crocodile into the air. Upon doing so, Luffy was blasted with one of Crocodile's powerful techniques. Luffy, however, withstood the attack and prepared to retaliate. Using a series of moves, Luffy propelled himself up to Crocodile to deliver the final blow. As a last resort, Crocodile tried to stop Luffy by turning his hand into blades. This, however, didn't stop Luffy, as he broke through the sand-created weapons with his bare fist and delivered a flurry of punches onto his opponent. Delivering the punches, Luffy attacked Crocodile with such force that it penetrated a layer of pure bedrock and sent Crocodile flying, finally defeating the Warlord. Falling back into the ruins, Luffy was thanked by Nefertari Cobra for all he had done. Having used the last of his strength, Luffy was then carried by the king to his crew. Alabasta Arc, Farewell to Alabasta and Vivi For their valiant heroism in saving Alabasta, Luffy and his crew were treated secretly as VIPs by the royalty for three days. Having fully recovered from his wounds from the battle with Crocodile on the third day, Luffy and his crew decided to leave before the awaiting marines could catch them. Just as they were heading back to the Going Merry, which was secured by Mr. Two Bon Carré, before the Marines could find it, Luffy and the others offered Vivi the choice of joining the crew. They gave her until noon the next day. Setting sail with the reformed Bon Carré and his men the next day, 
Luffy and his crew encountered the blockade the Marines set up to capture them. Through a tearful sacrifice by Mr. Two, Luffy and his crew were able to escape the blockade to go to the rendezvous point to pick up Vivi. Arriving there, they found that Vivi had come as promised. However, to their disappointment, she told them that she still had responsibilities as Alabasta's princess and couldn't come along. Despite this, Vivi asked them that if they ever meet again, would she be accepted to come along again? While Luffy and the others wanted to reply out loud to Vivi that she would still be accepted, they could not out of fear that the nearby marines would implicate her as a criminal. Instead, however, they quietly showed her the mark that they used to protect themselves if Mr. Two impersonated one of them, a sign of their friendship. Having delivered their silent response to their friend, Luffy and his crew sail away from Alabasta and onto their next adventure. Though depressed about not having Vivi on the crew, Luffy and the others came across a new development. Nico Robin, aka Miss All Sunday from Baroque Works, had stowed away on the Going Merry and demanded Luffy take responsibility of saving her by letting her join his crew. Without much hesitation, Luffy agreed, much to everyone's surprise. Sky Island Saga Goat Island Art while being chased by the marines, led by Moore and Minchi, Luffy and his crew got lost in the fog and discovered an uncharted island. They find that the island is inhabited only by an old man named Zenny and a multitude of goats. They also find a partially constructed ship on the top of the island. Because of his bad heart, Zenny probably only has three days to live. Hoping to make his last days good ones, the Straw Hat Pirates help him out, and they learn about Zenny's past as a moneylender and his dream of becoming a pirate. But realizing that Zenny has outlived Chopper's predictions, the Straw Hats decide that after helping him finish his pirate ship, they'll leave the island. The Straw Hat pirates help the old man out while hiding from the marines and working to get his ship into the water. With Luffy's help, Zenny and his goats were able to attack the marines. The Straw Hat pirates then went forth to help him. They defeated Minchi and tied him up. Luffy then threw Minchi back on Captain Moore's ship, and Captain Moore allowed them to choose their battle location. Zenny decides to follow his dream and become a pirate despite his age, and they part ways. Luffy then pointed to the marines a foggy area for battle location, which caused Captain Moore's ship to land in a shipwreck due to the rocks. Luffy and the Straw Hats are now chased by a marine ship, commanded by Drake. Due to the stormy weather and Nami's exceptional navigational skills, the ship sails away unscathed, leaving the marine pursuant behind. Luffy and the crew reach a town on Hannibal Island. Inside a pirate-filled bar, they find out there's a great but very dangerous opportunity through a mysterious door in the bar. As the crew enters the mysterious door, they're surprised to see it's the opening to a large tunnel. Inside, they find themselves in a large cave filled with pirates, the site of the Dead End Race, a very dangerous anything-goes sailing competition which the winner can win up to 300 million berry. The crew is introduced to the favorites to win that year, two giants, Bobby and Pogo, a fishman and former rival of Arlong. Willie and the favorited to win, Gaspard, a former marine general who deserted after killing his crew. While Nami registers the crew for the race, Luffy gets involved in a fight against Gaspard's crew along with an infamous bounty hunter by the name of Shiraya Bascud, as well as meets Gaspard himself, which of course ends on bad terms. The next morning, Luffy and the crew set sail along with many other pirate ships for the parade start, which involves sailing off a waterfall, fighting off other pirates, and navigating sharp turns. Before even reaching the ocean, several pirate crews are wrecked. Luckily, the Straw Hats manage. However, while checking the ship, they find a stowaway, a kid by the name of Anaguma, who has come to kill them for the bounty. They'll find that's impossible after witnessing the crew's strength and power, and thus sails along with them for the race. After a few more encounters, one involving the pirate ship of Bigelow the Hangman and Sea Kings, Luffy and the Straw Hats arrive at Partia, the supposed finish line of the race. However, it turns out to be a marine stronghold that quickly sinks any incoming pirate ships. Luffy realizes Gaspard rigged the race and the crew manages to escape the stronghold and track down Gaspard's ship using Chopper's nose. Meanwhile, on board Gaspard's ship, the Salamander, Shiraya, the bounty hunter from earlier tries to attack Gaspard, but barely defeats his right-hand man, Needless. Just when Gaspard is about to finish Shirai off, the Straw Hats arrive on the scene and Luffy makes his way on board Gaspard's ship, taking down his crew, angered about what the former Marine did. Shirai tries to intervene, but Luffy knocks him out to keep from getting in the way. Luffy and Gaspard proceed to fight. Luffy's fight with Gaspard is not going well, but Sanji realizes something and gives Luffy sacks of flour before rejoining the other Straw Hats. When Anagumi realizes that his grandpa is still on Gaspard's ship, he begs the Straw Hats to go back. But Zoro knocks him out and reveals that Anaguma is actually a girl. Meanwhile, back in the ship, Grandpa overloads the boiler, causing it to explode and sink the ship. Luffy manages to stay on the sinking remains, as does Gaspard, who shows Luffy that a cyclone is closing in on their position and that whoever wins can escape the ship and storm via lifeboats. The two strike one another with Luffy actually managing to hit him due to the counter effects of the flower on Gaspard's syrup powers. Luffy then throws the remaining flower sacks to Gaspard, coating him with it, and proceeds to pound on him and send him flying into the cyclone. 
Luffy then collapses from exhaustion, but is saved by Anaguma's grandpa along with Shiraya. As they head for the nearby islands, grandpa reveals that Anaguma was adopted and her real name is Adele Bascoud, Shirai's little sister whom he thought was dead. Despite the awkward reuniting, the two come to accept each other. The Straw Hats close in on the real Partia as the winners of the race, but the marine ships suddenly appear and go after them. Forcing them to flee from the island and forfeit their prize, they let Adele, Shariah, and Grandpa off, then wish them goodbye individually before sailing off with the marines on their tail. Despite not getting the prize money, the Straw Hats continue on for their next big adventure. Sky Island Saga, Rulika Island Arc Luffy and the Straw Hats are being chased by a small fleet of marine ships led by Major Pasqua and Isoka. Luffy and his crew barely escape when the marine's major accidentally sinks one of his own ships. The crew then make their way towards an island named Rulika. They soon meet Flip, the son of a mayor and the commander of a troop who collects taxes from the people of Rulika, the collection party, and they find out the island is in fact ruled by a former pirate, Mayor Wetton, that is overtaxing the people. Luffy, Usopp, and Robin also meet Professor Henzo, who's doing research on something called the Rainbow Mist, sponsored by the scrupulous Wetton. Suddenly, a huge galleon, the Tarielishin, appeared in the harbor and Luffy and the others go explore it and turns out to be a pirate ship of Wetton's pirates. When some of the mist shows up, Henzo borrows the Going Merry and Luffy, Usopp, Robin, Henzo, and Zoro, who is sleeping on the ship, go inside it. The inside of the Rainbow Mist is full of wrecked ships and treasure and is guarded by five kids. The kids are actually friends of Henzo's that got lost in the mist over 50 years ago along with the Terrielishin and Ian, a member then of the Wetton Pirates. Henzo states that the flow of time is different inside the Rainbow Mist, and the space is distorted. So Luffy and the others try to find a way out of the ship graveyard. Finally, Flip communicates with Henzo with a Denden Mushi, and the company realizes that they're still connected with the outside world. Then, Luffy accidentally propels himself and Rapa Nui, one of the kids, to the end of the mist. The mayor, though, uses the Rainbow Tower to make a bridge to the Rainbow Mist and launches an attack inside it, along with Lake, the son of Flip, and his grandson. Luffy goes back to the Rainbow Mist by throwing himself and Rapa Nui through the Rainbow Tower. There, he fights Wetton, but the mayor manages to escape and blows the Rainbow Tower away. Luffy and the others, though, escape the Rainbow Mist on board Going Merry with the help of Rapa Nui and the other kids who stayed behind to blow up the marine ship and give the Going Merry a boost to escape from the explosion. Outside, the mayor gets arrested by a bunch of powerful marines that turn out to be older versions of Henzo's friends, who were thrown 50 years into the past by the Rainbow Mist's collapse. The marines let Luffy and the Straw Hats go and the crew departs onward to their next adventure. Sky Island Saga, Jaya Arc. Not long after Luffy and the Straw Hats left Arabasta, a massive ship fell from the sky and into the sea. From Nico Robin and a brief search of the sinking ship which wielded a map, Luffy and his crew learned that the ship fell from an island in the sky called Skypia. Needing more info on the matter, Luffy and his crew decided to explore more of the ship. Using special diving suits created by Usopp, Luffy, along with Zoro and Sanji, explored the sunken ship. As they explored the ship and found few things, their search was cut short as the ship was suddenly clamped and filled with air, and a bunch of other people appeared. After taking care of the intruders within the newly created air pocket, the three encountered a monkey-like person bursting into the room. Although Luffy and the stranger initially got along, they unfortunately got on bad terms when they found out that they were after the same thing. Fortunately, with thanks from his two crewmates, Luffy escaped from Masira and a giant turtle that ate the ship at the same time. As Luffy and the others were about to deal with this new foe, they suddenly witnessed something that completely scared them, the shadowy silhouettes of creatures several times larger than regular giants. After escaping from the creatures and getting rid of Masira, who accidentally tagged along, Luffy and his crew learned of Jaya from an eternal pose that Robin stole from the guy. Needing info on how to get into Skypia, Luffy and his crew sailed for Jaya. Arriving at Jaya at the port of Mock Town, Luffy and his crew found that the place they landed on was a lawless town filled with pirates. Wanting to explore the town as well as get information, Luffy along with Zoro and Nami went offshore into town. With a promise not to fight while in Mock Town to Nami, the three explored the place and encountered several of the inhabitants. They eventually end up in a bar wherein Luffy has a small argument with another customer. Though the incident ended without a hitch, Luffy and his companions encountered a much more serious one. Luffy and his companions soon encountered in the bar Bellamy and his crew with the intention of seeing if Luffy was worthy of joining his new age of pirates. However, upon learning that Luffy and his crew wanted to go to Sky Island, Bellamy along with the rest of the bar started ridiculing them and the notion of dreams such as a Sky Island. Though the situation got worse with Luffy and Zoro taking hits from Bellamy's crew, they however refused to fight. As the two were dragged out by a frustrated Nami, the three were congratulated and encouraged by the pirate that Luffy argued with earlier. Though the man assured them that dreams would never die, Luffy and Zoro, however, sensed something up with him and the people that are apparently associated with him. Returning to the Going Merry, Luffy and the others soon learned that while their search was unproductive, Robbins was successful. Learning that a man by the name of Mont Blanc Cricket might know something, 
they headed off to the other side of Jaya. After escaping a brief encounter with Nisara's brother, Shoujo, Luffy and his crew reached Cricket's home. There, they had a brief misunderstanding with Cricket, who they found out apparently suffered from decompression sickness. However, upon helping Cricket and clearing things with him, Luffy and his crew were able to get better acquainted with the former pirate. For helping Cricket, they were also able to reconcile with Cricket's protégés, Masura and Shoujo. As they explained the problem and got acquainted with Cricket and his protégés, Luffy and his crew learned of Cricket's past and his ancestor. Showing interest with Cricket's dream, Luffy and his crew convinced Cricket to help them out in getting to Skypiea. While having acquired help from someone who could aid them into getting to Skypiea, Luffy and his crew, however, found out that they needed an important thing to aid them, the South Bird. This bird is explained to them by Cricket and was needed to find a knockup stream needed to help them get into Skypiea. Having been told this, Luffy and his crew quickly went in search for the bird. Splitting into various groups, Luffy Luffy and his crew searched the nearby forest for one of these elusive birds. Though they encountered all sorts of obstacles and antics while searching for the bird, they were able to catch one in the end thanks to Robin. With the captured bird, they went back to Crickets. Upon returning, however, they discovered the horrid aftermath of an incident that happened while they were away. Cricket and his protégés were defeated and had been robbed by Bellamy and his crew. Spurred on by this, Luffy decided to go after Bellamy and get his wounded friend's gold back. At Mocktown, Luffy engaged with Bellamy who wanted to prove once and for all to those around him that Luffy and Cricket's dreams were nothing. Despite Bellamy's over-the-top display of his devil fruit ability, Luffy, however, defeated the arrogant pirate with a single normal punch. Having completely obliterated Bellamy in front of his crew and the other pirates, Luffy was able to retrieve Cricket's gold without any further trouble. As the morning of the next day came, Luffy arrived back to Cricket's house. There, he saw the newly modified Going Merry as he gave Cricket's gold back. With the new modifications for the trip up to Skypiea and Southbird, Luffy and his crew set sails with the ships of Masura and Shoujo escorting them. As they were leaving, Luffy and his crew were cheered on by Cricket's final words of encouragement. With that, Luffy and his crew sailed off to where they could ride a knockup stream. After a long wait out on sea, the weather and the sea started to show signs of a knockup stream. As Luffy and his crew were preparing themselves for the journey to Skypiea, they suddenly encountered the ship and crew of the pirate that Luffy fought with in the bar. From this encounter, Luffy and his crew learned of his and Zoro's new bounties for which the pirate planned on collecting. The encounter, however, was brief as the knockup stream started. With the knockup stream shooting the Going Merry into the sky, Luffy and his crew set forth to new adventure as well as inadvertently escaping from the pursuing pirate. Sky Island Saga, Skypiea Arc. The crew ended up floating on the cloud after passing through it, and as they took in their surroundings, Usopp decided to take a swim in the clouds. When he didn't resurface, the Straw Hats realized he was falling all the way to the Blue Sea, and Luffy quickly stretched his arm down to try and save him. Robin sprouted eyes on Luffy's arm, allowing her to see where Usopp was and generate arms off of Luffy's to grab him. When Luffy pulled Usopp back up, a giant balloon-like octopus followed him, though Zoro easily dealt with it. As the crew recovered from this experience, they were suddenly assaulted by a masked guerrilla warrior who landed powerful blows on Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji. However, the Knight of the Sky, Ganfall, then came flying in on his bird horse, Pierre, and fought off the warrior before introducing himself to the Straw Hats. After learning about what the Straw Hats did to go here, Ganfall gifted them a free whistle to call him should they be attacked by someone again, and then departed. With the crew unsure as to how to keep sailing upward to the log pose's destination, Luffy tried to blow the whistle, but was stopped by Nami. The crew then came across a cloud waterfall, and Luffy found that clouds around it were hard enough to stand and bounce on. Upon climbing up the bouncy cloud, Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper found that behind the waterfall was a path. At the end of the path, the Straw Hats came to Heaven's Gate, where the gatekeeper Amazon charged them 1 billion extols for entry. The Straw Hats only had Berry and were unsure how to convert it, but Amazon then told them they could pass through without paying. When they did, the Mary was suddenly seized by Speedy Shrimp, which took it and the Straw Hats on a winding path to the country of Skypiea up above. Upon reaching the sea at the end of the path, the Straw Hats found themselves at the coast of Angel Island, a place founded on top of clouds, and Luffy immediately disembarked to explore it. As Luffy examined the various elements on the island, the Straw Hats met a young native girl named Konus as well as her father Pagaya. Luffy rode Pagaya's wave around the sea, but ended up losing control and falling in, forcing Zoro and Sanji to rescue him. Nami then tried out the waver and was much better at it, and Pagaya and Konus took the rest of the Straw Hats to their home. There, Konus explained the abilities of dials, which powered wavers among other things. At that point, Nami was no longer in sight, and Konus became worried that she had wandered over to Upper Yard, the home of Skypiea's god, Enel, which was forbidden for all to enter. This made Luffy very interested in it, and the crew decided to go and rescue Nami if she was in any trouble. The group 
went back down the coast, and before the Straw Hats set off, Pagaya examined their old waiver. Suddenly, McKinley and the White Berets came marching in and confronted Luffy to charge him and the Straw Hats for illegal entry. They explained the punishment was just a fine of 10 times the original entry fee, but after learning the value of extols compared to Barry, the crew realized that it would be an exorbitant amount. Nami then returned to the coast on Pagaya's waiver, and after learning about the charges, she hit McKinley with the waiver in anger. Because of this, McKinley increased the charges against the Straw Hats to be punished by execution by cloud drifting, and Luffy confronted the White Berets with the intention of fighting. After dodging the sky arrows they shot, Luffy pulled against a palm tree and spun himself around, allowing him to wildly attack the force with punches and kicks and take out most of them at once. Zoro and Sanji came ashore to finish the job, and McKinley then proclaimed that due to their crimes, the Straw Hats would be judged by God's priests themselves. With this news, the Straw Hats bid farewell to Konus and Pagaya and prepared to try to leave Skypiea through Cloud End to the best of their ability. However, as Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji went inside the duo's house to get food, a Super Express Speedy Shrimp then arrived and carried off the Mary. Pagaya revealed to the trio that their crewmates were being taken to the sacrificial altar on Upper Yard, where they'd be held hostage. It would be up to the trio to take the Milky Road to Upper Yard and face the trials there in order to rescue the rest of the crew. Konus took Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji down Lovely Street to the port, where she gave them her small boat, Kata Sumaru. Luffy noticed that Konus had been pale and shaking since they had left her house and asked if she was scared. After some hesitation, Konus broke down and revealed that she was the one who called the speedy shrimp that took away their crewmates, as failing to turn in criminals was punishable by death. Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji weren't angry at her for doing this, instead wondering why she risked her life to reveal it to them. Suddenly, sparks rose in the air, and Luffy quickly grabbed Konus and jumped away right as Enel struck the spot where Konus was standing with a giant thunderbolt. The attack left a gaping hole in the port that Luffy and Konus fell into. But luckily, Ganfall came flying in to save them. Ganfall took Konus away to a safe area as Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji set sail for Upper Yard. As the trio entered the heavily forested place, they quickly had to contend with large swinging blades threatening to pulverize them, as well as a giant sky lamp rail. After making it past those obstacles, they arrived at four gateways, each one leading to a different ordeal. Luffy wanted to go to the ordeal of balls since it sounded the most fun, and so the trio went through the gate. After being dropped off a cliff, they landed back on the Milky Road and found themselves surrounded by large floating balls made of island cloud. However, when playing with one of the balls, Luffy and Usopp were assaulted by a snake that burst out of it, and Sanji tried hitting away an incoming ball only for it to explode. The trio were then confronted by Satori, one of Enel's four priests, who introduced them to his surprise balls and said they had to defeat him to continue on to the sacrificial altar. Luffy attempted to punch Satori, but the priest easily dodged him before striking him with an impact dial, which unleashed a powerful blow against him that caused internal damage. Satori sent Luffy, Sanji, and Usopp off the Karasumaru with his impact dial strikes and revealed that the boat would keep moving and leave them behind in his forest if they didn't defeat him in time. Luffy aimed another punch at Satori, but the priest grabbed his arm after dodging it and slammed him into a tree. Luffy then tried attacking Satori with Gomu Gomu no Gatling Gun, but this failed to hit Satori and instead struck several surprise balls, causing the Straw Hats to be assaulted by their contents. Luffy was sent falling toward one of the Cloud Rivers and saved himself by grabbing a vine, though ended up having fun swinging on it and became distracted. Eventually, Sanji got him off the vine and beat him up, but Satori then struck Sanji with an impact dial. Satori proceeded to overwhelm the entire trio before assaulting them with his ball dragon, which would cause a massive chain reaction if a particular ball in its chain was set off. However, Luffy found the string Satori was using to control the dragon and broke it. Satori responded by pulling the rope to bring Luffy to him. However, Luffy didn't let go of the ball dragon and sent it crashing into Satori. The priest managed to avoid the massive explosion, but Luffy avoided it as well by hanging onto his back. Luffy then wrapped his arm around Satori's body, rendering him immobile and preventing him from dodging their attacks, allowing Sanji to give Satori a powerful kick to the head and defeat him. Immediately afterward, Usopp called to Luffy and Sanji that he had found the Karasumaru and told them to come to him quickly. Once they did, Usopp shot a rope from his belt that successfully wrapped around the boat and pulled them up to it, but they ended up hitting several trees on the way up. As the Karasumaru sailed out of the forest, the trio lay dazed on it. Sometime later, Luffy, Usopp, and Sanji sailed through a field dotted with skulls. A group of Shandia gorillas then came flying past them, and their leader, Wiper, fired a bazooka shot at the tree. Luffy deflected it with Gomu Gomu no Fusen, and Wiper chose not to attack further, but warned the Straw Hats that he would treat them like Enel if they had caused trouble on the island. The trio continued sailing and made it to the sacrificial altar by sunset, where they reunited with the rest of the crew. After checking on the injured Gonfall, the Straw Hats decided to camp out on Upper Yard for the night. After setting up on the campsite, the crew talked about their discovery that the lost city of gold that Nolan was looking for was here on Upper Yard, and decided to hunt for the gold the next day. The crew then gathered food and supplies for the next day, and Luffy was put in charge of overseeing the boiling of water for drinking. As the Straw Hats ate some stew, they talked about clues to find the city from Nolan's logbook. Afterwards, Robin said the crew should put out the fire to avoid 
avoid attracting attention from enemies, but Luffy and Usopp oppose this. Despite Robin's and Nami's warnings, the crew built a giant bonfire and danced around it before going to bed. The next morning, Usopp showed the crew the repairs to the Mary somehow happened overnight, which he claimed to be the work of a spirit. The crew then split into two teams to head to the Lost City, with Luffy, Zoro, Chopper, and Robin forming the Explore team that would head to the city on foot. The quartet's expedition had just started when they ran into a giant snake named Nola. Luffy told the group to run away from it, and they became scattered as the snake attempted to attack them with its poisonous fangs. Luffy tried to lure Nola toward them, and ended up being separated from the rest of the group. He remembered the direction to go south, but had no idea which way south was, and went in a straight line southwest. He became interested upon hearing the bleeding of what sounded like a goat, and when a Shandia warrior tried to ambush them, Luffy quickly beat the warrior aside, being annoyed that he was not a goat. Luffy then ran into Wiper, who asked him what he was doing on Upper Yard still. Wiper told Luffy that Upper Yard belonged to his people, the Shandia, and Luffy accepted this and walked off. However, Wiper had had enough of Luffy, and so decided to eliminate him, and Luffy was very willing to fight back. Wiper shot Luffy with eight bazooka shots, all of which Luffy deflected. Wiper then changed his strategy and fired a stream of natural gas at Luffy before using his burn bazooka to create disintegrating white flame. Luffy managed to dodge the sudden burst of fire and traded blows with Wiper in midair. Wiper then readied another burn bazooka strike against him, and Luffy responded by attacking him with Gomu Gomu no Bazooka. The two's attacks hit the other simultaneously, causing a notable amount of injury to both of them. Wiper Wiper then called out to Luffy to see if he was still alive, and Luffy responded, but he was then suddenly eaten by Nola and fell through its insides before landing among some ruins. Thinking he was inside a cave, Luffy examined the treasures in the ruins while walking further down Nola's stomach. He came to a dead end and tried striking it with Gomu Gomu no Bazooka to see if there was a secret door, which caused Nola to spin around. Nola ate some sea clouds which almost drowned Luffy, and the pirate continued hitting the walls of its stomach, which caused the snake to rampage through Upper Yard in pain. Nola's movements while fighting in the Upper ruins of Shandora caused Luffy to constantly fall through its stomach as it repositioned, leaving him aghast as to what kind of cave this was. Luffy then attempted to dig his way out of the stomach, causing Nola to laugh. However, he was then joined by Nami, Gonfall, Pierre, and Aiza after they had been eaten by Nola, and they revealed to him that this cave was the snake's stomach. Nami decided to ride her waver out of the snake through its mouth, and Luffy hung onto the back of the wave while Aiza hung onto him. However, the exhaust fumes of the waver blew Luffy and Aiza off of it, and they fell back down to Nola's stomach. However, Pierre quickly returned to rescue them. Nola was knocked unconscious by a thunderbolt from Enel, and Luffy, Isa, and Pierre traveled up to its head. Luffy ended up behind its eye and opened its eyelid, but was quickly guided to its mouth. They jarred the snake's mouth open and fell down to the ground below, where they found themselves in Shandora, the legendary city of gold. However, Luffy and Isa then found Zoro, Chopper, Robin, Gonfall, and Wiper laying unconscious next to a giant hole in the ground. A barely conscious Robin told Luffy that Enel had done this and was plotting to destroy all of Skypiea. He had taken Nami away to an unknown place. Robin believed that Enel would go to the fabled Golden Bell first, and when Isa sensed the presence of two people with her mantra, Luffy told the young girl to take him there. Isa guided Luffy to a cave near the city ruins, and Luffy confronted Enel, who was with Nami on the giant ship Ark Maxim. Luffy pulled himself up to the ship's deck, and Enel struck him with a mighty thunderbolt. However, due to Luffy's body being made of rubber, a natural insulator to lightning, the attack had no effect on him. Enel was left stunned, and Luffy charged toward him, successfully punching Skypiea's god in the stomach as his rubber body bypassed Enel's Logia defenses. When Enel got up from the attack, Luffy tried attacking him again, but the god used his mantra to dodge Luffy's attacks and hit the pirate with his staff. Enel used his electricity to reshape his staff into a trident, and Luffy struggled to avoid being stabbed by it. After managing to dodge one of Enel's attacks in midair, Luffy was able to kick him onto the floor. However, Enel was able to grab Luffy's arm on his follow-up attack and slam him into the floor as well, and he proceeded to activate the Arc Maxim to bring it up into the air. Luffy watched in anger as Enel used the Maxim to generate a giant thundercloud he called Deathpia to wreak destruction on Skypia, and the two then resumed sparring. In an attempt to work around Enel's mantra, Luffy shut off his mind and dodged Enel's strikes purely on reflex, though quickly went back to normal since he couldn't attack in that diminished mental state. Luffy then got another idea and ran toward Enel's throne chamber, which was surrounded by a curved wall. He threw rapid punches at the wall, and those punches ricocheted back and struck Enel, who couldn't anticipate the randomness. With Enel reeling from those attacks, he was powerless to stop Luffy from pummeling him with direct attacks. Luffy watched as the injured Enel slowly got up and cursed him for messing with his plans, but as Luffy moved to attack him further, Enel quickly responded by reshaping the gold from the wall behind him and forming it into a giant ball around Luffy's right forearm. With Luffy unable to pull his arm out of it, Enel kicked the ball and sent him rolling off the edge of the Maxim. Luffy tried holding onto the ledge, but Enel sent him falling to the ground far below with his staff. Isa and Pierre tried to fly in to rescue him, but Enel attacked them with a lightning 
difficult. The three of them fell down into a chasm where Luffy had rubble fall on him, though he remained unharmed. After pulling himself out, he prepared to follow the Ark Maxim to a place where the Golden Bell was. Isa took Luffy to the giant beanstalk Giant Jack, which the Ark Maxim was circling near, high above. And Robin was there, revealing that the Golden Bell was up at the top of it. Luffy then ran up Giant Jack with his golden ball in tow, intent on freeing Nami, Usopp, and Sanji and fighting Enel. Once he made it close to the top of Giant Jack, Luffy was noticed by Enel who fired a lightning bolt to break off the top of the beanstalk and send Luffy falling. Luffy was able to grab back onto Giant Jack and pull himself onto the highest cloud platform on it. And right then, he was suddenly struck by Nami who had rode her waiver up Giant Jack to fetch him. After watching Enel destroy all of Angel Island with a giant thundercloud called Raigo, Nami told Luffy that Usopp and Sanji had escaped the Ark Maxim and that he needed to go back to the Mary with her so they could escape. However, Luffy told her that he needed to defeat Enel and ring the Golden Bell for the sake of Cricket in order to show him that the city of gold that Nolan wrote about was indeed real. Luffy tried grabbing onto the Ark Maxim, but Enel easily kicked off his hand and Enel responded to Luffy's ensuing attempts by striking him with lightning bolts. Luffy then got the idea to write a message on the giant leaf to tell the people of Giant Jack's base to cut down the beanstalk so it would fall westward toward the Maxim. Luffy was surprised to see that Nami was sticking with him, and Nami told him that he needed her to pilot the waiver the rest of the way up, and so she was willing to take that risk. Zora, Nola, and Wiper were able to successfully tip Giant Jack toward the west, and Nami drove the waiver up the beanstalk as fast as it would go, while Luffy held on to her from behind. As the duo shot off the beanstalk and flew toward the Maxim, Enel brought down an even larger Raigo to destroy all of Skypiea. To Nami's shock, Luffy jumped off the waiver directly into the Raigo, and while inside it, Luffy threw his golden ball around it in every possible direction. The ball conducted the electricity inside the giant thunder sphere, and so Luffy was able to completely disperse the Raigo and save Skypiea. With the Maxim and the Golden Ball now in his sights, Luffy stretched back his right arm and twisted it around. Enel responded by fully transforming into lightning in the shape resembling a larger version of his body, though Luffy was able to bypass his transformation and land blows on him. However, Enel was able to reach around Luffy with an arm of lightning and stab him in the back with his trident. Luffy's only options were either to let the trident pierce him further or fall back all the way down to Skypiea and he decided to let go and fall. However, he then grabbed onto a small piece of island cloud near the Maxim and pulled himself back up. Luffy reared back and twisted his right arm again and sent the golden ball crashing into Enel's giant body, smashing him against the golden bell. Luffy cried out for the golden bell to ring, and as it did so, Enel's transformation deactivated and the god was defeated. Luffy fell down as it did so, Enel's transformation deactivated and the god was defeated. Luffy fell down along with Enel, the Maxim, and the bell, but landed on a small piece of island cloud where Nami was. Luffy and Nami jumped back down to Upper Yard, with Luffy using Gomu Gomu no Fusen to cushion their fall. They then came across the priest's storehouse and took the large amount of food from inside it before arriving at Shandora and reuniting with the rest of their crew. Night fell as the crew ate the priest's food, and then they took part in a large party with the Skypeans and Shandia. The party lasted for several days, and one night, when everyone was sleeping, Luffy woke the crew up and told them they should steal the city's treasure and run away. The next morning, Luffy took some of the crew inside the sleeping Nola's stomach, where they took the treasures from the ruins that the snake had eaten. The crew then anxiously waited for Robin to arrive so they could depart without being caught, and when Robin came with several Skypeans behind her, the crew quickly ran away with their stolen treasure, not realizing the citizens had come to give them an even greater amount. The Straw Hats sailed to Cloud End where they bid farewell to Konus and Pagaya. They were then sent off a ledge and fell straight down, but Konus called a balloon octopus which grabbed the Mary and inflated itself, giving the crew a controlled descent to the Blue Sea. Water 7 Saga Long Ring Long Land Arc Upon returning from Skypiea to the Blue Sea, Luffy and his crew had no time to rest as they encountered a giant wave created by some sea monkeys. After the brief incident, Luffy and his crew rested and assessed the good wealth they obtained from their Sky Island adventure. They all agreed that they would use the treasure to help fix the travel-worn Going Merry and get a shipwright to help maintain it. After encountering the sea monkeys once again and a curious pirate ship with no sails or crew, Luffy and his crew reached their next island in their journey. As Luffy, along with Usopp and Chopper, decided to explore the island, they noticed that the animals and plant life were all very long in appearance. As Luffy and his two companions explored the island more, they encountered a no-man named Tonjin, who had been stuck on his stilts for 10 long years. After getting acquainted with the old man and reuniting him with his horse, Shelly, Luffy and his companions felt that they had done a small accomplishment. However, in the midst of their enjoyment, Shelly was suddenly shot. Learning immediately that the shot was fired by the pirate, Foxy, who was nearby, Luffy momentarily got angry at this foe. Before Luffy could fight Foxy, however, he was suddenly challenged to an official Davy Beck fight. From Usopp, Luffy learned that this sudden challenge was a set of three games between pirate crews in which the crew members were at stake. Despite Usopp's warnings, however, and much to the dismay of the crew, Luffy accepted the challenge from Foxy and his crew to hold a Davy Beck fight on Long Ring Long Land. 
What happened next was a festival-like event set up by the Foxy Pirates in lieu of the Davy Back games. After the formalities of the beginning of the games, Luffy and his crew decided who would participate in which game. Taking the final and most climactic game, Combat, Luffy awaited for his turn as he watched the rest of his crew participate in other games. The first two games of the Davy Back fight proved to be both surprising and emotional for Luffy and his crew. In the first game, Donut Race, they witnessed Foxy and his crew's cheating tricks, and Foxy's exploit of his devil fruit powers of the Noro Noro no Mi. Due to this, Luffy lost Chopper to Foxy. Fortunately, Luffy was able to win Chopper back as his crew won the second game, Groggy Ring, despite the gigantic odds stacked against them. After watching these two grueling games, Luffy was pumped for his turn in the final game. With the third game approaching, Luffy, with the help of Usopp, decided to dress appropriately for the match. Donning an afro and boxing outfit, Luffy was ready to face against the sly Foxy aboard his ship, the Sexy Foxy. Throughout the whole match, Luffy was constantly tricked by his smarter opponent as they battled all around the ship. With Foxy's tricks and devil fruit powers, it seemed like Luffy would lose. Despite this, Luffy persevered to not lose one of his crew forever. In the climax of the battle, Luffy was able to thwart Foxy by using a mirror shard obtained from the battle to reflect Foxy's power back to himself. Having slowed Foxy down, Luffy delivered the final blow and won the game. After a lot of rest, Luffy wakes up from being told he indeed did win the fight. Foxy comes to congratulate Luffy on how he fought in the match, giving a handshake gesture, then attempting to throw him overhead, forgetting his arm is rubber. As Luffy won, he gets to choose a crew member for the Foxy Pirate, but instead of sailing their flag, Luffy opts to redesign the flag, then give it back. Luffy's poorly drawn Jolly Roger is given to them, officially ending the Davy Back fight. Although obviously grateful, Foxy vows revenge on Luffy for losing the match. The Straw Hats return to Tonjit, giving him the Foxy Pirate's old flag as a sign of their defeat. Chopper uses it as a bandage for Shelly the horse. Just as Luffy and his crew were done with the dealing with the matter of Foxy and his pirates, they soon came across another one. Sleeping beside Tonjit's house was the Admiral Aokiji. Initially, Aokiji was not hostile to Luffy and his crew, despite him being a marine and causing Luffy some fear when he told him that he knew his grandfather. Aokiji even helped Tonjit in finding a way to get back to the rest of the old man's nomad clan with his Hia Hia no Mi. However, when hostilities began between Aokiji and Nico Robin, Luffy and his crew faced off against this new foe. Despite their best efforts, Luffy and those who fought alongside him against Aokiji were utterly defeated. Fortunately, however, the Admiral simply left a frozen Luffy in defeat, but with a warning to be very wary of Nico Robin. Water 7 Saga, Water 7 Arc. Seven days after the encounter with Aokiji, Luffy had recovered and demonstrated his new frozen pose as his crew sailed to their next destination. They then encountered the giant frog Yokozuna and chased after him, with Luffy wanting to eat him. However, they were forced to turn back after getting caught in the path of the sea train, and Luffy watched as Yokozuna unsuccessfully tried to attack it. The crew went to the ship station nearby and met Kokoro and her granddaughter Chimney, and Kokoro told them that their next destination, Water 7, was home of the world's best carpenters. Luffy grew excited, hoping to find a carpenter crewmate there. Kokoro gave them a map and a letter of recommendation, telling them to find a man named Iceberg. As they continued sailing toward Water 7, Luffy talked with his crewmate about what they wanted their carpenter to be like. Upon reaching the island, the crew was forced to dock at a small peninsula in the back, and they marveled at its architecture. Nami forced Luffy and Usopp to go with her to meet Iceberg. They headed to the city center to exchange their gold for money, and Luffy bought Yagara bulls to take them there. The trio got 300 million berry from their gold and headed for the shipyard. There, they met the carpenter Kaku of the Gali Law Company, who revealed that Iceberg was the mayor of Water 7. To make their meeting with him go faster, Kaku went to check out the Mary himself, who, to their surprise, acted very irresponsibly, although his secretary Khalifa attacked them when they pointed it out. Iceberg then offered to give them a tour of the shipyard. The Frankie family suddenly swooped in and stole the Straw Hat's money, but Polly took them out, and Rob Lucci forced Polly to give the crew their money back. Luffy was awestruck when Iceberg took them inside the shipyard's Dock 1 and unsuccessfully tried to get him to join his crew. Kaku then returned to the ship yard and he broke the news that the Going Mary was damaged beyond repair and couldn't sail any further. Luffy refused to believe that they would need to find a replacement ship, but the workers gave him no option but to reconsider. Luffy and Nami then realized that the contents of their suitcases were empty and overheard Peepley Lulu reveal that he had seen Usopp, whom he mistook for Kaku, with the Frankie family, causing Luffy to immediately run off to find his crewmate. While looking for Usopp, Luffy accidentally fell in a canal where he was found and rescued by Zoro, Sanji, and Chopper. They soon found a heavily beaten Usopp in the clearing between the city and the Frankie house, and they headed toward the Frankie house to teach the Frankie family a lesson. Upon entering the house, the four of them immediately started attacking and overwhelming the Frankie family. 
not stopping even when they revealed their boss Frankie had gone to spend the stolen money. By the end of the battle, the entire Frankie house was destroyed, and as the Straw Hats were thinking about what to do next, Luffy announced that he had decided for the crew to bid farewell to the Going Merry. The group took Usopp back to the Merry, and after he regained consciousness, Luffy told him about his decision to look for a new ship. Usopp refused to believe what the carpenters had said, but Luffy stood firm in his decision as the argument grew more heated. Usopp then decided to leave the crew and challenged Luffy to a duel for the Merry. The time of the duel was set for 10 p.m. and Luffy laid around until then. Luffy and Usopp then confronted each other on the peninsula at the appointed time, and as Luffy went on the offensive, Usopp managed to stop him by pretending to be injured. This allowed Usopp to barrage Luffy with a variety of long-range attacks, culminating in a massive gas explosion that dealt some injuries to Luffy. Luffy was able to punch Usopp in the face, but Usopp countered his attack with an impact dial, which he redirected at Luffy. However, the recoil of the dial left Usopp unable to defend against Luffy's next attack, which defeated him. Luffy then bid farewell to Usopp, saying the former Straw Hat could do whatever he wished with the Mary, as he tearfully headed back toward the crew. The Straw Hats, minus a missing ramen, left the Going Merry for good and stayed the night at an inn. The next morning, Luffy heard from Nami that Iceberg had been shot, and the two of them took a Yagura bowl to go see him. They were met by a crowd as they reached Dock 1, and Frankie then arrived to confront Luffy for attacking his family. Frankie breathed fire at Luffy and Nami before jumping into the water and attacking their boat. He then punched Luffy by detaching his arm, revealing that he was a cyborg. Luffy and Frankie continued fighting furiously in the dock when they were interrupted by Polly, Kaku, Luchi, Peepli Lu, and Tilestone. Polly, Lulu, and Luchi attacked and overpowered Luffy, with Polly revealing that the Straw Hats were the main suspects in the attack on Iceberg, as Robin was one of the two attackers he had seen. Luffy refused to believe that Robin had done this and demanded to speak with Iceberg, but the Gali Law workers stood against him as the townspeople subdued Nami. Luffy attempted to escape from the workers as they pulled out sharp and explosive weapons to attack him, but he was quickly cornered and shot by Tilestone's bazooka. However, Frankie then unleashed a massive attack on Dock 1, allowing Luffy to escape with Nami. Luffy and Nami managed to reach Galila headquarters where Iceberg resided, and Luffy pulled himself in through the window. As he ran through the building, Khalifa called out to him and let him enter Iceberg's room. There, Iceberg demanded that Luffy bring Robin in to speak with him. Luffy replied that he was unable to, and he was forced to escape outside as Iceberg shot at him. Luffy and Nami escaped the outskirts of town and reunited with Zoro, but they were soon forced to hide from the citizens hunting for them. Chopper then found them and revealed that Robin had told him and Sanji that she had framed them for the attack on Iceberg and would be leaving them forever. Zoro deduced that Nami and her new mysterious cohorts would likely try to kill Iceberg that night, and Luffy decided to go back to Gali Law headquarters to confront her and find out the truth. As night fell, Luffy, Zoro, Nami, and Chopper hid in a tree near headquarters, looking for Robin to make her move. They eventually saw a massive explosion unleashed in front of a building, and Luffy immediately headed toward the building. He was blown into a crevice in another building, but escaped it and pulled himself toward headquarters. Luffy partially broke into a room where Polly was with two masked men, telling them to give Robin back. The masked men then attacked and subdued him, binding him and Polly to the ground before leaving. Luffy eventually managed to squeeze out of his bindings and freed Polly of his before the two of them raced toward Iceberg's room. After initially breaking into the wrong room, Luffy and Polly reached Iceberg's room at the same time as Zoro, Nami, and Chopper. There, they found Robin with Luchi, Kaku, Khalifa, and the bartender Blueno who were undercover assassins from the world government agency CP9. Luffy intervened when Luchi started attacking Polly, but Luchi used his Rokushiki techniques to overwhelm him. Robin then told her former crewmates that she was pursuing a goal that she couldn't reach. Luchi told the Straw Hats, Iceberg, and Polly that the mansion would soon go up in flames, but he and his comrades remained in the room to prevent them from escaping. Luffy tried to get Robin, only for the agents to overwhelm him with the Rokushiki techniques. As Robin headed toward the window, Luffy tried running toward her again, only to be stopped and tossed aside by Luchi as she departed. With the fire starting, Luchi decided to show Luffy's group the power of his devil fruit, the Neko Neko no Mi, Model Leopard. Luchi unleashed a powered-up Ronkaku attack, that caused the building to start collapsing, and Luffy attacked the agent when he confronted Polly and Iceberg. However, Luchi pierced through Luffy's body with a claw-enhanced Shigan before throwing him out of a building, sending him flying far away. Luffy flew into a narrow gap between two buildings where he became stuck. A while later, he heard Nami calling out to him from a nearby building, and Nami revealed to him that Robin had fallen in the world government's grip in order to save their lives. Intent on saving Robin, Luffy pushed the two buildings apart and pulled himself and Nami away from the outskirts of town, right before an enormous wave created by Aqua Laguna swallowed the area. However, the waves eventually reached and swallowed Luffy, Nami, Zoro, and Chopper as well, forcing Polly to rescue them. After finding out that Sanji had stowed away on the sea train taking Robin to Ennis lobby, Luffy asked Polly for a ship to use to go after them. Due to the Aqua Laguna, Polly refused to do that until the next morning, causing Luffy to decide to take a ship by force. 
However, Kokoro then interjected and told Luffy that she could take him to another secret sea train. Kokoro took the Straw Hats into an abandoned warehouse where she showed them the runaway prototype train Rocket Man. Iceberg was already there and revealed that he had already gotten the train systems running, and as the crew prepared to depart, the Frankie family came in and pleaded to come aboard so they could save Frankie. Luffy agreed to this, and the train set off. The Straw Hats soon discovered that Polly and the Galilaw workers had stowed away on the Rocket Man, and Luffy formed an official pact with Galilaw and the Frankie family to defeat their enemies and rescue Robin and Frankie together. Rocket Man headed toward a massive, deadly tidal wave, and after the Galila workers and Frankie family couldn't put a dent in it, Luffy and Zoro unleashed a combined attack to create a hole the Rocket Man could roll through. Having gone past Aqua Laguna, Luffy, Zoro, and Nami equipped themselves for the battle ahead. They came to some of the Puffing Tom's detached cars, and Luffy jumped into them to see if Sanji was there. He was immediately confronted and shot by several world government agents, and as Rocket Man approached, Luffy told Zoro to bisect the cars. Soon afterwards, the Rocket Man crew approached the Marine Captain T-Bone, who was running toward the rest of the Puffing Tom. Luffy told his allies to leave this to Zoro as well, and Zoro quickly dispatched T-Bone. Later, Luffy's group found Yokozuna standing in front of the oncoming train, and Luffy told the giant frog to get out of the way. Yokozuna hit Rocket Man off the rails, but after Luffy pulled him on board, Kokono managed to get the giant frog to join the fight as she got the train back on the tracks. Soon afterwards, the Rocket Man crew had Ennius Lobby in their sights. Water 7 Saga, Ennius Lobby Arc The Frankie family approached the Rocket Man again after being derailed by Yokozuna, this time with Sanji and Usopp in tow. However, Usopp was wearing a mask and Luffy didn't recognize him, causing him to believe Usopp's claim that he was a different person known as Soga King. Iceberg outlined a plan for the Straw Hats to remain on Rocket Man while the Galley Law workers Frankie family went on ahead to clear the way to the main island for the pirates to quickly charge in and take on CP9. Luffy acknowledged this plan but then proceeded to head out and jump towards Ennius Lobby by himself, using Gomu Gomu no Rocket to launch himself over the main gate from the protective fence. Upon landing, he immediately charged toward the Tower of Justice and beat up any marines in his way. Luffy quickly fought his way through the main island gate and pulled himself up past it, and upon landing on the main island, he was surrounded by tens of thousands of marine soldiers. Despite being vastly outnumbered, Luffy was able to terrorize the marine forces, taking out hundreds of them in the span of seconds. Luffy eventually managed to elude the marines and pulled himself up to the roof of the courthouse, where Blueno arrived through an air door to confront him. Blueno told Luffy that he and his allies were committing a grave offense with their invasion, but Luffy didn't care and charged toward him. Despite Blueno using Tekai, Luffy's strike was still powerful enough to injure him, and Luffy was then able to keep up with the agent despite him using Soru and smash him to the floor. Luffy managed to dodge Blueno's rapid attacks, but the agent then used his Doa Doa no Mi powers to create doors in the floor under Luffy's feet, trapping him. Blueno then turned Luffy's face into a revolving door which heavily distracted him, but Luffy was still able to dodge his Ronkyaku strike by going down through the floor. Luffy and Blueno then sparred some more, and despite the pirate being able to keep up with the agent's superhuman movements, he was unable to gain the upper hand. To enable himself to become stronger, Luffy activated a new ability called Gear 2, where he inflated his blood vessels, causing his blood to flow at a faster rate. Luffy then punched Blueno with such speed that even the agent with his Soru ability couldn't keep up, and proceeded to heavily injure him with powerful blows. Blueno was forced to retreat into an air door and tried opening one behind Luffy to ambush him, but Luffy easily dodged him before striking him with Gomu Gomu no Jet Bazooka. The attack broke through Blueno's Tekai and greatly injured him, and when the agent stayed on his feet afterward, Luffy prepared to activate a new gear to become even more powerful. However, Blueno then lost consciousness and fell to the ground, and Luffy noted that his body was extremely tired due to not being used to the strain of Gear 2 yet. He then shouted out to the Tower of Justice where Robin was, saying he had to come for her. Luffy was able to regain his energy by pulling two slabs of meat out of his pockets that he had packed as a box lunch, and called for anyone to come out of the Tower of Justice. Frankie then blasted himself and Robin out of the tower, but they were stopped by a fence and had to pull themselves into the tower's ledge. Luffy prepared to pull himself to the tower, but Robin stopped him, saying that she wanted to die and never wanted to see him again. As she said this, Spandam and the CP9 agents came out to the ledge and confronted Luffy. At this point, the rest of the Straw Hats made it up to the courthouse roof, and as they joined Luffy in facing Robin and CP9, Luffy told Robin that she could choose to die if she wanted, but he wanted her to do so while she was with them. Robin responded that the entire world was against her, and she didn't want the Straw Hats to consider her a burden given what they would face if she was with them. Spandam backed up that assertion, 
using it as an opportunity to boast of the world government's great might while pointing to the official flag sailing above him. However, Luffy responded by telling Sogeking to shoot down the flag, and the sniper did so, burning it up. Spandam was left aghast that Luffy directly declared war against the world government, and Luffy replied that he was fine with that. He then told Robin to say she wanted to live, and Robin tearfully did so. As the drawbridge between the courthouse and Tower of Justice was lowered thanks to the Frankie family, the Straw Hats prepared to invade the tower. However, the drawbridge was stopped by a mortar strike, and Spandam quickly tried to lead Robin away. Soon afterwards, though, Nami received a call from Kokoro that she was piloting the Rocket Man to the Tower of Justice. Upon hearing this, Luffy grabbed all of his crewmates and jumped into the chasm between the courthouse and tower, and landed on Rocket Man as it leaped from the drawbridge and flew toward the tower. The train crashed into the tower before coming to a halt, and as the Straw Hats recovered from the wreck, they were confronted by the CP9 agent Fukuro. Fukuro revealed that Spandam and Luchi were taking Robin to the gates of justice, and Robin was chained by handcuffs made of sea stone that were unbreakable and prevented her from using her powers. Fukuro and the four other CP9 agents in the tower each possessed a key, only one of which would unlock the handcuffs. Luffy tried attacking Fukuro to get his key, and the agent departed, and Luffy tried going after him but was held back by Zoro. The Straw Hats and Frankie told Luffy to go directly after Luchi and Robin while they took on the other CP9 agents. Luffy ran up the stairs and managed to reach the room that the agents and Robin had just been in, though it was now deserted. He then started running towards the gates of justice. He made it to the end of the tower but found nothing but water in between it, and so tried to think of a way to get across. He tried rowing a small boat there, but the rough ocean currents destroyed the boat and left him floundering in the water. Fortunately, Chimney and Gonbei arrived and retrieved Luffy from the water, having come to tell him that there was an underground passage from the tower to the gates. The trio raced down a flight of stairs and came to a giant steel door. Despite the door being locked, Luffy was able to break through it by activating a new gear called Gear 3, and Chimney and Gonbei were shocked upon seeing Luffy shrink to the size of a child after using it. However, Luffy quickly returned to normal size as he ran down the hall toward Robin. Luffy eventually ran to a door which he was able to kick through, and found himself in a large storeroom in a tower propping up the Bridge of Hesitation. There he was confronted by Luchi. Luffy tried to get through to keep chasing after Robin, but Luchi stayed in his way and the two clashed, with their powerful strikes resulting in heavy collateral damage. Luffy managed to catch Luchi off guard with his speed and throw the agent aside, but Luchi quickly recovered and kicked the pirate before he could run out of the room. Their sparring was interrupted when Frankie suddenly arrived, possessing two of the CP9 agent's keys. He offered to help Luffy fight Luchi, but Luffy told him to keep going and save Robin. Luchi managed to overpower Luffy so he could attack Frankie. However, Luffy then activated Gear 2 and hit the agent with powerful lightning fast punches. Luchi transformed into his human leopard hybrid form and tried to attack Frankie again, but Luffy successfully overwhelmed him with Gear 2, enough to allow Frankie to exit the room. Luffy and Luchi continued sparring, but the agent then used a Rankaku strike to rip a hole in the wall that would flood the underground passage with seawater. Saying that Luffy's crewmates would either drown or be bombarded by the incoming Buster Call and he would be incapable of saving them. The room where they were in started filling up with seawater, and Luffy followed Luchi up to the room above, which was above sea level and would not be flooded. Luchi said that Luffy could go and help his friends if he wanted, but Luffy responded that if he left Luchi alone, the agent would kill all of them. Luchi was able to overpower an injured Luffy with some advanced Shigan, Rankaku, and Tekai techniques, so Luffy decided to show him Gear 3. Luffy blew into his thumb and inflated the bones in his right arm, making it equivalent in size to a giant's. He then threw a punch at Luchi with his giant right arm, demolishing the wall and tower in front of him and launching the agent out of the structure. Afterwards, Luffy transferred the air to his torso and pulled himself onto the marine battleship that Luchi had fallen into, where he proceeded to transfer the air to his leg and unleash a powerful stomp that wreaked tremendous destruction. Luchi leaped onto the mast and transformed into his full leopard form, allowing him to maul Luffy's left shoulder. Luffy brought the air to his torso to repel Luchi, but proceeded to be overwhelmed by the agent due to Gear 3 reducing his speed. However, Marine Vice Admiral Onigumo then had his ship fire at the ship Luffy and Luchi were on in order to kill the former, but Luffy was saved from its destruction when he was forced to release the air inflating his body, blowing him back to the prop towers where he was before. But since he was the size of a child again due to Gear 3's side effects, Luffy tried to run and hide from Luchi until he returned to normal. This tactic didn't work as Luchi found Luffy and assaulted him with Shigan before smashing his small body up against the wall, trapping him. Fortunately, however, Luchi became affected by damage that Luffy had given him earlier and was stopped from unleashing a deadly attack, and enough time passed to allow Luffy to return to normal size. 
Luffy then activated Gear 2 once again, despite the potentially debilitating effect it could have on his body. Luffy was able to overwhelm Luchi with his attacks, but Luchi then attacked him with a new technique called Roku Ogon, a Rokushiki ability accessible to those who had mastered the normal six techniques. The technique created a shockwave that damaged Luffy internally, much like an impact dial, though with significantly greater power. As the walls around them started to crumble from the bombardment, Luffy looked outside and saw his crewmates on a nearby part of the bridge, encouraging him. Luffy resumed fighting Luchi, but the agent noted that his Gear 2 power appeared to have lost its edge before attacking the pirate with another Rokuogon strike, causing him to collapse to the floor. However, Usopp then called out to Luffy, having removed his Soga King mask, and also called out Luchi, saying he would be the agent's next opponent. Luffy protested, and Usopp said he would need to get back up and win if he wanted to keep Luchi away from him, saying they would all go back together once the agent was defeated. Spurred on by Usopp's words, Luffy got back up and exchanged a flurry of blows on with Luchi. Luchi then wrapped his tail around Luffy's body and struck him with another Rokuogon. But despite taking that attack, Luffy quickly got up. He then assaulted Luchi with a flurry of Gear 2 punches in a technique called Gomu Gomu no Jet Gatling, which sent the agent crashing into the wall and knocked him unconscious. Victorious at last, Luffy shouted out to Robin that they would be going back together. However, Luffy then collapsed from his wounds, and though he heard Usopp's call to join them on an escape ship, and became surrounded by all five of the Buster Call battleships, he stated that his body couldn't move at all. However, Usopp had Robin push Luffy off the edge of the prop tower with her ability, and as Luffy fell toward the ocean, the Going Merry suddenly resurfaced, giving the Straw Hats a chance to escape. Luffy fell into the ocean, but was rescued by Kokoro, who tossed him onto the Merry. As the Straw Hats collected themselves, Robin thanked everyone for saving her and Luffy grinned in response. The marine battleships prepared to fire at the Mary, but their aim was thrown off due to Sanji having closed the gates of justice, which created violent whirlpools. One of the ships managed to lock onto the Mary and fire, but Zoro and Sanji used Luffy's body to intercept the cannonballs and launch them back at the marines. Frankie used coup de vent to blast the Mary away from the battleships, allowing the Straw Hat to sail away from Ennis Lobby victorious. Once they reached safety, Usopp put his Soga King mask back on and lied that Usopp had gone off on another boat, which Luffy believed. The Straw Hats then encountered a Galila ship captained by Iceberg, and as this happened, the entire bow of the Mary nearly broke off entirely. Luffy begged Iceberg to help Mary, saying the ship was essentially their crewmate. However, Iceberg replied that the best thing to do for the Mary would be to let it rest. After a few seconds, Luffy solemnly accepted this, and after his crew had evacuated the ship, Luffy used the torch to set it on fire before disembarking onto a small rowboat. Luffy thanked the Mary for all it had done for them, and as the ship burned, it stunningly spoke to the crew like it had during its arrival on Ennis Lobby, apologizing for being unable to carry them further. Mary's words caused Luffy to start bawling as he apologized to the ship for treating it as poorly as he had. However, Mary then responded that it was happy to have gone this far, and thanked the Straw Hats for taking care of it as it broke down and sank to the sea. Water 7 Saga Post Ennius Lobby Arc As everyone relaxed at Water 7 two days later, Frankie decided to build a ship for the crew out of the special wood called Atomwood. However, at that point, Marines led by Vice Admiral Garp broke into Iceberg's mansion where everyone was staying and punched the still sleeping Luffy to wake him up. To everyone's shock, Luffy revealed that Garp is really his grandfather and revealed the training Garp put him through as a child. Garp soon told Luffy about the four emperors and how Shanks was one of them. Soon after, Garp asked Luffy about his meeting with his father, as Luffy was surprised to learn he had a father and he encountered him in Logetown. Garp casually revealed the name of Luffy's father, known as Dragon the Revolutionary, who is considered by the world government to be the worst criminal in the world. Luffy didn't know of Dragon, as he is met with surprise from his crew and friends before he turned to Robin, who informed him why his father was infamous. Afterwards, Garp said that it was supposed to be a secret. Sometime after, Sanji revealed to the Straw Hats that Usopp was planning to rejoin the crew. While Luffy, Nami, and Chopper wanted him to rejoin and planned to invite him back, Zoro insisted that Luffy should be a firm captain on his position, and Usopp shouldn't return so easily, as he should return on their terms, not his. Zoro even threatened to leave the crew if Usopp was allowed to rejoin without asking for forgiveness for his behavior. Luffy understood the message and agreed with Zoro's view of the situation. A few days later, Chimney, Gonbei, Mozu, and Kiwi burst in on the Straw Hats to tell them their new ship was complete. Shortly after, Zambai and the rest of the Frankie family also appeared, revealing to the Straw Hats their new bounties. They then revealed that their boss also received a bounty, which led them to the Straw Hats who had begged them to let them join their crew. After the Straw Hats, they excitedly left to Scrap Island, where their new ship was moored. There, Iceberg unveiled their new caravel, much to the pirates' delight. 
After briefly exploring the ship, Luffy asked the Iceberg where Frankie was. Having discerned that the young captain wished to recruit Frankie as their shipwright, Iceberg advised Luffy that if he really wanted Frankie, he would need to use force. With the help from the rest of the Frankie family, Luffy got a hold of Frankie's underwear as a bargaining chip to get him to join his crew. Frankie simply posed naked, unabashed, and said, I'm still a man, naked. Meanwhile, Sanji came running with Zoro to tell everyone that Vice Admiral Garp had sailed on the opposite shore to attack position. Luffy then threw Frankie's swim briefs back on and told him to sail with them. Frankie then stated that he did want to see his dream ship reach the end of the world and become the greatest ship ever built. Frankie agreed to join after this. Shortly after, Garp appeared and started attacking the Straw Hats and their new ship. At that moment, Usopp tried to rejoin the crew, but because of Zoro's speech, he was ignored until he apologized. During the struggle between Garp and the Straw Hats, Usopp finally apologized and admitted that he wanted to rejoin. With that note, Luffy tearfully accepted him back into the crew. With Usopp and Robbie's return, Frankie wished to grant the ship its new name, and while most of the Straw Hats gave some suggestions, with Luffy giving some of the most ridiculous ones, they in the end went with Iceberg's suggestion, the Thousand Sunny. After escaping Garp's onslaught of iron balls using their new ship's emergency escape feature, the Kuda Burst, the newly formed Straw Hat crew sailed off to find their next adventure. Thriller Bark Saga, Thriller Bark Arc. After sailing for some time on the Thousand Sunny, Luffy and the rest of the crew found themselves in the presence of a ghost ship. Wanting to explore the ship, Luffy along with Sanji and Nami climbed aboard. There, they met a skeleton named Brook. When Luffy asked him to join his crew, the skeleton eagerly accepted. Luffy then brought Brook back to the Thousand Sunny to show to the rest of the crew, much to their dismay. Over dinner, Brook explained his past, and later explained that he really can't join Luffy due to his current condition of having his shadow stolen. Luffy, really wanting to have Brook as a member, promised to get Brook's shadow back no matter what. This pleased Brook so much that the skeleton decided to perform before the crew with his violin, revealing he's a musician. Just as Brook was about to perform, a ghost appeared as well as the gates of a strange island. Thriller Bark These events prompted Brook to head to the island before Luffy and the rest of the Straw Hats' eyes. With Luffy's resolve to go to the island to get his long-awaited musician, in fact nearly since the beginning of his journey, and to explore the island, Frankie and Robin decided to join him also. After witnessing Frankie's present to the Straw Hats, Luffy and the rest of the Straw Hats decided to look for Nami, Usopp, and Chopper, who had not returned. However, before Luffy and the rest could go to the island, they were stopped by an invisible thing. After the Thousand Sunny got caught in what was apparently a spider web, Luffy and the rest descended to the island. There they met the Cerberus, which Luffy thought of eating, soon followed by even more strange creatures. At one point, they came across some ghosts, one of which Luffy tried to catch. The ghost was unaffected and instead passed through Luffy and temporarily drained his will to go on. After recovering, the group meets with some zombies. Luffy and the rest defeat the zombies with a combo technique. Luffy then asks the zombies about his three friends that came by earlier. The zombies inadvertently reveal that they attacked them when they showed up. For this, Luffy and the rest shove the zombies back into the graves headfirst. The group then met with Spoil, a zombie-looking old man who asked them to defeat Gekko Moria who had stolen his shadow and the shadows of others like him. Robin then explained that Moria was a Shichibukai with a former bounty higher than Luffy's. With plans to actually beat Moria, Luffy agreed to help the old man and the others who had their shadows stolen. As it began to rain, Luffy and the others discovered that Thriller Bark was actually a ship. With their goal in mind, they ventured into Moria's mansion. Inside the mansion, Luffy and the others fought against the zombies in the dining hall. After the battle, he and the others noticed that Sanji was missing. With nothing else to do in the room, Luffy and the others decided to take Buhichuk, the leader of the zombies in the room, along in order to have him guide them to the rest of their friends. As Luffy left the room, the zombies told him to be scared of Moria's wrath for what Luffy and his friends did in the dining hall. Luffy, in response, merely replied that he will kick Moria's ass. After walking a while with Buhichuk as their hostage, Luffy, Robin, and Frankie suddenly noticed that Zoro was missing too. The situation was beginning to become suspicious. Later, Luffy found a suit of armor and decided to don it. After a while, the three came upon an arena-like area. There, Luffy and Robin witnessed the bout between Frankie and a general zombie. After watching it for a while, Luffy's group were suddenly trapped in the room by Buhichuk. There, they were forced to fight a large group of general zombies. In the middle of the battle, Luffy found himself face to face with a general zombie with three swords like Zoro. Before Luffy could get a clear answer from Jigoro, who was caught off guard by some spider mice zombies, Luffy was then sealed in a coffin by the spider mice with their webbing and was then sent to the main mast of Thriller Bark. Luffy was brought afterwards before Gekko Moria. After being stripped of his armor, Luffy had his shadow stolen by Moria through the use of the power of the devil fruit Moria ate, the Kage Kage no Mi. 
Upon being separated from his shadow, Luffy fell into a coma. With Luffy's shadow in Moria's hands, Moria decided to put it in the 900th zombie, Ors. Having his shadow finished being extracted, Luffy was then brought back to the Thousand Sunny by some spider mice. After being placed in the Thousand Sunny's kitchen along with Sanji and Zoro, Usopp managed to wake them up. After being briefed on what happened while they were out. With Nami and three of their shadows taken, Luffy and the others planned to take them back. Luffy was then informed by Frankie of Brooke's relationship with Laboon. Even more excited by this information, Luffy is even more decided to have the skeleton join their crew. With this, Luffy and his crew decided to take back from Moria what he stole from them and their friends, with the determination to get everything back before dawn arrives. Luffy and his crew split into two teams, with part of his team headed to save Nami and himself headed to defeat Moria. Luffy's team purified several zombies with some salt from Usopp. As they rampaged through and purified Moria's zombie horde, Luffy and Sanji unfortunately got subdued by more of Perona's ghosts. Fortunately, however, they were saved by the rest of the team before the zombies could get to them. Just as things were getting chaotic enough, Ors, the zombie with Luffy's shadow, came crashing into the part of the building Luffy's team was in, and separated part of the building as well as part of Luffy's team. With only Robin and Chopper left with him, Luffy and the two decided to continue towards Moria, seeing that the others would not be beaten so easily. As the three continued onward, they were stopped in Moria's dance hall by Hogback and Sindri. Fortunately, however, Robin and Chopper were able to hold off these two long enough for Luffy to slip past them. Luffy finally reached Moria, and after a short conversation, started attacking the Shichibukai. However, as soon as Luffy threw a punch, Moria used his own shadow, Doppelman, to fight in his stead. Undeterred by this seemingly invincible being, Luffy was still able to land a hit on Moria himself by attacking the Shichibukai from an indirect place. However, despite using this tactic for some time, Luffy was still unable to land a direct clean hit on Moria. This continued until Ors came back to the freezer and started obeying Moria's orders fully. Once Moria gave Ors the order to completely annihilate all of the Straw Hats, the zombie began to attack Luffy. Luffy dodged the blow and started to chase after Moria, who had decided to run away from the chaos that was about to ensue. As Luffy chased after Moria, he was led deep within the forest of Thriller Bark. However, as Luffy was chasing Moria, the Shichibukai tricked Luffy into chasing Doppelman. Upon realizing what happened, Luffy was left stranded in the middle of the forest. Seeing that dawn was fast approaching, Luffy immediately tried to find his way back to the masked mansion. However, while running around lost in the forest, Luffy encountered the group that the old man, Spoil, was head of the Thriller Bark Victims Association. With some convincing by the members of the association, the Risky Bros of the Rolling Pirates, Luffy was told that they knew a way to beat Moria. Through some explanations by the Risky Brothers' Captain Lola, Luffy was told of the process of using captured shadows to power oneself up for 10 minutes. Luffy was implanted with 100 shadows that the Thriller Bark Victims Association had collected over the years and became a vastly larger blue being that was dubbed Nightmare Luffy. With this newfound strength and skills bestowed by the shadows, Luffy rushed off to Mast Mansion, where Ors and Moria were battling against his crew and Brook. Arriving just in the nick of time to save both Nami and Usopp from Ors, Luffy immediately started battling against the zombie. He easily overpowered him with his devastating attacks, wounding Moria as a result as well. With the execution of his final move, Gomu Gomu no Storm, Luffy's 10 minute limit was up. However, Luffy had inflicted so much damage onto Ors that the behemoth completely toppled over into the masked mansion. Though Luffy was exhausted by having so many shadows implanted within him, the battle was still not over, for Ors rose back up to continue battling on. Despite their wounds, Luffy, his crew, and Brook rose back up as well and started one last combined attack against the zombie. While the rest of his crew began to restrict Ors' movement, Luffy was brought to the top of Thriller Bark with help from Brook's high jumps and Robin's ability. At the top, Luffy was then thrown down towards a restricted Ors. As Luffy fell, he activated Gear 3 and landed a crippling blow to Ors, shattering the zombie's spine and rendering him incapable of moving anymore. Despite Luffy's strong will within him, Ors was no longer able to move. However, while Ors was indeed finally defeated, Luffy and the other shadowless victims still had to get Moria to return all of their shadows before the rising dawn incinerated them. Unfortunately, despite receiving the blunt of Luffy's attack, Gekko Moria managed to rise back up and instead of giving back their shadows, the Shichibukai replied with his horrifying technique, Shadows Asgard. Despite Moria's transformation into a giant monstrosity, time getting dangerously over before dawn, and all the fatigue and wounds from earlier, Luffy readied himself to fight Moria one last time. As Luffy battled against Moria to the limit, with Gear 2 techniques that made Moria spew out some shadows, dawn was quickly approaching. Eventually, with time practically almost over, 
Luffy decided to stack his gear transformations on top of one another in order to perform a reckless move, Gomu Gomu no Gigant Jet Shell, to use against Moria. As Luffy attacked Moria with his move, and just as the first signs of dawn started to incinerate both Luffy and the others, Luffy asked his own shadow to come back to him if it wanted to become Pirate King. Then, with one last use of Gomu Gomu no Gigant Jet Shell, Luffy was able to topple down Moria, unable to hold his stolen shadows any longer. With this, Luffy's shadow and all of the other shadows of those in Thriller Bark returned to their original owners just in time to save them. With everyone's shadows finally returned and Moria finally defeated, Luffy collapsed from all of the fatigue and pain he experienced from the night beforehand. While things seemed finally over, the celebration was however cut short with the arrival of Bartholomew Kuma. The second Shichibukai, having seen and reported the whole event to the world government, was ordered to take out Luffy as well as eliminate everyone else on the island who witnessed Luffy's victory over Moria. The battle for an unconscious Luffy then ensued between the second Shichibukai and everyone else left standing willing to protect Luffy. In the end, Zoro asked if he could exchange his life for Luffy's. Impressed by Zoro's loyalty, Kuma pushed all of the pain from the battle from Luffy's body with his ability and implanted it into Zoro to make him feel Luffy's pain. After Kuma left and a day of rest went by, an energetic Luffy decided to celebrate their victory with everyone. As the party went on, Luffy noticed Brooke playing a familiar song on a piano. Remembering that this was a song that Shanks and his crew used to sing all the time, Luffy got into a conversation with Brooke. As Brooke played and the conversation went on, Luffy once again asked Brooke to join his crew. Brooke once again turned down Luffy's offer since the skeleton still had some things to do. Knowing what he was talking about, Luffy revealed to Brooke that not only did he learn about the skeleton's relationship with Laboon, but also told him that Laboon was alive and well. Having told Brooke this, Luffy touched Brooke's heart and made the skeleton burst into tears of joy. As the party got more joyous, with Brooke bringing out a tone dial with the last musical performance of the Rumbar Pirates on it, Luffy was asked by Brooke if he could join his crew. For this, Luffy casually agreed, much to the shock of most of the crew. With this very casual acceptance, Luffy finally got the musician he so longed for since his journey as a pirate began. After two days of recuperation, Luffy and his crew decided to leave Thriller Bark for Fishman Island. As they were about to leave, they were introduced to the concept of the Vivre card by Lola. Remembering the piece of paper that Ace gave to him, Luffy took out the Vivre card that his brother gave to him. Upon taking it out, however, Luffy noticed that Ace's Vivre card was burning a little and becoming smaller. With this, Luffy was explained that Ace's life was slowly vanishing. Dismissing the Vivre card state as Ace having his own adventure, Luffy and his crew sailed away from Thriller Bark and onto Fishman Island. Summit War Saga, Sabadi Archipelago Arc After several days of traversing the dangers and wonders of the Grand Line, the Straw Hats became overjoyed when they finally reached the Red Line. Luffy, Robin, and Brooke attempted to get down to Fishman Island in the Shark Submerged the Third. But the submarine couldn't go that far down, and they were chased back up by a sea bunny. After returning to the Sunny, Luffy defeated the sea bunny with one punch, causing it to spit out a mermaid named Kami and a talking starfish named Papag onto the Sunny's deck. To thank Luffy for saving her, Kami offered the Straw Hats some takoyaki. Luffy examined her and Papag with great curiosity, not having realized he had already met a mermaid in Kokoro. He was eager to receive the takoyaki, but when Kami called her partner Hachan, she found out that he had been kidnapped by the macro pirates and the flying fish riders. Nami volunteered the crew to rescue him, and Luffy instantly agreed when he heard about Hachan's takoyaki making skills. Kami called fish to direct them towards the flying fish riders' hideout, and Luffy learned that the group was one of the many kidnapping gangs around the Sabadi archipelago, being led by Duval. Some flying fish riders then arrived and started attacking the Sunny, but quickly retreated. The Sunny then reached the Flying Fish Rider's base, which appeared abandoned. The Straw Hats approached a cage containing Hachan, and Luffy and his first four crewmates recognized him, becoming hesitant to rescue him. However, when Kami and Papag went to save Hachan and were caught by the Macro Pirates, the Straw Hats decided to save Hachan as Luffy freed Kami and Papag from the Macro Pirates' grasp. The Flying Fish Riders then emerged from the ocean to attack, and Luffy hijacked one of the Flying Fish. However, the flying fish were then ordered to go underwater, forcing Luffy's crewmates to rescue him. One flying fish rider charged towards the Sunny with a giant mace, and on Sanji's command, Luffy knocked out the fish while Sanji took down the rider, and Luffy put the fish on the deck to eat for dinner. Luffy watched as Brook put several more riders to sleep with his music and tried hijacking another flying fish, but ended up crashing into Duval's room. In the room, Luffy saw Duval without his mask on before Duval put it on and confronted him. Luffy was chased back outside by Duval and his bison, Motobaro, and as Duval angrily confronted Sanji, 
Luffy hit his mask off to reveal that Duval's face resembled the one on Sanji's wanted poster. Duval had the Flying Fish Riders put a steel net around Sanji before throwing him into the sea, and Zoro had to hold Luffy back from jumping in after him. Luffy then watched in awe as Kami raced to save Sanji, and frankly blew apart the Flying Fish Riders' base with the Sunny's cannon. Duval then prepared to charge at Luffy with Motobaro, but with just a few words, Luffy managed to cause the bison to turn around and fall unconscious. Sanji then told Luffy to let him finish off Duval, and the former proceeded to do so. Afterwards, the Straw Hats gorged on Takayaki that Hachan, Kami, and Papag made for them, and Duval and the newly renamed Rosie Life Riders came to thank them for Sanji changing Duval's face to give him a new appearance. After the meal, Papag told the Straw Hats that they would need to give the Sunny a special coating to sail down to Fishman Island and into the New World, and they could get this at the Sabadi Archipelago. They soon reached Sabadi, and Luffy marveled at the bubbles coming out of the ground. Hachan said he would take the Straw Hats to a good coating mechanic, but insisted that they not defy any world nobles they encountered. Luffy, Chopper, and Brook went shopping with Kami, Papag, and Hachan, and eventually saw a slave attempting to run away. However, the collar around the slave's neck then exploded, and when his masters Saint Shalria and Saint Roseward came up to him, they shot him. This enraged Luffy, but Papag warned him that attacking a world noble would result in a marine admiral being summoned. Luffy's group was attacked by several bounty hunters, but he, Chopper, and Brook dispatched them with ease. They then arrived at Grove 13, where they entered Shaki's ripoff bar to find the coder. The owner, Shakyaku, knew who Luffy and his crewmates were and figured they had come to find Rele. She revealed that he had been away for six months, but said he'd like to go to the Sabadi amusement park, revealing there were nine other pirates there with bounties over 100 million berries, including one man with bounty higher than Luffy's. Luffy's group then headed to Sabadi Park, where they enjoyed the rides and attractions. However, Kami ended up being kidnapped by the hound pets while the rest of the group went to get ice cream, and Luffy, Papag, and Hachan ran off to find her. The three of them searched human shops looking to find Kami, and Papag and Hachan told Luffy about the discrimination fishmen and merfolk faced there. The Rosy Life Riders then came to pick them up to bring them to the human auctioning house where Kami was being sold, and Luffy and his rider picked up Zoro on the way there. They end up crashing through the door right as Kami was being sold on stage, and Luffy rushed to her despite Hachan trying to hold him back. Luffy eventually got past Hachan but looked back and saw the fishman being shot by the world noble Saint Charlos. He then walked back up towards the two of them, and despite Hachan's pleas not to go against the world noble, Luffy went up to Charlos and punched him in the face, sending him crashing through several benches and knocking him unconscious. Luffy apologized for going against Hachan's orders, but his crew immediately joined him in attacking the guards and attempting to free Kami. During the chaos, Silver's Rele came out from backstage and used Haoshokohaki to knock out almost everyone, including all the guards and world nobles, and he had told Luffy he had been looking forward to meeting him. Rayleigh freed Kami of her slave collar and said he would talk with Luffy later, as the marines had surrounded the auction house and Rayleigh had no intention of confronting them. The pirate, useless kid, told his fellow supernovas, Luffy and Trafalgar Law, that he and his crew would confront the marines themselves, but the two of them immediately went out to join Kid. The marines shot mortars at the three of them, but they each used their devil fruit powers to redirect the shots back at them. The supernovas then went on the offensive and decided to meet back up in the new world as their crews joined them in decimating the marines before heading off separately. The Straw Hats and their allies went to Rayleigh, where they parted ways with the Rosie Life Riders before going back to Shaki's bar. Rayleigh revealed that he was Goldie Roger's first mate and told the Straw Hats the truth about Roger's final voyage and execution. When Usopp asked Rayleigh about the One Piece, Luffy loudly stopped him, not wanting to have the treasure spoiled for him. Rayleigh liked Luffy's attitude and agreed to coat the Sunny for free, saying it would take him three days. The Straw Hats received a Reaver card from Rayleigh to reunite with him at that time, and they headed out with the objective to survive the Marine Onslaught until then. However, the Straw Hats were immediately confronted by a pacifista that they mistook for Bartholomew Kuma. The pacifista shot a beam at them, and after finding out who Kuma was and what he did on Thriller Bark, Luffy decided to go all out as he activated Gear 2. Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji performed some of the strongest attacks simultaneously on the pacifista, but only knocked it into a building without damaging it much. It soon got back up and overwhelmed Zoro, but the Straw Hats unleashed consecutive powerful attacks on it, ending with Luffy's Gomu Gomu no Gigant rifle, which successfully took it down. The Straw Hats tried to rest only to be immediately confronted by the Marine Science Unit Commander, Sentomaru, and another pacifista, PX-1. Since they were in no shape to continue fighting, Luffy decided to have the crew split up and run away, telling them to reunite at the Sunny in three days. 
Luffy ran off with ramen and chopper, but Sentomaru confronted them, and he used Busoshoku Haki in his palm strikes to hurt Luffy. Luffy then saw the Marine Admiral Kizaru attacking Zoro, but before Kizaru could finish Zoro off, Rayleigh came in and intercepted his attack. Luffy told Usopp and Brook to take Zoro and run away, knowing that all of them were too weak to beat the enemies in front of them. However, he watched as his crewmates were overwhelmed by PX4 while he was slammed into the ground by Sentomaru. In the midst of this onslaught, the real Bartholomew Kuma appeared, and Luffy watched as he transported Zoro to another place. Sentomaru told Luffy what Kuma had done, and after Kuma transported PX1 away as well, Luffy yelled at his crew again to run, as it was all they could do at this point. However, it was not enough as Kuma sent Brook, Usopp, and Sanji flying away as well. Kuma repelled an attack from Luffy before sending Frankie and Nami away, and Luffy was unable to do anything as the Shijibukai finished the job making Chopper and Robin disappear. With everyone gone, Luffy started breaking down over his inability to save his crew, and Kuma told him that they would not see each other again as he sent Luffy away from Sabadi. Summoned War Saga, Amazon Lily Arc Luffy was sent flying upon Kuma's touch, and flew for days until he landed on the island Amazon Lily. He decided to use Rayleigh's Viver card to head back to Sabadi, but collapsed after running into a cliff face and unsuccessfully trying to destroy it. After killing and eating a boar, Luffy found some mushrooms and ate those as well. However, he ate a body mushroom, which caused mushrooms to grow from his body and threaten his life. He was discovered by Marguerite, Sweet Pea, and Afalandra, and they took him to the village. There, they burned the mushrooms off of Luffy and took him to the river to wash him. There, when Sweet Pea mistook Luffy's crotch for a mushroom, Elder Nyon revealed to the citizens, who were all females, that Luffy was a man. Luffy was put in a cell, and after waking up, he took back his straw hat from the Amazon Lily citizens as they ogled at him. They gave him some clothes, and when he reacted negatively to their feminine design, the women got angry and decided to execute him. Intent on returning to his crew, Luffy destroyed the roof of his cell with a kick and escaped. After being slammed to the ground by Afalandra, Luffy realized he needed to recover Rayleigh's Viver card from his trousers. Upon seeing Marguerite with them, he grabbed her and scaled the cliff around the village, returning to the woods. Marguerite gave him the Viver card, and after Luffy revealed that he was a pirate, Marguerite told him about the Empress Boa Hancock, who is also a pirate. Marguerite helped Luffy remove the frills from his clothes, and he asked if she could give him a boat to leave, to which she replied that Amazon Lily was located in the Calm Belt. Luffy decided to build a raft, but it quickly fell apart, and after saving him, Marguerite decided to kill him to avoid becoming attached. Luffy dodged Marguerite's arrows, which possessed considerable power due to being imbued with Busushoku Haki and the latter's comrades arrived to reinforce her. Luffy managed to escape by climbing back up the mountain overlooking the village, and he decided to find an important person to help him by going to a tall building. He jumped onto the roof of Hancock's palace, but ended up breaking through it and falling into Hancock's bath, where he saw a mark on her back. Hancock's sisters, Boa Sandersonia and Boa Marigold then came in, and the three of them said Luffy would have to die for seeing Hancock's back. Hancock attempted to turn Luffy to stone with her Mero Mero no Mi powers, which had no effect on Luffy as he mistook them for Foxy's Norodoro beams. Luffy then jumped out of the palace but was shot by Hancock's kiss and was captured by the Kuja upon falling to the ground. Luffy was put into an arena and Hancock refused to believe his account of how he got to Amazon Lily. Marguerite, Sweet Pea, and Afalandra then pleaded on Luffy's behalf, but Hancock turned them to stone. She then released the panther Bakura to attack Luffy, but Luffy defeated it with one punch. Luffy was enraged with the spectators for laughing at Hancock's actions towards Marguerite's group, being unaffected by Hancock's charms. Hancock then sent Sandersonia and Marigold to the ring to kill Luffy, and they used their devil fruit powers to transform into snakes. Luffy struggled against the two sisters as they dodged his attacks with Kenbun Shukuhaki and hurt him with Buso Shokuhaki, and they decided to punish him further to destroy the statues of Marguerite's group. Luffy desperately yelled at them to stop, which unbeknownst to him exerted Hao Shokuhaki that stopped the Gorgon sisters in their tracks, and knocked out several Kuja in the audience. Deciding to go all out, Luffy activated Gear 2, and its speed was enough to overwhelm Sandersonia's Kenbun Shokuhaki, as well as overpower Marigold's Buso Shokuhaki. The Gorgon sisters then unleashed their ultimate attacks as Sandersonia turned her hair into Yamata no Orochi, and Marigold turned hers into flaming salamanders, but Luffy destroyed all of them with Gomu Gomu no Jet Gatling, and managed to tie the sisters' tails together sending Sandersonia falling towards the spike pit around the arena. She grabbed the edges of the arena, and Luffy realized that her clothes had been burned off, causing him to climb on her exposed back to cover the mark on it. After realizing what he had done, Hancock had the Kuja evacuate the arena. Hancock told Luffy that she would either return Marguerite's group to normal or give him a way to leave the island, 
and Luffy chose the former, becoming overjoyed when Marguerite was depetrified. Luffy was taken back to Hancock's palace, and inside a chamber, Hancock revealed that the mark on her back was the hoof of the soaring dragon, which signified that one was a slave of the world nobles. She revealed that she and her sisters were once slaves on Mary Joie before being freed, and the Kuja believed the marked spots to be cursed Gorgonized because of the marked shame. Having taken a liking to Luffy after finding out that he had attacked the world noble, Hancock offered to take him wherever he wanted to go. After requesting to go to Sabadi starting the next day, Luffy partied with the Kuja, but had to run away after they started wanting to touch him. He came to Elder Nyon, who revealed that Hancock was a member of the Shichibukai. Nyon then told him the news about Ace's imprisonment and impending execution, and a shocked Luffy decided to put his return to the crew on hold to save his brother. Nyon told him that it would take a week to reach Impel Down with a pirate ship, but a marine ship could get there in four days. This caused Luffy to request that Hancock accept the marine summons to come to Ace's execution, and Hancock, who unbeknownst to Luffy, was afflicted by lovesickness for him, readily agreed. Luffy hid under Hancock's robes as she boarded the marine battleship and made arrangements to stop at Impel Down. Summit War Saga Impel Down Arc Luffy hid in Hancock's room as the marine battleship headed for Impel Down, and she requested large meals so he could eat. As they arrived at the Great Prison, Luffy was awed by the number of battleships stationed there. He hid under Hancock's mantle as she disembarked and headed for the prison, but she revealed to him that the workers would be doing a full body check of her. Upon entering the prison and going to be inspected, Hancock petrified the vice head jailer Domino and the security cameras to allow Luffy to go in undetected, and she made him promise to not cause too much ruckus. Luffy hid in the ceiling rafters as Hancock was accompanied into the prison. Luffy followed Ace's Vivre card and snuck through a gate to level 1 after it was opened by some guards chasing a prisoner. The prisoners in level 1 begged Luffy to free them when Luffy noticed Buggy being chased by the Blue Gory. Intent on not getting caught, Luffy and Buggy worked together to attack the Blue Gory. Luffy ended up defeating all five Blue Gori. Luffy decided to give Buggy the Armand immediately, but in their race down the corridor, Buggy ended up crashing into the wall. Thinking they needed to go through the wall, Luffy punched through it, sending him and Buggy into the guard's room before breaking through another wall into a forest of spikes. Luffy flew on Buggy's back over the spiked floor until they reached a pit leading to level 2, which was filled with stronger criminals and worse tortures. Luffy immediately jumped into the pit, with Buggy following him soon after. Upon arriving at level 2, Luffy and Buggy immediately encountered the Basilisk, which Luffy managed to defeat with Gear 3. The prisoners then asked the duo to free them, and Luffy angrily pulled Buggy aside when the latter did that instead of helping him. Buggy admitted that he had no idea how to get to level 3, and that he was planning on ditching Luffy, only to renege on this statement when all of the prisoners he freed had abandoned him. Galdino, formerly known as Mr. 3, then came and offered to help them. The trio were later chased by multiple other beasts, including the bosses of the level, the Manticores. Galdino found out that Luffy was attempting to go deeper rather than escape, and unsuccessfully tried to leave, causing him to take Luffy to a staircase going to level 3. The staircase was guarded by the Sphinx, which Luffy only made angrier with his attacks. Galdino distracted the Sphinx with wax replicas of himself, but its attacks caused the floor to cave in, sending it and Luffy's group down to level 3. Luffy, Buggy, Galdino, and the Sphinx landed in level 3, a dry and hot wasteland known as Starvation Hell. However, they were swiftly caught in a giant net made of sea stone and confronted by the chief guard, Saldeth. Their entrapment didn't last long though, as the Sphinx regained consciousness and tore apart the net. Luffy saw that Buggy and Galdino had gone up to try to escape, and he thanked them for bringing him here as he proceeded to fight through the Blue Gori and Sphinx on his way to level 4. Luffy got away from the scuffle, but had to deal with some guards and traps before being confronted again by the Sphinx. However, Luffy then saw Mr. 2, Bon Kure, with Zoro's face, leap in and attack the beast. Working together, Luffy and Bon Kure defeated the Sphinx, and they happily embraced as Bon Kure stated that he wanted to find someone on level 5 as well. Luffy and Bon Kure fought through more Blue Gori before being confronted by the Minotaurus of the Jailer Beasts. The two of them were initially injured by Minotaurus' spike club, but Luffy used Jet Bazooka to send it flying a great distance away. Bon Kure then guided Luffy to a well tower that overlooked level 4, a blazing inferno that created the heat in level 3. Luffy asked Bon Kure whom he wanted to find, and the latter replied that he wished to meet Eva the Okama Queen. However, they were then joined by Buggy and Galdino, who were being chased by Minotaurus. Each member of the party used strong attacks on it, concluding with Luffy reinforcing his arm with Galdino's candle lock to defeat the beast. Luffy and Bon Kure prepared to head into level 4, much to Buggy and Galdino's horror. However, the floor fell out from under them as a result of their attacks, causing all of them to plunge down to level 4. After avoiding landing in the boiling pool of blood, Luffy decided to race in the direction of the kitchen because of its good smell, and Bon Kure followed him. 
However, after defeating several more guards, Luffy was confronted by the warden, Magellan. Moncure warned him to run away from Magellan and his Doku Doku no Mi, and Luffy was forced to run away from Magellan's poisonous hydra hands. He swung across a flaming pit to get away, but Magellan spit a poison ball at him that created an explosion and overwhelmed his senses. Magellan then moved through a poison pathway to get to Luffy, and Luffy dodged his attacks as he continued to be afflicted by the poison ball. Intent on rescuing Ace, Luffy then went on the offensive and hit Magellan with Jet Bazooka, but this resulted in his arms being covered with Magellan's poison. Luffy attempted to attack Magellan further, but was always met with a warden's poisonous creations and eventually hit by more poison. Magellan also breathed poisonous mist into the air, disorienting Luffy and causing his attacks to fly into empty space. Luffy kept fighting for as long as he could, but was eventually overwhelmed by the vast number of poisons in his body. At Magellan's command, he was brought into the freezing wasteland of level 5 to die. After regaining consciousness, Luffy tried crawling towards Ace and refused to die, but could barely move and quickly passed out again. Boncore then found him and dragged him to try to find Eva, but was attacked by wolves. However, Luffy came to and bit a wolf as he proceeded to knock all of them out with a shout before passing out again. Luffy and Boncore were found by Emporio Vankov, the Eva Boncore was looking for, as well as Inazuma. Luffy pleaded with Ivankov to save Boncure, causing Ivankov to decide to help Luffy as well. Ivankov took Luffy to level 5.5, his new Kama land, and had Luffy chained to a platform as he explained his treatment. By taking away 10 years from Luffy's life, he would give him a slim chance of surviving the poison. He then injected healing hormones into Luffy, and Luffy was consumed by pain and anguish. Inazuma projected it would last for two and a half days, However, Luffy managed to successfully complete the process in 20 hours, and he pressed against the door, keeping him in the chamber as he was desperately hungry. Luffy ate days worth of rations for over 30 minutes before he fully recovered, and he thanked Ivankov and Boncure for saving him and propelling him to recovery. He asked if Ivankov was going to escape now, and Ivankov said the time wasn't right yet. But Luffy then revealed that Dragon was his father, astonishing Ivankov, who revealed that he was a comrade of Dragon's in the Revolutionary Army. Ivankov then agreed to accompany Luffy to rescue Ace, and injected adrenaline hormones into Luffy that would keep him active for a day. Luffy, Ivankov, and Inazuma then headed out and raced through level 5, beating the wolves in their way. They then approached and entered a gate leading to level 6, a level shrouded in secrecy where Ace was being kept. Luffy, Ivankov, and Inazuma fought their way to level 6, only to find out that they were too late, with the prisoner Jinbei revealing that Ace had just been taken to be executed. The prison guards then blocked off the lift and the stairs and unleashed sleeping gas into the room, but Inazuma blocked the gas with his Choki Choki no Mi abilities, although this blocked off the stairs even more. Ivankov told Luffy that Ace was already on his way to Marineford, and it was best to give up and let Whitebeard rescue him, but Luffy refused and was intent on going to Marineford. Crocodile then offered to help Luffy escape through the ceiling. And Luffy was surprised to see the former Shichibuka imprisoned here, refusing Crocodile's offer because of his actions on Arabasta. However, Ivankov told Luffy that he knew a secret about Crocodile that would keep him under control. Jinbei then asked Luffy to free him, saying that he wanted to help save Ace as well, and Luffy agreed to this as his group freed Jinbei and Crocodile from their cells. Inazuma created a pathway to the ceiling with his powers, and the group broke through into level 5. They then raced up the stairs to level 4, and fought the guards there as they were joined by prisoners who were freed by Buggy and Galdino, as well as Dad's Bones who had been freed by his boss Crocodile. Luffy was told to go on to level 3 in the midst of the skirmish, but turned back as he saw the Jailer Beasts attacking the escaped prisoners, and he and Jinbei and Crocodile defeated the Jailer Beasts altogether at once. The group was then confronted by the chief guard, Sadi, but Ivankov threw Luffy forward to get him to keep going. Luffy was confronted by the vice warden, Hanyabal, who refused to let him pass, and despite Luffy hitting him with multiple attacks, Hanyabal refused to go down and kept attacking. However, Hanyabal was then brought down by Marshal D. Teach, and Luffy realized that he was the Blackbeard that had captured Ace. Blackbeard said that fate was on Luffy's side when Ace prevented the former from hunting down the latter as he had originally intended, but Luffy responded by punching him. As Luffy charged to attack again, Blackbeard slammed him into the ground, injuring him with his Yami Yami no Mi. Jinbei then prevented Luffy from attacking Blackbeard further, and Luffy was compelled to head for level 3 as Blackbeard and his crew went on to continue the execution of their plan. Luffy's group made it to level 3 and stormed their way through the Impel Down forces to level 2. While fighting the Manticores, Luffy found out that Ivankov and Inazuma were facing Magellan and had wanted to go back and help, but was held back. His group then reunited with Buggy and Galdino right as Magellan arrived at level 2. 
and Galdino used his wax to block the Warden's Poison Hydra from hitting Luffy. Luffy then got an idea to fight Magellan together with Galdino, and Galdino created wax armor to put around Luffy's arms and legs. Luffy then successfully punched Magellan with the wax protecting him from the poison. However, Magellan countered with Kinjite, a poison strong enough to destroy objects, forcing Luffy and Galdino to run away. They arrived at the outside of the prison, but Bonkure told Luffy that they had not managed to get a ship yet. Ivankov and Inazuma then arrived, having survived Magellan's poison, and Luffy got in contact with Jinbei, who told his group to jump into the sea. Luffy and Galdino worked together to force back Magellan's Venom Demon, and Luffy had Ivankov blow all the prisoners towards the sea with his Hellwing. When the prisoners were over the water, Jinbei called a school of whale sharks to carry them to the battlefield that he had commandeered. Luffy and the prisoners celebrated as they reached the battleship, but soon found themselves under attack from the other marine battleships. They then faced another problem as the gates of justice were closed, preventing them from leaving Impel down. However, Jinbei continued ahead at full speed, and as the gates suddenly opened, he revealed to Luffy that Bonkure had stayed behind to open it. Luffy wanted to go back and rescue him, but Jinbei stated that this was impossible and leaving him behind was necessary. Jinbei then gave Luffy a baby Den Den Mushi to contact Bonkure, and he and the other prisoners tearfully thanked him as their ship managed to get out of Imbel Down right before the gate was closed. As he wept over Bonkure, Luffy punched Buggy for taking the Okama's fate lightly, and he also talked to Jinbei whom he found out was a Shichibukai. Marine headquarters then called the battleship, and Luffy answered it. They identified him and Buggy as the co-instigators of the prison break, and said that they would have no chance of reaching Marineford. However, Luffy declared that he would save Ace no matter what, and when Buggy was hailed by the prisoners after it was revealed that he had served on Goldie Rogers' crew, he changed his mind and agreed to go with Luffy to Marineford as well. Summit War Saga, Marineford Arc the Impel Down escapee ship approached the Gates of Justice to Marineford, and to their surprise, the gates were opened immediately. Ivankov wondered if Dragon would come to save Ace, but Luffy revealed that Ace wasn't related to him by blood, and that Ace's father was Goldie Roger. Luffy tried looking for Marineford, but couldn't due to the thick fog. The escapee ship was suddenly carried by a giant wave heading towards Marineford created by Whitebeard, but the wave was frozen right above the island by Admiral Aokiji, leaving the escapees trapped on top of it. Luffy got the idea to free the battleship from the ice and slide down the back of the wave. However, after picking up transmission revealing that Ace would be executed ahead of the scheduled time, the group tried to hurry and get the battleship out, which caused the ice below them to shatter and send them and plummeting straight down onto the frozen Marineford Bay. By sheer luck, they ended up crashing into a marine battleship in a small unfrozen part of the bay, and Luffy stood on the battleship's wreckage as he called out to Ace. Crocodile attempted to attack Whitebeard, but Luffy kicked the former warlord away due to Ace caring about Whitebeard. Whitebeard told Luffy that he would be throwing his life away trying to rescue Ace, but Luffy didn't care and brashly told the Emperor that he would save Ace himself and become Pirate King. Surprising Whitebeard and earning his respect, Luffy told Whitebeard that Ace's execution time had been moved up, addressing the Emperor like an equal before running into the battlefield. Luffy was immediately met by Admiral Kizaru, but Ivankov redirected Kizaru's laser. As Luffy fought through dozens of marines, Hina attempted to ensnare him, but Luffy used his speed to evade her abilities. Gekko Moria then summoned a zombie army to attack Luffy, and Ace told Luffy to leave, claiming to not want his help. However, Luffy declared that he would rescue Ace and disregard any pirate code because he was Ace's little brother, and Jinbei took out Moria's zombies with a blast of seawater. As this occurred, Sengoku revealed to all that Luffy was just as dangerous as Ace, since he is the son of Revolutionary Dragon. Unfazed by his lineage being revealed, Luffy then took out a member of the giant squad with Gomu Gomu no Gigant Rifle, saying he would save Ace even if it killed him. Luffy continued fighting through the marines, but right after forcing Tashigi aside, he was hit by Smoker. Smoker used his Moku Moku no Mi powers to make Luffy's attacks pass through him before pinning Luffy down with his Jite, but he was then kicked away by Hancock. Hancock gave Luffy the key to Ace's handcuffs, and he happily embraced her before running off. He ran into Ivankov confronting Bartholomew Kuma, and watched as the emotionless Shichibuka used his new pacifista modifications to attack. Luffy kept running, but then encountered Dracul Mihawk. Luffy attempted to avoid Mihawk, but the Shichibukai kept pace and hit him with a spinning air slash. Some of Ivankov's followers attempted to protect Luffy from Mihawk, but Mihawk quickly beat him. Luffy attempted to attack Mihawk, but cut it short upon realizing that his arms would be cut off. Mihawk was impressed at his clear-headed attitude and swung his sword at Luffy, who ducked as he saw the slash cleave through the frozen wave far away. Luffy was forced to avoid Mihawk's slashes, but ended up getting farther from Ace. He then pulled Buggy in front of him to intercept Mihawk's attacks, and was able to run away when Buggy attempted to attack Mihawk. 
After this, Luffy saw Vista of the Whitebeard Pirates battling Mihawk. Luffy saw that the Marines were going to execute Ace very soon, but was met by Kizaru and kicked away at the speed of light. He tumbled over to Jinbei and some of the Whitebeard Pirates division commanders, and the commanders went to help Luffy by dealing with Kizaru. A short time later, Luffy watched in shock as Whitebeard was stabbed by his subordinate Squard. However, Whitebeard recovered and entered the fray, and Luffy was annoyed when the Emperor's Gura Gura no Mi ability shifted the ground and almost made him fall into the water. Luffy reached the edge of the bay and attempted to pull himself up to land, but was unable to due to the Marines raising an encircling wall. Luffy then watched in awe as Admiral Akainu unleashed magma meteors into the bay to melt the ice. Luffy raced towards an opening in the encircling wall, but was beaten back by the Marines lying in wait there. After landing near Vankov and Jinbei, he asked them for a favor and Jinbei sent him over the wall in a blast of seawater. Luffy landed in front of the three marine admirals and although he couldn't harm them due to their Logia abilities, he activated Gear 2 to run past them. Kizaru quickly caught up to him and kicked him back and Luffy was helpless as executioners started to execute Ace. However, Crocodile took out the executioners, but Luffy was then attacked by Aokiji who injured him with an ice spear. Marco of the Whitebeard Pirates stepped in and attacked Aokiji, allowing Luffy to go on. However, Luffy was overpowered by Vice Admirals Momonga and Dalmatian before being shot by Kizaru, who kicked him at light speed again. Luffy was caught by Whitebeard, who threw him to his subordinates for his wounds to be treated. Luffy refused to be sidelined, but soon collapsed from exhaustion. Ivankov came up to him, and Luffy requested to be injected with vigor hormones again. Ivankov initially refused, but Luffy didn't care about the dangerous consequences and so received the injection, giving his body energy it was not equipped to handle. Luffy raced towards the execution platform again, but was immediately confronted by Kobe, who was determined to stop him. However, Luffy dealt with Kobe's Soru and defeated him with one punch. Luffy was then confronted by some pacifista, but he was shielded by Hancock, who the pacifista were unable to attack. The executioners then attempted to execute Ace again, and Luffy, who was still too far away, yelled at them to stop. Unwittingly unleashing a large burst of Haoshoku Haki that knocked them out, more marines began targeting Luffy, but more of the Whitebeard pirates backed him up on orders from Whitebeard. Luffy was then attacked by Mihawk again, but Mihawk's strike was intercepted by Daz Bones, who along with Crocodile confronted him. As Luffy reached the bottom of the wall underneath the execution platform, Inazuma emerged from Ivankov's hair and created a ramp going up to the platform. Luffy ran up the ramp, but was confronted by his grandfather, Garp, who couldn't let him pass. Garp said Luffy would have to beat him to rescue Ace, and Luffy activated Gear 2 and punched his grandfather off the ramp. Garp's arrival caused the ramp to break, but Luffy jumped off the falling pieces and made it to the execution platform. There, he was confronted by Fleet Admiral Sengoku, who turned into a giant Buddha, and Kizaru destroyed the key to Ace's handcuffs with a beam. Luffy then saw Galdino stirring from unconsciousness next to Ace, and he told the former Baroque Works agent to create a wax wall around Ace while Sengoku prepared to punch him. Luffy absorbed Sengoku's punch with Gomu Gomu no Gigan Fusen and was pressed against the wax wall, causing the entire execution platform to start collapsing. As they were falling, Galdino gave Luffy a wax key to free Ace, and Luffy used it to unlock Ace's handcuffs, allowing Ace to shield them from the Marines' bazooka shots. Upon reaching the ground, Luffy and Ace worked in tandem to take down the Marines, and Ace protected Luffy from an attack by Aokiji. Luffy and Ace were then shocked as Whitebeard proclaimed that he would die to let everyone escape. Luffy was initially unable to get Ace to escape with him, but after Ace spoke with Whitebeard, the two brothers went on to move again. However, Ace turned around to confront Akainu after the Admiral degraded Whitebeard, and as he watched the two fight, Luffy dropped Ace's Viver card. When he went to pick it up, Akainu swooped in to kill him, only for Ace to step in and take the blow. Jinbei stepped in to prevent Akainu from attacking Ace again, and the heavily injured Ace fell into Luffy's arms. As Luffy called out for medical attention, Ace told him to greet Dadan for him, and apologized that he would not see Luffy's dream come to fruition. He then thanked Luffy and the Whitebeard Pirates for loving him before passing away, and as he kneeled over Ace's dead body, Luffy suffered a complete mental breakdown. Jinbei took the incapacitated Luffy away to protect him from Akainu, but they were confronted by the Admiral again as they neared the bay. Akainu managed to punch through Jinbei's body with a magma fist and hit Luffy, severely injuring his chest. Crocodile then stepped in and sent Luffy and Jinbei up in the air with a sand cyclone, where they were unwittingly caught by Buggy. Buggy took them to Trafalgar Law and the Heart Pirates, who had just arrived on their submarine, the Polar Tang. And Beppo took Luffy inside as the crew prepared to submerge. 
They were able to do so thanks to the intervention of Kobe and the Red Hair Pirates. And despite last ditch attacks by Aokiji and Kizaru, the Polar Tang made it out of Marineford as Luffy was laid on a table to receive medical attention. Summit War Saga Post War Arc Luffy was next seen being treated for his injuries by Law's submarine. As he was being treated on Law's submarine, Law, Ivankov, Boa Hancock, and Jinbei commented on how much damage he had accumulated, and Jinbei worried about his reaction to all that had happened when he awakened. After two weeks of recovering from his injuries, Luffy awakens in Amazon Lily and goes on a rampage, blindly asking where Ace is. After remembering Ace's death little by little, while still destroying the rocks and the trees in the forest, he stops for a moment as Jinbei tries to explain to him that the war was over and Ace is dead. Luffy states he has realized that it wasn't a dream by pinching his cheek very hard and starts to finally cry and mourn over his loss. While weeping, he thinks back to when he first met Ace. After the flashback, he begins to doubt his abilities and starts to think about how he could possibly become the Pirate King if he's too weak. After that, Luffy has a little verbal and physical struggle against Jinbei, who told him not to regret his brother's death and that he has not lost everything yet. Luffy then remembers that he still has something priceless, his crew, and then declares that he wants to go to Sabadi Archipelago to meet his crewmates again. Soon after that, he meets Silver's Rayleigh and learns about his and Shaki's relationship with Nyon, Boa Hancock, and her sisters. Luffy asks if any of his crew had returned to Sabadi Archipelago, to which Rayleigh replied that they probably hadn't. After Rayleigh explained how he had learned Luffy was on Amazon Lily, Rayleigh explains that if Luffy went back to Sabadi, the same tragic events he suffered would occur again. Luffy then starts to listen to a proposition Rayleigh has for him. Although no word left from Luffy and Rayleigh, the word about Luffy being alive is being spread throughout the world. However, there's something lingering within the newspaper regarding actions of Luffy. The article revealed that Luffy actually infiltrated Marineford a second time, accompanied by Jinbei and Rayleigh. After they stole a marine ship, they circled Marineford once, which according to Lieutenant Commander Branu, is a custom for burials at sea. Luffy then went into the plaza alone and rang the ox bell 16 times, threw a bouquet of flowers into the rubble, and then bowed his head in silent prayer, leaving promptly after. His goal from this was to send the message, 3D2 on, to the other Straw Hats, meaning they would meet at Sabadi Archipelago not in three days, but in two years. Luffy is later seen on the Kuja Pirate's ship, resting so he can recover from his injuries. The other Kuja Pirates are all at his bedside, watching him under Hancock's orders while playing with his stretchy skin. Luffy then says that he hopes that his message reached his crewmates. Rayleigh then assured him that it would, since it was highly unlike him. Jinbei eventually left the Kuja ship while riding a whale shark after Luffy and Jinbei gave their thanks to each other, and Jinbei tells him that he will continue to aid Luffy later on in the future, and that he looks forward to meeting Luffy and his crew two years from now. Luffy eventually arrives in Rusakaina, a deserted island northwest of Amazon Lily, with Akuja and Rayleigh where he will train with Rayleigh alone. Rayleigh explains the three forms of Haki while demonstrating them on a rampaging elephant. The demonstration excites Luffy and makes him eager to learn them. Luffy then puts his hat on a stone, which is the only safe spot on the dangerous island, with a Viva card while saying that he'll take a vacation from being a pirate for some time. New World Saga During the Time Skip at some point in the time skip, Luffy developed Gear 4 in order to help him subdue the beasts of Rusakaina. He later asked Rayleigh how to improve his attack power with it, and Rayleigh warned him about the consequences of using it. However, Luffy later learned how to properly utilize Gear 4. While teaching Kenbon Shoku Haki to Luffy, Rayleigh challenged Luffy to dodge 100 times while blindfolded or he wouldn't be allowed to eat. When Luffy was attacking blindly, he accidentally hit Rayleigh's dinner, causing him to hit Luffy. While lying on the ground hungry, some animals gave him food, but Luffy refused to eat what they offered. During a later conversation, Rayleigh remarked on how Luffy was proficient in sensing the feelings of living things. He also mentioned that there are people who can see a glimpse into the future and asked Luffy what he would do if he met one of these people. After teaching Luffy the basics of hockey, Rayleigh informed him that hockey grows stronger when one faces a stronger opponent. Return to Sabadi Arc. After two years of training, Luffy is greeted by Hancock, Marigold, Sandersonia, Marguerite, and Yon, who are prepared to take him back to the Sabadi Archipelago. Luffy turns to a group of extremely large animals and tells them to back off from his friends. Sandersonia remarks that Luffy has become the boss of the entire island. Luffy complains that he can't eat those animals now that they're friends, but Hancock promises that food is waiting him aboard the ship. Luffy then reveals that Rayleigh had left him six months earlier than planned, as Luffy had learned all that Rayleigh could teach him about hockey. When Hancock brought up the idea of 
of becoming Luffy's wife, Luffy bluntly refuses before thanking her. Luffy then put his straw hat back on, a symbol of the pirate straw hat Luffy returning from his vacation. The group then sets off towards the Sabadi Archipelago. After reaching somewhere close to Sabadi Archipelago, Hancock gives Luffy the cloak she wore to impel down, a fake mustache, and a large bag full of supplies. Luffy then leaves the Kuja ship on a small boat. While searching for his crew on Sabadi Archipelago, Luffy accidentally knocks over the imposter version of himself. The imposter demands for Luffy to stop and threatens him to beg for forgiveness. Luffy just apologizes again and keeps on walking. This causes the fake to fire at Luffy who quickly dodged the bullet. He then knocked out all of the imposters using Haushokuhaki and keeps on walking, following the direction in which the Vivre card is going. Luffy decides to put on the fake mustache that Hancock gave him. He soon meets fake Zoro and fake Sanji, who he believed to be the real ones, and so follow them back to fake Luffy. As Luffy follows the fake members, he's led to fake Luffy on Grove 46 and brought up to a podium where the fake crew is. While the fake Luffy is about to announce his revenge on Luffy, the Marines, followed by pacifistas and Sentamaru, attack. While the recruits of the fake Straw Hats are beaten, the real Luffy is revealed to everyone present after Sentamaru takes out the imposter, who turned out to be a pirate called Three-Tongued Damalo Black, who's worth a mere 26 million berry and orders one of the pacifista to locate him. Luffy dodges a laser attack from a pacifista with Kenbon Shoku and takes out the pacifista in one single Buso Shoku imbued jet pistol. This indicates to all the spectators, to their surprise, that he's indeed the real Luffy. Zoro and Sanji greet him after the two take out a pacifista together. As Luffy begins to escape from the Marines with the real Zoro and Sanji, he sees Rayleigh and thanks him for everything before saying farewell to him by proclaiming, I'm going to be Pirate King once more and sets off to Grove 42. As the monster trio head back to the Thousand Sunny, they found marines blocking their way only for Perona to come and fend off the marines with her negative hollow. She then informed the trio that the marines were coming by the sea. They were then picked up by Chopper and a giant bird who quickly took them to the ship. Luffy then had a chance to briefly admire Frankie's new body before they were attacked. Hancock and the Kuja pirates came to Luffy's aid by intercepting the attacking marine ship. When Luffy revealed that he knew her, he gained the envy of Sanji while Nami and Usopp were surprised that Luffy was sent to Amazon Lily. They then started making preparations to leave with Nami explaining on how a coded ship works. Luffy said to his crew that he has a lot to talk about and thanked them for following his two-year plan. Luffy then states that it's time to set sail for Fishman Island. With the Marines held back by the Straw Hat's new allies, the crew submerged and headed for Fishman Island. Fishman Island Arc as the sunny submerges, Luffy gets excited and marvels at the scenery around him. He and Zoro then try to catch some fish, but are beaten down by Usopp and Chopper. When Sanji suddenly flies out of the bubble due to his nosebleed because of his weakness towards women, Luffy grabs him and pulls him back in. After Nami further explains about the coding, Luffy and Zoro once again try to catch some fish, but again they are beaten down by Usopp and Chopper. Seeing that Sanji is out of commission, Luffy then decides to share the bentos he got from Hancock with the rest of the crew. Frankie then reveals to the crew that the one who ensured the safety of the sunny, along with Hachi and Duval, during the last year was Bartholomew Kuma. He states that he found him sitting in front of the Sunny, and later Rayleigh told them that Kuma made a deal with Vegapunk to input a mission to protect the ship until a Straw Hat returns. As the crew wonders about Kuma's true intentions, Caribou and his crew are following behind them from a distance, trying to catch up. With their sea cow, the Caribou pirates eventually caught up to the Straw Hats, and they prepare for battle. Caribou quickly sets foot on the Thousand Sunny. However, before his crew can follow, his sea cow, which turns out to be Momu, fled in fear after seeing Luffy, Nami, and Sanji taking the rest of the Caribou pirates and leaving Caribou alone. The Straw Straw Hats then tie up Caribou. When the crew travel through the deep currents and encounter a sea monster known as the Kraken, Luffy decides to tame it and have it pull their ship much to the others' dismay. Luffy then realizes that they're underwater, which is a problem for him. Caribou then introduces Flutter Kick coding to the crew. Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji then use it and fight the Kraken out in the sea. Luffy scolds Zoro for cutting some of the Kraken's tentacles before knocking it out with his Gomu Gomu no Elephant Gun. The monster trio defeat the Kraken, but because they're not wearing lifelines, they get separated from the ship as it goes down the underwater waterfall. Later, Luffy successfully tamed the Kraken and named him Sudome. Unfortunately, Luffy and Sanji's bubbles had broken, so they had to share Zoro's coding. After some searching, the monster trio eventually found the Thousand Sunny and the rest of the Straw Hats just in time for Sudome and save them from the Umi Bozo. After reuniting with the ship, Luffy was then startled when he heard the undersea volcano starting to erupt. The Straw Hats manage to escape the eruption thanks to Sudame and Usopp's pop greens. Soon, the crew sees Fishman Island. Luffy then begins to wonder what kind of food there is in Fishman Island while drooling. Then a gang of sea monsters led by Hamond appear. 
Halmon gives the crew two options, join the new Fishman pirates or die. As the Straw Hats prepare to run using Kuda Burst, Luffy gives Halmon a rejection. Halmon doesn't take kindly to Luffy's rejection and prepares to attack the Thousand Sunny. Frankie activates Kuda Burst and the ship flies through the bubble surrounding Fishman Island. After they pass through the bubble, they fell into a current and the crew is separated. Luffy then wakes up in Kami's house, where Sanji, Usopp, and Chopper are also there. Kami introduces them to some of her friends, the Medaka Mermaid Quintuplets. She then takes the four pirates to Mermaid Cove where they meet more mermaids. As the crew relaxes in Mermaid Cove, Luffy asks Kami if he can see Jinbei. When Kami informs him that Jinbei is not on the island, Luffy shows his disappointment as he was looking forward to meeting him. Soon the Madaka Mermaid quintuplets inform Kami and the group that a royal gondola is approaching. Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper then hide behind cover while Sanji is being covered by a mermaid. The three brothers of the Neptune house appear, searching for the people who entered Fishman Island illegally. The mermaids deny seeing any intruders. As the three brothers are leaving, Sanji gets another massive nosebleed, making him lose more blood than ever before. While Sanji is in critical condition, Luffy, Chopper, and Usopp beg for a blood donation. Hamond and his crew then appear and tell the story of how Fisher Tiger supposedly died. After a gruesome battle, Fisher Tiger suffered a critical blood loss and could have been saved with a blood transfusion, but humans refused to help him. Hamon goes on to say that because of the humans who left Fisher Tiger to die, there's a law that prevents Fishman and Merfolk from sharing blood with humans. Hamon then attempts to capture the four straw hats, firing a net at them. But Luffy is able to dodge the net by sidestepping it and knock out the pirates with Jet Pistol. A sea monster tries to attack Luffy, but he subdues it with hockey. Kami takes the gondola and helps the four straw hats escape and takes them to the town port. And the four pirates find shelter in Madame Charlie's mermaid cave. Madame Charlie provides them a room where they can treat Sanji. Luffy and the others luckily come across Splash and Splatter, a pair of Okamas who happily agree to donate blood to Sanji. As Sanji's recovering, Luffy recalls that he got a scar on his arm after he attacked Hamond and his two companions. Luffy notices that the octopus merman managed to block his attack. Chopper checks Luffy's blood and sees that Luffy was poisoned and is amazed that Luffy's body is able to fight against it. Luffy then remembers an old four, Majilin. As Sanji is resting with Chopper watching over him, Luffy, Usopp, and Kami go to the Mermaid Cafe and meet Madame Charlie, the owner. Luffy and Usopp marvel at Charlie's crystal ball and learn that Charlie was the fortune teller. Luffy asks if Mermaid can poop, but gets quickly terrified of Madame Charlie. Kami then takes Luffy and Usopp to the front entrance of the Mermaid Cafe. Luffy shows his great disappointment when he learns that the Mermaid Cafe doesn't serve meat. The group soon meet Brooke and Papag, and they have a happy reunion. Papag delighted Luffy by offering him sea monster meat, and Luffy is glad that there's meat on Fishman Island. The group then travel by riding on a fish taxi, and Luffy sees a variety of fishmen and merfolk. They soon come across a candy factory with Big Mom's Jolly Roger on it. After learning that Big Mom is the new protector of Fishman Island, Luffy comments that she must be a nice person and wonders if he'll meet her someday. After passing the factory, they arrive at Papag's house. Luffy and the group soon learn that there's a criminal clothing store on the first floor. As soon as they enter the store, they find Nami making complaints for the high prices. Papag says that the Straw Hats can have whatever they want for free. After hearing this joyful news, they empty the store much to Papag's dismay. They then hear a commotion outside of the store and they find that King Neptune has arrived to meet them. Luffy and the others are then invited by the king himself to his castle. Luffy and his group take a ride on a megalo while Neptune rides on Ho. On their way to the palace, Luffy spends his time sightseeing. Once they arrive at Ryugu Palace, Luffy marvels at the sight of it. After entering the castle, Luffy wanders away from the group in search of food. Luffy had followed his nose, but lost the scent. He saw a door that he thought the smell of the food originated from. The double door in question is huge, made of mostly metal, had two sets of handles, ring knockers high above and then regular handles near ground level. Embedded in the doors were three swords and a double-bladed axe. Embedded in the wall around the doorway was an axe, another sword, and the head of a morning star. Luffy, completely ignoring the weapons embedded in the doors and walls, thought the sturdy look of the walls reminded him of Impel Down. He wondered how good food behind that sturdy of a door could be. When he went through the door, it was pitch black, but Luffy saw food on the other side of the room, making him wonder if the room was the banquet hall. He then wondered if he had found the food vault. Luffy then decided he would only take a little bit of food as his stomach was at its limit. While running across the room, he crashed into something. He thought it was coral that felt really soft. When he first touched the coral, he heard a grunt, but thought it was someone outside. He then began jumping on the coral, comparing its consistency to pudding. He then hears someone ask if someone was in the room. A light suddenly came on and Luffy suddenly began to fall. He falls next to a gargantuan giant smelt whiting mermaid, the mermaid princess Shirahoshi. What he had thought was coral was actually the coarse material of her top, and the softness he felt was actually her breast. She asked him what he was doing on somebody else's body, and who he was. Luffy was amazed by the size of the princess. 
She then asked him if he were here to take her life too, and that she wasn't scared. She tried to hide her fear by saying she was the daughter of Neptune, but she couldn't hold back her tears, which were so big that Luffy had to actually dodge the falling water droplets. She then yelled for her father and brothers, as Luffy pointed out that he wasn't doing anything to her. As she continues crying, an axe thrown by Vanderdecken comes flying into her room aiming for the princess. Luffy deflects the axe, saving Shirohoshi's life. When the guard come to Shirohoshi's room, the princess hides Luffy from them. She tells the guards that the noise they heard coming from her room was her having a bad dream. The Minister of the Right explains the situation with the Straw Hats. Once the guards leave, Shirohoshi speaks with Luffy. While Luffy's eating, Shirohoshi asks him many questions about the outside world and wonders how Luffy can eat so much while poking him in the cheek. Luffy snaps back and Shirohoshi starts to cry, saying that no one had ever yelled at her before. Luffy points out that Shirohoshi is a big crybaby, causing her to cry even more. Luffy then offers to take a walk with her outside the castle with him being the bodyguard. Luffy asks Shirohoshi where she wants to go. The princess says that she wants to go to the sea forest. When she starts crying again, Luffy starts to refer to her as weakling. Knowing that Shirohoshi's size will draw attention, Luffy comes up with a plan. As Brooke and the Minister of the Right arrive to her room, Shirohoshi exits the room stuffed inside Megalo while Luffy rides on the top of the shark. Once they leave the palace, Shirohoshi tells Luffy that in the sea forest, there is a grave that she wants to visit. Unbeknownst to Luffy, Jinbei is there waiting for him. While hovering above Coral Hill, Luffy sees Chopper, Sanji, and a bandaged Hachan. Once Luffy jumps down to meet them, he's met with accusations from the Fishman Island citizens for mermaid kidnappings. Megalo has finally reached his limit and spits out Shirohoshi. The Fishman Island citizens instantly concludes that this is a mermaid princess kidnapping. After tying up Luffy, Chopper, Sanji, and Hachan, the citizens discuss about what they should do with Luffy and his group. Once they decide that beheading them is the best course of action, Captain Deccan flies in on his thrown piece of coral, demanding the princess to marry him. Shirohoshi refuses, saying that Deccan is not her type. Enraged, Deccan prepares to kill her. The citizens urge her to run, but Luffy tells her to stay where she is because he will not be able to defend her if she gets too far away. Luffy uses hockey to subdue the fishman restraining him, and using only his legs to smash the coral and pummel Deccan into the ground. Shirohoshi then unties Luffy, much to the surprise of the citizens. The princess, Luffy, and his friends then hop on Megalo as they attempt to flee the scene. Deccan calls out to Watatsumi to intercept them, but Luffy hits him in the mouth with a jet pistol, shattering one of his teeth. The group then continue their path to the sea forest. They soon reach the sea forest and meet Jinbei, Frankie, and Den. Luffy introduces Shirohoshi to Frankie and is overjoyed to see Jinbei again. Frankie then introduces Den to Luffy. After deflecting an axe thrown by Deccan, Luffy watches Shirohoshi pay her respects to her deceased mother. Nami and Kami arrive bearing terrible news about the Ryugu Palace. Jinbei then decides to reveal that he was responsible for allowing Arlong to run wild in the East Blue. Before Jinbei begins his explanation, Luffy displays his forgetfulness by not recalling what Yosaku said about Jinbei back in the East Blue, as well as forgetting the name Fisher Tiger. In the meantime, Luffy listens to Hachan as he explains the Fishman and Merfolk's dark history, and to Jinbei as he explains the ideals of Queen Otohime and Fisher Tiger. Luffy sleeps through the whole thing, only remembering the very beginning when Otohime confronted the robber. After Jinbei finishes his story, Sanji wakes Luffy up by kicking him. A visual Denden Mushi appears, and the group watches Hody Jones' speech. After Hody Jones explains his plans of creating the new Ryugu Kingdom, he leaves a message for the Straw Hats. After he executes Neptune, he's going to drown Zoro, Usopp, and Brook. He then shows Luffy's wanted poster and says that he will make a fine example out of a 400 million berry bounty hen. Luffy celebrates his bounty increase while Nami scolds him for it. He then decides that if Hody wants a fight, he has no other choice but to give it to him. However, Jinbei tells him not to go, as fighting Hody will add to the human fishman prejudice. Luffy, however, tells him that he has to save his crewmates and that if Jinbei wants to stop him, he'll have to fight him. Luffy remains insistent on going to Ryugu Palace. He tries to hop on Megalo, but Jinbei stops him with Fishman Karate. Luffy counterattacks with a jet stamp, and Jinbei blocks it. The two then charge at each other when a clone of Robin suddenly appears before them. Before they collide, the clone vanishes, and Luffy and Jinbei hit each other. After the real Robin appears, Jinbei once again tries to reason with Luffy, but the Straw Hat Captain remains stubborn. Jinbei comes up with a plan that will make Luffy look like a hero instead of a villain. Luffy disagrees at first, but goes along with the plan when Jinbei agrees to give him all the meat he wants. Luffy goes to Gyonko Plaza while hiding inside Megalo. He jumps out of Megalo's mouth at the moment when Hody is about to kill Neptune and attacks the coup leader, sending him flying back. After Jinbei shouts for the rest of the crew, Nami manages to steal back the world noble's letter, as well as the keys to the royal family's locks, which Robin uses to free them. Above the plaza are the Thousand Sunny and Neptune's whale, Hoei. 
The Sunny blasts the new Fishman pirates from the Gown Cannon, while the Whale rescues his master and the princes. The island residents ask Luffy if he's a friend or foe, to which he responds that it's their call to make. The rest of the crew then gather at the plaza and are prepared to engage Hody's crew in combat alongside Jinbei. Upon hearing that Hody ultimately plans to become the Pirate King, Luffy becomes enraged. When Hody orders his subordinates to attack the Straw Hats, Luffy unleashes a burst of Hao Shokuhaki and knocks out half of them in an instant. He then tells Hody that no matter what kind of king he plans to become, there can only be one Pirate King. Luffy activates Gear 3 and take out more of Hody's men. As the battle with the new Fishman Pirates commences, Luffy takes the time to gaze and admire Frankie's new weapons from the Soldier Dock system, the Black Rhino and the Brachio Tank. When Hody commands Tsurume to attack, Luffy reminds the Kraken that they're friends. Luffy then hops on Tsurume's back as the Beast attacks the new Fishman Pirates. When Hody threatens to kill Tsurume's family at the North Pole for disobeying him, Luffy understands why Tsurume had to join him. He then tells the Kraken that he'll protect his brothers too. He then walks over to Hody, enraged at the Fishman's threats towards Tsurume. He dodges the attacking pirates and gives the Fishman a swift and devastating kick to the Fishman's jaw. Hody then retaliates by punching Luffy's face, but due to Luffy's rubber body and Hody's amateur Fishman karate, Luffy's neck stretches back. Luffy takes advantage of the situation and uses a Bosushoku Haki to harden his forehead. When the Iron Shell Division comes to guard Hody, Luffy uses his head to smash right through them. He then uses his Haki again to harden his arm and block a kick from Hody, and then hardens his leg to give Hody a powerful kick of his own. Hody attacks with the Yabusami Barrage, but Luffy uses his Kenbun Shoku Haki to dodge it before giving Hody a Haki imbued punch that sent him flying. Luffy noted that Hody was tough when he managed to get back up. Upon seeing Shida Hoshi willing to sacrifice herself so that Noah would not destroy the island, and Hody climbing up underneath Noah to go after Vanderdeck in the ninth, Luffy told his crew that he's going up there. Upon receiving a bubble-making coral from Jinbei, Luffy grabs onto Sanji's leg and prepared to be catapulted up to Noah. After Sanji sends Luffy flying, he lands on one of the chains. Luffy equips himself with a flutter kick coating before he goes into the sea. Hody attempts to attack Luffy, but he's helped by Fukaboshi. Luffy tells Fukaboshi to take him to the deck of Noah, but Hody goes ahead of them. After Hody deals a devastating blow to Dekken, he tries to kill Shidahoshi. Luffy grabs Hody and throws him away. Hody is undeterred and still confident that Fishman Island will be destroyed and that Luffy can't do anything to stop it. However, Luffy is confident in his own abilities after his two-year training. When Shidahoshi changes her course, Hody attempts to stop her, but is grabbed by Luffy again. Unfortunately, Dekken passes out and the ship no longer follows Shidahoshi and begins to fall. Luffy then plans on destroying Noah, but Fukuboshi tells him that the ship is too important to destroy and that they should move it instead. As Luffy and the princes fight against Hody, he keeps interfering with their attempts to stop Noah. Luffy punches Hody into the ship and Hody slices a hole in the air bubble in retaliation, preventing Luffy from boarding it. After Fukuboshi learns Hody's true character, Hody then tries to stop Luffy and Shidahoshi again, but Luffy breaks his kirisame and sends Hody flying back. And Hody once again gets up. Fukuboshi tells Luffy about how the new Fishman Pirates were formed out of hatred and resentment. As the prince laments on how everything has been happening, he asks Luffy to bring Fishman Island back to zero. Luffy tells Fukuboshi that he will not let anyone hurt Fishman Island because they are friends. Hody once again charged at Luffy, but Luffy managed to deliver a very devastating blow to Hody's chest. After the attack, Hody was sent flying towards Noah and crashed there. After getting up and seeing Luffy coming towards him, he eats more pills and prepares to attack Luffy. He uses a new attack called Murasame, but he fails as Luffy dodges his attack. Luffy then counterattacks using Elephant Gun and finally defeats Hody Jones. After Hody had been dealt with, Luffy starts destroying Noah. As he barrages the ship with his attacks, the wound he received from Hody starts opening up, much to Shidahoshi's horror. Luffy wrecks the ship piece by piece until Shidahoshi suddenly yells at Luffy to stop. Luffy then sees that the ship has been stopped by the Sea Kings. With the Sea King's help, Luffy no longer needs to destroy Noah. As Luffy faints from his wound, he is glad that everyone's safe. Luffy loses a lot of blood from the battle. Shidahoshi carries Luffy back to the plaza. Chopper requests a blood donor, but the citizens are reluctant to help. Jinbei volunteers to be Luffy's donor. During the transfusion, Luffy regains consciousness and asks Jinbei to join the crew. Not wanting to be thanked as heroes, Luffy and the others quickly leave the plaza. Jinbei declines Luffy's offer of joining his straw hats. Jinbei states that while he's grateful for the offer, he states that he still has unfinished business to attend to, but once that's all done, and if he still wants him to join, Jinbei will gladly join and Luffy agrees. One of Neptune's guards catches up with the crew, and through a Denden Mushi, Neptune invites the crew to a banquet. Luffy gladly accepts and went to get Hachi and Kami first. They all arrive at the palace and have a huge party in honor of their victory. 
After partying for a while, Jinbei talks to Luffy and his present crew members about some important information. Jinbei brings them up to speed about what happened during the two years they were all away. He informs them about a dispute between Aokiji and Akainu over the position of Fleet Admiral. Akainu won the position and Aokiji stepped down rather than serving under Akainu. Jinbei then explains about the Blackbeard Pirates' rise to power, with Blackbeard becoming an emperor. He also warns them that the Blackbeard Pirates are stealing the abilities of powerful Devil Fruit users for themselves. But Luffy ignores him and states that he works better without making plans. Luffy then senses something wrong and goes to check on Shirahoshi with Zoro and Sanji and finds Caribou trying to abduct her. Luffy saves Shirahoshi by sending Caribou flying out of the palace. When Nami finds out that Caribou has treasures in him, she sends Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji to capture him and get the treasures for her. The trio then find an unconscious Caribou and collect all the stolen treasures. On their way back to the palace, they spot a crowd in front of the candy factory. Luffy then casually tells Big Bomb's messengers that he ate all the candy. One of the messengers, Pecoms, then wonders what candy Luffy's talking about. However, his crewmate, Baron Tamago, interferes, asking if Luffy really ate the candy. Luffy says that he did, and Tamago explains that Fishman Island is under the protection of Big Mom, and the island will be destroyed if the monthly offer of candies will not be done. The Denden Den Mushi rings, and Pickum says that it's Big Mom calling. Luffy picks it up and shouts, telling her that he's going to be the Pirate King and that he ate all the candies of Fishman Island. Big Mom doesn't believe him at first, saying that he's only covering up for Fishman Island. Luffy strongly insists that he did and offers treasures to the Emperor. Tamago then suggests Big Mom to accept the money. Because of the fact that the Kid Pirates sank two of their ships, Big Mom shouts at him, saying that she has decided to target Luffy in place of Fishman Island. Luffy challenges her saying that he'll defeat her and make Fishman Island his territory. Even though Luffy infuriates Big Mom, he still hands over the treasures to Tamago and Pecoms. The monster trio then return to Ryugu Palace and explain the situation to everyone there. The three then receive a beating from Nami for giving away the treasures. Later, when the Straw Hats are departing Fishman Island, Shirahoshi tearfully wishes for Luffy to stay longer, which causes Luffy to scold her for crying so much, and she apologizes. As the Straw Hats leave, Shirahoshi swears to Luffy that she'll stop being a crybaby. Luffy then makes a pinky promise with her that if they meet again, he will take her to the surface. After sailing away from the island, Luffy looks forward to seeing Shanks again. As they travel to the New World, the crew decides to catch some sea monsters to eat. As they try to catch some, they get caught in a white storm and are sucked in, but stopped by a group of whales that resemble Laboon. After Brooke sings Bink's sake to pleasure him, they help take them to the New World's surface, and Luffy says the weather is perfect after everyone else commented on the weather already. Punk Hazard Arc Soon, the crew spot an island surrounded by a sea of flames. Luffy was excited to go there, even though it seemed dangerous to approach the island. The crew then heard a Denden Mushi ringing, and Luffy answered it, ignoring Robin's warnings that it could be a trap set up by the Marines. Luffy then received a call from someone who seemed to be in trouble and supposedly resided on Punk Hazard. Luffy then decided to rescue the mysterious person. After Nami created Road of Clouds, Luffy went to the castle with Zoro, Usopp, and Robin. When they go there, they explored and found a massive skull that they determined to be larger than a giant's. Suddenly, they encountered a massive dragon. As Luffy and his companions were surprised, the dragon supposedly asked who they were. The group engaged the dragon in battle. While fighting the dragon, Luffy discovered that a pair of legs attached on top of the dragon was the source of the talking. Eventually, with a combined effort from Usopp and Luffy, Zoro managed to cleave off the dragon's head. Luffy then pulled the pair of legs off the dragon's head, and the group was shocked that it didn't have an upper body. The pair of legs then took off in pursuit of a Shichibukai, while Luffy excitedly asked the legs to join his crew. After the group cut up and ate the dragon meat and took the rest with them, they continued their expedition. Luffy decided to play with the legs, placing them on his back and pretending to be a centaur, even though the legs kept flipping him over. Zoro then drew the group's attention to a remarkable sight, a lake separating the flaming half of the island from a frozen, mountainous region on the other half. Usopp then saw a humanoid figure with wings. While Zoro, Usopp, and Robin received a call from Brook, Luffy met a centaur whom Luffy then fought and defeated. A second centaur appeared and attacked Luffy, but Robin subdued it. The group then decided to go to the frozen side of the island. To cross the lake, Usopp formed a boat from Prop Greens. As Luffy's group rode on the boat, the centaur that Luffy had just fought jumped after them and informed his boss that the pirates were heading his way. The four straw hats then saw a group of centaurs waiting for them on the other side. The centaurs fired their bazookas at the water around the boat, capsizing it and leaving Usopp and Zoro to keep Luffy and Robin afloat. Zoro moved to attack the centaurs, but was instead dragged underwater by sharks. The centaurs prepared to attack the Straw Hats again, but they were stopped by Brook, giving Luffy, Zoro, Robin, and Usopp enough time to escape the lake. After emerging from the freezing water, the four Straw Hats planned on stealing coats from the centaurs. 
After defeating them and stealing their coats, the group used Brownbeard as transportation to Vegapunk's former research facility. They soon arrived at the scene where Trafalgar Law and Smoker just fought. Seeing Law, Luffy reacted in surprise and enjoyment. Luffy quickly thanked him for his help two years ago and asked him where the talking bear was. Law simply stated that they are both pirates, reminding Luffy that they are rivals, and then told Luffy to head to the backside of the facility. Right after Law went back into the building, Luffy's group quickly left the scene to get away from the Marines. The group then met up with the remaining crew members. While taking shelter in the laboratory ruin, Luffy was saddened that he had to give back his extra legs to the samurai from Wano and was surprised to learn that Law had become a Shichibukai. The Straw Hats then tied up Brownbeard and brought each other up to speed on the current situation. After interrogating Brownbeard, they learned about a man known as Caesar Clown. Kinemon later left the group to find his torso and Sanji, Brook, and Zoro went out to find him. Before long, several of the giant children started to feel pain, saying that they needed candy usually given to them in order to make the pain go away. However, Chopper stated that the candy contains a drug to which the children had become addicted, and Luffy's group learned that the children had been experimented on. One of the giant children then hit Luffy, and the others went on a rampage, forcing Usopp to put them to sleep. Luffy's group decided to help the children and find Caesar Clown. They then tied up the giant children so that they couldn't destroy anything else. Luffy, Usopp, Frankie, and Robin then left Chopper and Nami to watch the children while they headed to Caesar's lab. While they were gone, Luffy's group heard an explosion coming from the hideout, and Luffy detected the presence of two animals. They quickly turned back to help Nami and Chopper. When they returned, the Yeti Cool Brothers opened fire on Luffy and then disappeared when Luffy tried to attack. It was then revealed that Nami, in Frankie's body, had been captured. Luffy then saw Brownbeard had been shot by the brothers and Luffy's group realized that Caesar was warped enough to turn on his own loyal subordinates. Luffy and Frankie, in Chopper's body, decided to go after the Yeti Cool Brothers to rescue Nami. Frankie took a rumble ball from Chopper and immediately used it, ignoring Chopper's advice on how to use it. Frankie transformed into Monster Point and went on a rampage while chasing after Luffy. Luffy and Frankie followed the giant footsteps and fell into an ambush by Scotch and Rock. They first tried to skewer Luffy with Ice Gold Pincushion. Luffy easily destroyed the trap unharmed with a hockey-enhanced Gomu Gomu no Gatling gun. Rock then fired some shots at Luffy. Luffy countered with Gomu Gomu no Thank You Fire, deflecting the bullets right back at Rock, dealing some damage to him. Scotch then fired a shot at a mountaintop, causing a giant ice shard to start falling towards Luffy and Frankie. Rock prepared to attack again, but Frankie grabbed the shard and knocked out Rock with it. Once Frankie tried to attack Luffy again, Luffy knocked him out with an elephant gun. Scotch then grabbed Nami and attempted to make a run for it, with Luffy chasing after him. Luffy arrived and cut Scotch in half. Scotch tried to retaliate against Law, only to be knocked out by Law's countershock. As Luffy broke Nami's chains, Law proposed to Luffy to form an alliance in order to take down one of the four emperors. Luffy accepts the offer, much to Nami's protests. Luffy, Frankie, Nami, and Law then return to the hideout. The rest of the Straw Hats are surprised that Luffy actually formed an alliance with Law. Law returns Frankie and Chopper to their bodies, while putting Nami in Sanji's body. Chopper scolds Luffy and Frankie for causing damage to his body. The Straw Hats and Law then form a plan to capture Caesar while helping the children. Luffy is later seen flying with Frankie and Robin towards Caesar's lab. After crashing through a marine warship, he prepares with the others to kidnap Caesar Clown. Tashiki, in Smoker's body, then confronts Luffy, but Luffy easily pins her down. Smoker, in Tashiki's body, steps in and fights Luffy himself. After learning that Smoker is not in his own body, Luffy laughs and tells him that they will fight again. After Frankie blasts the door, Luffy and his group prepare to storm the facility. Before they enter, pieces of poisonous slime start falling from the sky. Caesar then appears outside of the facility and starts explaining about the slime creature, but is interrupted when Luffy grabs onto him. Luffy and Caesar subsequently engage into battle. Caesar uses gas robe on Luffy and he inhales all of Caesar's poisonous gas. Luffy then expels the gas through his ears, much to the surprise of Caesar's subordinates. Luffy laughs at Caesar by saying that his poison doesn't work on him much thanks to the immunity he gained from his battle with Magellan. He attacks Caesar again, and just when he's about to land another blow to Caesar, Caesar attacks Luffy with gas tank, and Luffy gets caught in the explosion. After that, Luffy was trapped by slime and was later dealt with another gas tank. Luffy evades the attacks and proceeds to deal a final blow to Caesar, momentarily defeating him. Before Luffy's group can complete their capture of Caesar, Luffy suddenly faints. As Robin and Frankie wonder what happened to Luffy, Caesar laughs and says that Luffy underestimated him. Luffy is then seen lying unconscious alongside Robin, Frankie, Smoker, and Tashiki, who were all knocked out by Caesar. 
He is then locked in the research facility with Robin, Frankie, Smoker, Tashigi, and Law. When Vergo reveals himself to be working with Joker, Luffy asks Law who Joker is. Law tells him that Joker is Don Quixote Don Flamingo. While Clown is giving out his broadcast to the underworld brokers about his experiment with his chemical mass destruction weapon, Luffy and the other captives are just sitting passively in their cell. After Vergo is seen with Law's heart and inflicts pain on Law by using his heart, Luffy is surprised Law can still survive without his heart. After Smiley explodes and spreads a poisonous cloud, out, the prisoners witness the destructive effects of the gas as some of Caesar's subordinates succumb to it. Luffy then sees Sanji, Zoro, Kinemon, and Brook all running away from the gas cloud. He then yells that they have to run and can't die, but is weakened by the sea stone stone. Caesar Clown proceeds to move the captives outside of the facility to die. Luffy then asks how Law plans to escape, watching as the Warlord begins his escape plan. Law directs Frankie to launch his Frankie fireball at the segregated battleship down below. The wood is set alight, and the smoke from the burning wreck then rises up to the cage, allowing them to discreetly take action. Law quickly reveals that he had replaced some of the sea stone handcuffs with the regular ones, allowing him to escape easily, and goes on to free Luffy and the others. Using Law's devil fruit powers, they're then moved into the laboratory where they open the shutters, allowing everyone outside to escape the poison gas. Seeing the remaining members of his crew arrive, Luffy gleefully claims the battle has really begun. When his crew are confronted by the G5 Marines, Luffy asks if the fight has started. Law interrupts the Marines and tells them of a way off the island, but they'll have two hours to escape. When Luffy asks him what will happen, Law replies that he will do something dangerous. When the group splits up, Luffy decides to go after Caesar Clown once again. After Zoro hears about Luffy's earlier defeat at the hands of Caesar, he yells at Luffy telling him not to be careless and reminds him that they're in the new world. Luffy agrees and proceeds to attack a group of Caesar's subordinates standing in his way. He later defeats Run the Machete with one strike and continues through the hallway to Passage B. Luffy and Smoker eventually pass through the B building and reach Caesar's location. Before entering the room that Caesar's in, Smoker tells Luffy that Vergo is his enemy. Luffy replies that he'll get to Caesar. Once they see the scientists, Luffy immediately gives him a punch. Luffy and Caesar fight for a while, and just when Luffy is about to get the upper hand, Monet steps in and interrupts him. She makes a barrier over Caesar, which Luffy breaks with Jet Gatling. Monet lets Caesar escape and tells Luffy that if anything bad happens to him, Doflamingo will kill her. Luffy then asks what Doflamingo is, instead of asking who he is. Monet, however, simply locks him in a ten-layered snow hut and begins to weaken him with her powers. Luffy, however, simply blasts through the floor with a jet spear and falls into the basement. However, Monet tells him that unless he can fly, there's no way out of the basement. While exploring the garbage dump inside the basement, Luffy encounters yet another dragon and asks who it is. Surprisingly, the dragon replies back, asking the same question. The dragon then introduces himself as Momonosuke. However, Luffy thinks it's an eel and is surprised that it can talk. After Momonosuke points out he's not edible, Luffy introduces himself as the man who's going to become the Pirate King. Momonosuke doesn't believe him and starts telling Luffy about his perception of pirates, but Luffy interrupts him. Momonosuke then explains his backstory, which includes him being taken to Punk Hazard, going to the secret room, and eating a devil fruit, which transformed him into a dragon. Luffy tells Momonosuke that he should just turn back into a human, but Momonosuke doesn't yet know how. Momonosuke then continues his story, where he overheard Caesar telling Monet that the children will die in five years, and that he'll get new ones then. He then finishes his story by telling Luffy about how he ended up in the garbage dump. Luffy becomes angry after learning how horrible Caesar is, and he tells Momonosuke to hold on to him as he plans on climbing the wall to get out and rescue the children. Momonosuke then has an hallucination of Doflamingo's face and flies out of the basement with Luffy hanging on to him. They later escape the garbage dump through a dustbin. Luffy then confronts three of Caesar Clown's underlings, demanding Caesar's location. The frightened underlings immediately tell him that Caesar is in Building R, straight along the corridor. Luffy then arrives at Building R just in time to save Brownbeard by knocking away Caesar with a hockey imbued Gear 3 attack. As Luffy prepares for a third confrontation, Caesar taunts him, telling Luffy that he'll be in danger from both Doflamingo and an Emperor if he attacks him. Luffy then punches Caesar in the face, saying that he has been dealing with people like that since he entered the Grand Line. Caesar then warns Luffy again about the kind of people he's dealing with and attempts to retaliate with a gas burner attack. Luffy dodges and punches Caesar in the face again. Caesar then forces his men in the control room to open the air vents, allowing his gaseous weapon to flow in. Caesar absorbs his weapon and grows bigger. He then kills more of his subordinates, angering Luffy further. Luffy asks Momonosuke to look after Brownbeard and then runs into a hallway to get some distance away from Caesar. Luffy enters Gear 3 and charges at Caesar, angrily shouting that he doesn't want to see his face anymore. He attacks Caesar with Grizzly Magnum, not only sending him through the gate to the escape passage, but also setting him flying outside of the lab. With Caesar out of the way, Luffy is then reunited with his crew and the kidnapped children. Luffy meets Law and Smoke 
Smoker again in the corridor between Building R and D. When Luffy tells Law that he sent Caesar flying, Law scolds him for not following the plan of capturing him. Chopper, Brook, Kinemon, Mocha, and some of the G5 Marines still have not arrived at Building R. Luffy waits patiently for them, despite Law's urges to escape as soon as possible. Fortunately, the remaining group arrives safely before the gate to Building R seals off. Everyone boards the rail car and goes through the escape package. While going through the escape package, Luffy helps defend the cart from the falling rubble. When they finally reach the outside, they find Frankie in his Frankie Shogun after he was just fighting against Buffalo and Baby Five. As the pair attempt to flee with Caesar, Law prepares to stop them himself, but Usopp and Nami insisted to handle them themselves. Luffy encourages Law to give his crew a chance. After the defeat of Buffalo and Baby Five and the successful capture of Caesar, Luffy smiles as Law declares the first stage of his plan complete. During the aftermath, Luffy had a friendly chat with Brownbeard, who decided to turn himself into the Marines. Luffy was then surprised to see Kinemon breaking to pieces and then reforming to his normal state. Luffy was also surprised to see Momonosuke return to his human form. Sanji made food for the father and son, and Luffy was excited to see such delicious food. He tried to convince Momonosuke to eat, but the boy was hesitant at first. Momonosuke and Kinemon eventually ate together, and everyone gathered, drooling at the food. Law warned Luffy that it cannot get out of hand, and that they'll have to leave as soon as possible. And Luffy agreed, but moments later, he declares the party started. Luffy enjoys the food with his crew and new friends, as Tashigi and her men took the children away from Punk Hazard. Luffy left with his crew, Law, Kinemon, and Momonosuke. They were later seen on a sea slope. After Nami informed him that their next destination was Dress Rosa, Luffy told everyone to gather around so he and Law could explain their next plan. Luffy and everyone listened as Law explained about Doflamingo's connection to the underworld and the plan to decimate Kaido's forces. Luffy then asked Kinemon if he has something to do on Dress Rosa. The samurai replied that he has a comrade being held prisoner there. The next morning, everyone read the news explaining Doflamingo's resignation from the Shichibukai. They also saw the paper mentioning Luffy and Law's alliance, as well as the alliance between Kid, Hawkins, and Apu. Law told Luffy to disregard the other pirate alliance and only focus on their plan. Dress Rosa Arc Law contacted Doflamingo to discuss the next part of the negotiation. Luffy suddenly interrupted the call and angrily asked Doflamingo if he is the boss of Caesar. Doflamingo stated his desire to see Luffy and informed the Straw Hat captain that he has something that he would want to get, which Luffy thought was meat, because that's how Luffy thinks. Luffy was then put into a trance until Usopp snapped him out of it. After Law told Doflamingo that he will bring Caesar to Greenbit, he and the Straw Hat planned on how to destroy the Smile Factory on Dress Rosa. Luffy then got more excited to see Dress Rosa and the crew have a big meal. While eating, Luffy heard Law and Kinemon talking about a place called Zo. Luffy then listened to Kinemon and Momonosuke's story about how they were shipwrecked and drifted to Dress Rosa, as well as how Momonosuke was separated from his father. After hearing about how Kanjuro helped Kinemon escape, Luffy excitedly declared that they should save him too. The Thousand Sunnies soon approached Dress Rosa. After disembarking, the group began their next phase of their operation. Luffy thought about using Momonosuke in his dragon form to fly. However, Momonosuke refused to do so. When Luffy asked him if he was afraid of heights, they got into a small fight until Kinemon broke them up. The group split into three teams and Luffy went into Dress Rosa with Zoro, Sanji, Frankie, and Kinemon to destroy the factory and rescue Kanjuro. While exploring, they saw things that the country is famous for, including living toys. After getting disguises, they stopped at a restaurant to get something to eat. There, they found some thugs taking advantage of a blind man while taking away his money in roulette. The man then demonstrated his gravity-like ability when the thugs attacked Luffy for calling their bluff. As the man left, Luffy asked who he was, only for the man to say it was better for both of them if he didn't know. After one of Zoro's swords is stolen, he chased after the thief with Sanji and Kinemon in tow. Luffy attempted to follow them for fun, but was stopped by Frankie. Instead, they interrogated one of the thugs, who happened to be a subordinate of Doflamingo, for the location of the Smiles Factory. The thug claimed that he didn't know anything about it. He then said that most of Doflamingo's crew members were at the Colosseum, where there was a tournament being held for a big prize. At first, Luffy thought it was meat, because that's how Luffy thinks, thinking back to his conversation with Doflamingo, only for the thug to inform them that the prize was actually Ace's former devil fruit. Luffy decided to compete for the fruit, not wanting just anyone to eat it. He offered the fruit to Frankie, but he declined, not wanting to lose his ability to swim. Even though the initial objectives were to find the factory and Kanjuro, Frankly felt Luffy deserved the chance to fight for the fruit. Luffy and Frankie later arrived at Corridor Coliseum, where they met a one-legged toy soldier called Thunder Soldier. While Frankie told Luffy that he could go full out in the tournament, it was best to keep his identity secret. He nearly gave himself away when he almost signed his own name, but thanks to Frankie stopping him, he ended up signing in as a Lucy. He was then taken to the waiting room where he met all the contestants. One of them called Spartan attacked Luffy, thinking he was a weakling. 
Much to the other contestants' surprise, Luffy easily defeated Spartan. One of the staff members from the Coliseum was about to disqualify Luffy. Luckily, Sai and Boo from the Chinjao family stepped in and spoke on Luffy's behalf, saying that Spartan was the one who started the fight. After thanking the Chinjao family for saving him from disqualification, Luffy learned that he'd been assigned to Block C. Once he was inside the battle preparation room, Luffy got excited seeing all the armor and decided to put some on to make himself look cooler. While learning about the Coliseum's weight restriction on protective gear, Luffy was greeted by Cavendish, captain of the beautiful pirates. Luffy accidentally told him his own name, but the other contestants thought he was mispronouncing his alias, Lucy. Cavendish then proceeded to tell Luffy his backstory, such as how he came to resent the 11 supernovas, but Luffy ignored him during the middle of the conversation. He then sees a bronze statue of a man named Kairos. While admiring the statue, he met a female gladiator named Rebecca, who told him the story of Kairos. Luffy then sees that Rebecca was determined to win the Mara Mara no Mi to defeat Doflamingo. After Luffy and Rebecca finished their conversation, the winner of Block A was announced, and Luffy was shocked to see that it was Jesus Burgess. Before Block B began, Luffy took a look at the warriors defeated by Burgess. He was then approached by Bellamy, who told him that he also visited Skypiea. Bellamy said that his reason for joining the tournament was a chance to join Doflamingo's crew. He went on saying that he has no grunge against Luffy, and that he wouldn't laugh at him again. Luffy then watched Block B with Cavendish. As the fights in Block B went on, Xinjiao approached Luffy and asked him about Garp, revealing Luffy's identity to Cavendish in the process. Luffy kept denying his true identity, but Cavendish drew his sword, preparing to attack Luffy anyway. However, Xinjiao made the first move, striking at Luffy with a headbutt. Right after Luffy dodged the attack, Cavendish tried to force Luffy to take off his fake beard. Jinjiao then launched another attack, but Cavendish wards off the second headbutt with his sword. Jinjiao continuously assaulted both Luffy and Cavendish with his headbutts until Luffy punched him into the ground. When Jinjiao became very furious, Boo and Sai came to stop him. While the two managed to calm down Jinjiao, Luffy hit himself by hanging from a windowsill. Luffy continued to watch the match and witnessed Bartolomeo deflecting Hack's attack, which also damaged Hack's hand as well. As he continued to watch the battle in the arena, he was wondering how Bartolomeo was able to damage Hack like that. He then witnessed that even Bellamy couldn't stand up against Bartolomeo's strange power. He then cheered Bellamy on, urging him to give it his all. After that, King Elizabello finally threw his legendary King Punch, which took out all the remaining gladiators in the arena. Even Luffy said that it was an incredible punch and that he had never seen anything like it. Before the king was declared the winner of B-Block's Battle Royale, Bartolomeo emerged unharmed and revealed that he had eaten the Bari Bari no Mi and had created a barrier to protect himself. He then took out the king and was declared the winner of Block B, much to Luffy's surprise. As an injured Bellamy was moved out of the ring, he and Luffy had another friendly chat and commented how the other had changed. Meanwhile, Bartolomeo overheard Bellamy calling him Straw Hat. When Block C started, Luffy entered the ring before Cavendish could confront him. When the gong was heard, Luffy was excited to start fighting. As the battle royale went on, Luffy was seen defeating an opponent effortlessly. Sometime during the battle royale, Luffy tamed and befriended the fighting bull, naming him Ushi. Luffy rode on top of him as he rampaged around the ring. The bull was eventually stopped and crushed by Hyroden. Luffy then avenged Ushi by eliminating Hyroden from the competition with a knockout punch. Afterwards, Luffy removed Ushi from the fighting area by carrying him over his shoulder. When he was finished, Luffy entered the fight again only to have his helmet stolen by Jean Ango, who heard a rumor that he was Straw Hat Luffy forcing him to use his cape to hide his identity. Jean Ango then threw multiple weapons at him, which Luffy was able to dodge with ease. The weapons aimed at Luffy hit Chinjao instead. Luffy then took back his helmet before Chinjao knocked the bounty hunter out of the ring. Seeing that Chinjao was hell-bent on taking his grudge out on him, Luffy decided to fight him head on. Before clashing with Chinjao, he knocked out Sai while Chinjao knocked out Ideo. As the two remaining fighters in the battle royale, Luffy and Chinjao clashed their fists against each other, causing a large wave of Haushoku Haki to burst throughout the arena. After Luffy declared his goal of becoming the Pirate King, Chinjao asked him who taught him Haki, and Luffy answered that it was Rayleigh. Chinjao then burst into tears, mentioning about a treasure he was not able to acquire. Luffy told Chinjao to stick to either crying or getting angry, and then continued his clash with him. After taking some punches from Chinjao, Luffy struck back with a powerful attack of his own, hitting him in the chest with his Gomu Gomu no Hawk rifle. After recovering, Chinjao began mocking Luffy, telling him that those known as the worst generation are greenhorns, who don't know anything of the world, and saying that his attempts to surpass Roger are laughable. He then enraged Luffy by saying executing Ace was a smart move by the Marines. Luffy then proceeded to launch himself in the air with Gomu Gomu no Rocket, using Chinjao as leverage. He then activated Gear 3 and launched his Gomu Gomu no Thor elephant gun, while Chinjao took the attack head-on with a headbutt. The two collided, seemingly matched up, until Luffy managed to gain the upper hand, which coincidentally restored Chinjao's head to the shape it was before his final battle with Garp. Chinjao was then knocked out and fell down to the arena. 
splitting it in half with his newly reformed head. Jin Zhao then sank into the water unconscious, and Luffy officially won Block C. Luffy stood victorious as the audience cheered for him. After Luffy left the arena, Cavendish thrust his sword at him, but he caught the sword effortlessly and held onto it tightly. Jin Zhao arrived, wanting to thank Luffy for restoring his head, but accidentally broke the floor when trying to bow in respect. Luffy ran away from both Cavendish and Jin Zhao and was saved by Rebecca. He then ran into Burgess, who was communicating with Blackbeard through Den Den Mushi. Luffy declared that he will not allow Ace's power to fall into Blackbeard's hands. At the gladiator's quarters, Rebecca brought him some food and sat next to him. Some gladiators behind prison bars caught Luffy and after some hesitation, she tried to kill him with her sword. Luffy dodged the attack and pinned her down. Rebecca asked him why he didn't seek retribution. Luffy answered that he wouldn't do anything to someone who bought him food. Rebecca then proceeded to tell him about the convict gladiators and how they were imprisoned in the Colosseum for opposing Doflamingo. She said that she wanted to win the Mara Mara no Mi in order to be able to protect herself and not have to rely on the Thunder Soldier, who was planning an attack against Doflamingo. Rebecca then explained to Luffy about how the toys are no different from humans, how her mother died and Thunder Soldier was her guardian after her mother's death, which is why he's so important to her. The conversation was interrupted by Gats, announcing that the ring is prepared and Block D is about to commence. When Rebecca entered the arena, the audience booed and jeered at her. Luffy angrily wondered why, and one of the convict gladiators informed him that Rebecca is the previous king's granddaughter. Having also been wrongly judged by Chin Zhao due to his relationship to Garp, Luffy responded by saying that Rebecca has nothing to do with her grandfather, which the convict gladiators agreed. When Cavendish stood up for Rebecca and stopped the audience's booing and jeering, Luffy commented that while he still disliked Cavendish, he wasn't so bad. As he watched Rebecca's fight during the Block D Battle Royale, he commented that Rebecca can use Kenbon Shoku Haki. He continued to cheer Rebecca on. He later decided to move to a different place to watch the fight. Before leaving, he was told by the convict gladiators about the country's dark side that the public knew nothing about. As he exited the gladiators' quarters, he encountered Bartolomeo. Bartolomeo guided Luffy to Zoro and Kinemon, with the former being annoyed at the fact that he was not invited to fight in the Colosseum. He then informs Luffy that the Colosseum is surrounded by Marines, who quickly dismisses the fact besides Kinemon's shock. They then engage in a conference call with Sanji and Frankie's group. Everyone is then brought up to speed on the current situation as they learn about the true situation on Dress Rosa. When Frankie pleads to Luffy to allow him to help the dwarves and toys, Luffy quickly gave his permission to assist with the revolution. Just as the call ends, a battle between Law and Doflamingo, which raged across Dress Rosa, abruptly ended right outside of the Coliseum with Doflamingo standing above his opponent. Luffy cried out to Law in horror as Doflamingo shot him three times at close range. Luffy then angrily yelled at Doflamingo, who responded by saying that it was his duty to discipline Law. Zoro and Kinemon rush to save Law, Zoro was intercepted by Isho, the blind man they encountered earlier, and Kinemon was kicked away by Doflamingo before he could retrieve Law. Luffy tried to help his friends but realized that the bars in the windows of the Colosseum are made of sea stone. The entire crew was shocked to be told by Kinemon that the blind gambler was actually an admiral. Both Doflamingo and Isha float above their opponents using their abilities, taking Law with them and heading towards the palace. After the Marines started pursuing Zoro and Kinemon, Zoro told Luffy to find the exit. As Luffy informed the two swordsmen that Law is still alive, they heard that the Sunny is under attack by the Big Mom Pirates, who are after Caesar Clown. During the commotion, Nami told Luffy that Law tried so hard to keep Caesar and Momonosuke away from Doflamingo and can't allow them to fall into his hands. Luffy gave Sanji's group permission to head for Zo and also allow Sanji to counterattack against the Big Mom pirates. While leaving Frankie's group in charge of destroying the Smile Factory, Luffy decided to head to the palace with Zoro and Kinemon to rescue Law and fight Doflamingo. While looking for an exit out of the Coliseum, he found Bartolomeo carrying a wounded Bellamy. Luffy said that he was leaving the tournament since rescuing his friend comes first. Bartolomeo proudly declared that he will get the Mera Mera no Mi for him, but someone interrupted them and declared that the fruit could not be given to Luffy. Luffy then talked to this person and recognized him as his older brother Salbo, whom he believed to be dead. Luffy began crying in happiness and disbelief and embraced his brother. Salbo was glad that Luffy was alive and Luffy gave him permission to eat the Mera Mera no Mi at his request. Before leaving, Luffy gave Sabo his gladiator costume so he could take his place in the tournament. Luffy later escaped the Coliseum and met up with Zoro and Kinemon. The trio wore disguises to elude the Marines. As they ran away from the Coliseum, Luffy was still crying over the revelation that his brother was alive. Luffy, Zoro, and Kinemon later arrived at the lift that leads to the royal palace alongside the dwarf, Wicca. There, they encountered Viola, who offered to guide them to the palace. After getting acquainted with her and learning about her ties with the Riku family, Luffy's group was then led to a secret passage. Once inside the passage, Zoro suggested that they use a basket used for lifting supplies and that Luffy should climb up carrying a rock and hang from the chain to act as a counterweight for the basket to move up. Luffy gladly accepted the suggestion. 
They later arrived at the palace rampart tower. Viola was about to sneak them in, but Luffy went ahead and smashed his way through the gate, much to her chagrin. After Luffy took off his disguise, the group charged in. Once Luffy, Zoro, and Viola reached the Rampart Tower B1, they were intercepted by Pika. After Viola explained about Pika's Devil Fruit ability, Pika attempted to crush Luffy and his group with the palace walls. They managed to avoid it, and Zoro held off Pika while Luffy and Viola rushed on ahead, though they were hampered by Pika's power to create dead ends. They eventually ran into Thunder Soldier as he was about to be destroyed by Gladius. Luffy knocked away Gladius with a jet stamp. Luffy was about to continue the fight with the officer, but Viola pulled him away, stating that Gladius was too dangerous. Gladius attacked the group, managing to wound Viola, which forced Luffy to carry her. Seeing no stairs to advance further up, Luffy jumped out a window and used his leg to stretch to the second floor conveniently outside the room of suits. As they overheard Doflamingo trying to get Law to tell him what the Straw Hat's plan was, Luffy asked if he can attack Doflamingo, only to be denied and told to wait by Viola. They later saw Gladius and his men approaching the second floor. Thunder Soldier also spoke to Luffy about his realization that he and his crew were pirates, but also commented that he was reassuring that they share the same goal. After Thunder Soldier transformed back into a human, Viola revealed to Luffy about Kairos and everything that happened in Dressrosa. After Kairos decapitated Doflamingo, Luffy grabbed Viola and charged in to save Luffy. While rushing to Law, Viola gave Luffy the keys to Law's cuffs. Law told Luffy that their alliance already ended, but Luffy ignored him. His rescue of Law was interrupted by Pika's sudden appearance. Luffy was then surprised to see Doflamingo still alive. It was then revealed that the Doflamingo that was decapitated was only a copy. As Kairos attempted to attack the copy again, the real Doflamingo appeared behind Kairos and attempted to behead him with a kick, slicing the palace in the process. Luffy managed to save Kairos from a fatal blow. Doflamingo and his copy then tried to attack both Luffy and Kairos, but they jumped out of the way. Luffy retaliated by using Jet Gatling, but Doflamingo blocked the attack. His copy then struck Luffy from behind, and he followed by giving Luffy a punch in the face, knocking him back. Pika then threw Luffy, Law, Kairos, Viola, and Riku Duel III out of the palace. They watched as Doflamingo initiated his birdcage plan, trapping everyone on Dressrosa. After Pika relocated the royal palace at the top of the Flower Hill, Doflamingo forced everyone imprisoned into a survival game and put a price on the heads of 12 people. Luffy and his crew were included in Doflamingo's hit list. After reuniting with Zoro, Luffy spoke to Rebecca through Den Den Mushi and informed her that the toy soldier was her father. He told her not to cry and stay close to Usopp, Robin, and Sabo. After declaring that he'll defeat Doflamingo and end his game, Luffy grabbed Zoro and Law and pursued Doflamingo. Luffy jumped down from the King's Plateau and they landed in the middle of a crowd of enemies. After a brief scuffle with Senor Pink, Mach Vice, and Dellinger, the Dressrosa citizens started attacking Luffy and his group. Luffy was about to use Haki, but Isho arrived to confront them. Pika then appeared as a massive stone giant looking for Doflamingo's enemies. Luffy laughed at his voice, making him angry. Pika then threw a punch, which sent Luffy, Zoro, and Law flying to the square in front of the Coliseum. They were soon approached by Cavendish, who explained that he had seized his grudge against Luffy. Cavendish offered to defeat Doflamingo for Luffy, but the Straw Hat Captain was adamant about defeating Doflamingo himself. They were then joined by those who also wished to fight Doflamingo. The Chinjao family, Haruden, Elizabella II, Dagama, Abdullah, Jeet, Orlumbus, Ideo, Suleiman, and Blue Gilly. After the allied Coliseum fighters fought off the former toys who were after Doflamingo's prize money, Luffy was reunited with Ushi. Luffy and his allies then marched towards the royal palace and began to battle against Pika. When Pika attempted to strike Luffy and his allies, Chinjao and Elizabello shattered Pika's stone hand, and enabling Luffy to move forward. Pika then attacked with his other arm, causing Luffy's allies to fall back. However, Luffy, Zoro, Law, Abdullah, Jeet, and Ushi jumped on and climbed on Pika's arm. Pika regrew the arm that was shattered and prepared to attack Luffy again. Luffy responded by shattering shattering Pika's stone head with Grizzly Magnum. Zoro discovered Pika's real body, which appeared in front of Luffy's group. Pika took out his sword and tried to attack the group riding on Ushi, but Luffy carried the bull and evaded the sword strike. Zoro intercepted Pika when he attempted to strike Luffy again. As Ushi ran on the stone giant's back, Law revealed to Luffy that the plan to defeat Kaido was a trick to get revenge on Doflamingo for killing Corazon, a former executive officer of the Don Quixote family, Doflamingo's brother, and Law's benefactor. Luffy, Law, Ushi, Abdullah, and Jeet eventually reached the first level of the New King's Plateau. While charging, Luffy repelled the Don Quixote pirate's troops standing in the way. After Luffy saw that the other Coliseum fighters went ahead of them, Kelly Funk, while fused with Bobby Funk, appeared seemingly to aid them. Law asked Luffy what to do about his sea stone handcuffs, but Luffy assured him that things will work out. Kelly then showed them a tunnel that was supposed to go directly to the fourth level. While entering the tunnel, Luffy and Law were shocked to see Abdullah and Jeet fall off. 
After leaving those two behind, Luffy and Law were contacted by Robin through Den Den Mushi. Robin informed them that she will meet them at the fourth level. Luffy, Law, and Ushi later reached a dead end. While the bulls stood on top of a pool of water, a string clone of Doflamingo appeared behind them. The clone attacked Ushi with bullet thread, knocking him unconscious. As the bull collapsed, Law and Luffy fell into the water and became powerless. Before the clone could kill him, Abdullah and Jeet struck the clone from behind, destroying it. After recovering, Luffy punched a hole to the second level with Elephant Gun and carried Law with him as he moved ahead of the allied Colosseum fighters. Cavendish approached Luffy and told him that he has a plan. Luffy and Law then rode on Cavendish's horse. During the fray, Kairos managed to hitch a ride on Farrell as well. Luffy was happy to see him while Cavendish was displeased. Kairos was then shocked when Luffy informed him that Rebecca was heading for the fourth level. Kairos reminded Luffy that Rebecca is on Doflamingo's hit list, but Luffy assured him that one of his crewmates was with her. When the other Colosseum fighters banded together, they created an opening for Luffy, Kairos, and Cavendish to go through. As Ferule charged towards the third level, Luffy continued to repel any Don Quixote pirates' troops along the way. Luffy, Law, Cavendish, and Kairos then briefly argued over who will be the one to defeat Doflamingo. Once they reached the third level, they found giant toy soldiers standing in their way. One of the toy soldiers bit Ferule on the head until Luffy punched it away. With Ferule gravely injured, Luffy and his group prepared to battle the toy army. Just then, Robin, Bartolomeo, and Gladius fell from the sky and landed in front of them. Robin and Bartolomeo held back Gladius and the toys to enable Luffy's group to continue towards the fourth level where Rebecca would be waiting. Bartolomeo used his ability to create a stairway to the fourth level. Luffy thanked him, causing Bartolomeo to shed tears of joy. Kairos went ahead while Cavendish decided to remain on the third level to avenge his horse. As Luffy, while carrying Law, ran up towards the fourth level, Gladius launched Rapture bullets at him. Bartolomeo protected Luffy by jumping into the line of fire. Once Luffy and Law reached the fourth level, Rebecca quickly gave him the keys to Law's handcuffs. After removing the handcuffs, Kairos told Luffy and Law to go ahead while he fights Diamante. Luffy then told Rebecca that he was glad that she could see her father again. Rebecca then asked him if he would really defeat Doflamingo while still calling him Lucy. Luffy answered that his name was not Lucy and told her his real name. Diamante tried to stop Luffy and Law, but Law teleported himself and Luffy to the palace pool garden. They were then approached by Sugar, who intended to turn them into toys. Just as he got close to them, Usopp sniped at her from the Old King's Plateau and made her lose consciousness, saving both Luffy and Law. With Sugar out of the way, Luffy and Law finally reached Doflamingo. After seeing how Doflamingo treated Bellamy like trash, Luffy was enraged. Law warned him not to let his emotions get the better of him. Luffy attacked Doflamingo with his foot, but he used Bellamy as a shield. Doflamingo then created another string clone to fight Law while controlling Bellamy to fight Luffy. Bellamy begged Luffy to stop him, but Luffy refused as he considered Bellamy a friend. Luffy then aimed an attack at Law. Law activated Room and used Shambles to switch places with Doflamingo, allowing Luffy to strike him with Red Hawk. Once Doflamingo recovered from Luffy's attack, he stopped Law from attacking Treble and incapacitated him with Fulbright. He then struck Luffy with a hockey-imbued kick, tied his hands, tied his hands, and then had Bellamy slash him. When both Luffy and Law are down, Doflamingo mentioned to them his past as a world noble. Doflamingo then sent his string clone and a controlled Bellamy to confront Luffy. And though Luffy attacked them with Octopus Gatling, the Doflamingo string clone got him from behind and slammed him through the floor into the palace interior. The Doflamingo clone spoke to Luffy about the cruelty of man, confusing Luffy. Luffy eventually managed to defeat the string clone, sending it flying through the roof with Jet Gatling. He then demanded Doflamingo to release Bellamy. Doflamingo decided to set Bellamy free, and Luffy asked him to rest. He was about to go help Law, but Bellamy got up on his feet and continued on with the fight, refusing to betray his own principles and prepared to assault Luffy with his new and improved spring hopper. Luffy yelled at Bellamy for siding with the man who betrayed him and said it wasn't worth fighting. But Bellamy ignored him and drove into Luffy using Spring Hopper, punching him with a hockey imbued fist and causing Luffy to cough up blood. In spite of Luffy's pleas to not fight, Bellamy refused to back down and Luffy eventually decided to finish their fight, knocking out Bellamy in the same manner as he did at Jaya. Luffy then yelled out Doflamingo's name in anguish. Luffy then returned to the palace rooftops and resumed his battle with Doflamingo. As they clashed, Luffy stumbled upon Law's body, which was covered in blood. When Luffy tried to speak to Law, he was unresponsive and Doflamingo stated that he was dead. Luffy refused to believe Doflamingo, who proceeded to taunt Luffy by mocking Law's last words, stating he claimed that the Straw Hats could create miracles. Luffy screamed out in rage as Doflamingo prepared to end his game. Doflamingo then informed Luffy that his birdcage is shrinking, and in about an hour, it'll destroy everything in Dressrosa. Luffy declared that he'll stop it by defeating Doflamingo. As Luffy charged at his opponent, Law suddenly appeared in front of the ladder and used Gamma Knife to damage Doflamingo's internal organs. Doflamingo grabbed onto Law's face, but Luffy kicked him away with Jet Stand.
Sam. As Doflamingo lied injured at Law's feet, Treble attempted to attack Law, only to be kicked away by Luffy. Law used Countershock on Doflamingo and collapsed from exhaustion. However, Doflamingo stood back up, revealing that he can use his string powers to fix his internal injuries. Doflamingo attempted to stomp on Law's head, but Luffy quickly intervened. Doflamingo and Luffy battled intensely, using Bosushoku and Haushoku Haki. Though Luffy's first attacks were blocked, he managed to exploit an opening and punch Doflamingo repeatedly, ending with Gomu Gomu no Eagle Bazooka. However, Doflamingo evaded the Eagle Bazooka and kicked Luffy using Athlete's Thread, sending Luffy crashing into the ground, right into Treble's trap. Treble held Luffy down so that Doflamingo could finish off Law once and for all. Luffy got mad at the executive and attempted to hit him with a Boshutoku Haki imbued fist. However, the attack had no effect, despite Luffy thinking Treble was a Logia. Law then told Luffy to stop attacking Treble, and Treble left a trap Luffy to go to Law. Luffy witnessed Law wounding Treble and was caught in the explosion Treble created. However, Luffy managed to escape the explosion and carried Law with him. Luffy then threw Law down towards Robin and her group on the flower field, telling them to help Law. Not willing to let Law get away, Doflamingo shot at Robin with Tamaito, despite Luffy kicking him with Gomu Gomu no Hawk Whip. However, Doflamingo's bullet was deflected by Cavendish. Luffy then told him to take Law and the others out of the flower field. Cavendish initially refused, but Luffy told him that he entrusted their lives to him, making Cavendish think that Luffy was his fan. Luffy then resumed his battle against Doflamingo and hit the Shichibukai with Bosushoku Hake imbued fists, sending him flying off the roof. However, Doflamingo laughed it off, saying that Luffy's attacks were quick. He then attacked Luffy with overheat, sending Luffy flying. Doflamingo mentioned to Luffy how he had followed the young pirate's career before kicking Luffy into the palace wall, causing a large chunk of it to fall away. However, Luffy quickly got back up and continued fighting, attacking with Gomu Gomu no Grizzly Magnum. Doflamingo easily avoided his attack and exploited the opening it left, kicking Luffy into the ground. Doflamingo then taunted Luffy about the shrinking birdcage and how it would kill all his friends, all because the Straw Hats stepped foot in Dressrosa. Luffy became enraged at Doflamingo for hurting his friends and prepared to activate Gear 4. Luffy activated Bosushoku Haki in his left arm and blew into it, inflating the muscles and exponentially increasing his arm size. He continued blowing until Bound Man was activated. In this form, Luffy's entire torso became massive and he could only bounce, not stand up, but Luffy revealed that he had subdued beasts with this form. Luffy then sunk his arm into his body and hit Doflamingo with Gomu Gomu no Kong Gun, which sent Doflamingo flying far away into the streets. Luffy then sunk his legs into his body and flew towards Doflamingo. With precision, Luffy speedily maneuvered behind Doflamingo and drop kicked the Shichibukai with Gomu Gomu no Rhino Schneider, sending Doflamingo crashing through several buildings. An enraged Doflamingo then flew up to the sky and Luffy rose to meet him, attacking Doflamingo with Gomu Gomu no Culverin Cannon. However, Doflamingo managed to avoid the attack and kicked Luffy with Athlete. However, Luffy's rubber managed to absorb the blunt attack despite being covered in Bosushoku Haki, and Luffy shook Doflamingo off. Luffy then used Culverin Cannon again, but this time he changed its direction several times to follow Doflamingo, and eventually succeeded in punching Doflamingo in the face. Luffy then flew towards Doflamingo, knowing that Gear 4 was about to end. He attacked Doflamingo with both fists, but Doflamingo countered by summoning strings from the ground. Doflamingo revealed his Devil Fruit Awakening powers to Luffy, shocking the Straw Hat, who wondered if Doflamingo was even a Haramisi anymore. 20 minutes later, Luffy continued battling against Doflamingo's strings as he listened to Riku's speech to the citizens of Dressrosa. Doflamingo turned much of the town into string to attack Luffy, but Luffy evaded the string, pulling his head and arms into his body as he attacked Doflamingo with Gomu Gomu no Leo Bazooka, sending the Shichibukai crashing into the palace mountain. Leo noticed that the birdcage remained active, meaning that Doflamingo would not utterly defeat it. Luffy quickly flew to the palace mountain and attempted to finish Doflamingo off. However, before he could reach him, his Gear 4 wore off and he was completely exhausted. Gats arrived and helped Luffy up and revealed that all the gladiators from the Coliseum were there to aid Luffy. Luffy asked Gats to give him 10 minutes to recover and Gats proceeded to take Luffy to safety. They were then attacked by Burgess, but were then saved when Sabo kicked Burgess away. With Sabo holding Burgess back, Luffy assured him that he will defeat Doflamingo once his hockey recharges. Sabo then entrusts Gats to Luffy's safety. As Gats ran away with Luffy, Law suddenly used room to teleport to their location. With three minutes left for Luffy to recharge, Law took over protecting him. Luffy then lay on the ground near Law as his hockey regenerated. Eventually,
Eventually, Luffy's hockey fully recharged, and with the help of Law and his shambles, Luffy prevented Rebecca from being forced to cut down Viola and confronted Doflamingo once more. Doflamingo attacked both Luffy and Rebecca with his strings, but Law saved Rebecca. So he turned his attention solely to Luffy. Doflamingo then turned an entire portion of the town into string to attack Luffy with a thousand flap thread string arrows. Doflamingo immobilized Luffy and taunted him by saying that all the slaughter could have been avoided had the people of Dress Rosa just accepted their manipulation. This enraged Luffy to the point where he instantly reactivated Gear 4 and broke the strings holding him, taking the remainder of the fight into the skies above. After once again saying Luffy stood no chance against him due to his commoner's blood, Doflamingo attempted to trap him in his spider's net. As Luffy enlarged his right arm and readied his final attack, Doflamingo unleashed 16 god threads in a last ditch effort to kill Luffy. Despite this, Luffy's King Kong gun broke through and slammed him into the ground, destroying several buildings and shattering his trademark sunglasses. This time, Luffy's attack successfully defeated Doflamingo and the birdcage collapsed. While still in midair, Luffy deflated and started falling. Law saved him by instantly teleporting him to the ground. Having passed out from injury and exhaustion, Luffy's head was placed into Rebecca's lap as the latter began to cry in happiness. After Doflamingo's downfall, Luffy and his group went to the palace, but later went to Kairos' old house to rest and recover. Three days after Doflamingo's defeat, Luffy continued his recovery as he heard about the rumor about Rebecca's father. He wasn't pleased with the rumor even after Kairos explained that he started it. Bartolomeo then entered the house, revealing that the Marines were mobilized to pursue the Straw Hats. He also explained that he and the other gladiators planned an escape route for them. Luffy then ran out of the house with the others, but suddenly stayed behind, saying that he still had something left to do. Zoro then told Luffy to hurry with his business, and they'll be waiting for him at the Eastern Port. Luffy then dashed to the Royal Palace and called out Rebecca. Once Luffy found Rebecca, he asked her if she was okay with Kairos leaving her. Rebecca answered no, and Luffy offered to take her to him. Luffy then took Rebecca and made his way to the hill where Kairos' house is located. After dropping off Rebecca there, Luffy ran towards the Eastern Port. Luffy reached the Eastern Port just when Isho was about to attack his allies with all the rubble from Dress Rosa. Luffy then attacked the Admiral with a hockey imbued Gear 3 attack, pushing him back. Luffy declared that he grew tired of running away from an Admiral and prepared for a fight. As they clashed, Luffy announced every single one of its attacks and where he was aiming before striking. Fujitora wondered if Luffy was taking pity on him due to his blindness. Luffy declared that he would not attack without saying anything, given that his opponent was blind. Fujitora laughed, explaining that they were supposed to be sworn enemies, and no one is supposed to fight an admiral like that. Annoyed and slightly angered, Fujitora blew Luffy with his gravity ability. Hyruden caught Luffy, and the Straw Hats, Law, and Luffy's other allies quickly fled across a bridge leading to a gigantic ship in the distance. As Fujitora prepared to bombard all the ships with floating rubble, the citizens of Dress Rosa arrived to chase after the pirates. Not wishing to harm the citizens, Fujitora halted his attack, allowing his targets to get away. Luffy and his allies eventually reach Orlumbus' flagship, the Yonta Maria. After boarding the ship, the following pledged their allegiance to Luffy. Cavendish of the Beautiful Pirates, including Suleiman, Bartolomeo of the Bardo Club, Sai of the Happy Navy, Ideo of the Triple X Gym Martial Arts Alliance, including Blue Gilly, Abdullah, and Jeet, Leo of the Tontada Tribe, Hyruden of the Giant Warrior Pirates, and Orlumbus of the Yonta Maria Grand Fleet. When Luffy was asked to drink a sake cup to complete the agreement for an alliance, Luffy declined, much to the other's shock. He didn't wish to become someone great and powerful, but someone who is free, as well as not take away the freedom from his fellow allies. Once Luffy explained that they can do whatever they want, the allies decided to forge the alliance anyway, forming the Straw Hat Fleet. To Luffy's surprise, Sai, Bartolomeo, Leo, Cavendish, Ideo, Orlumbus, and Hyruden sat down and drank their sake cups, and Zoro ended up drinking the rest of the sake in what was supposed to be Luffy's cup. Afterwards, they held a feast to celebrate their victory over Doflamingo. As the group left Dress Rosa, a multitude of pirates who had suffered great blows to their business ventures because of Doflamingo's defeat came after the Yanta Maria Grand Fleet, seeking to bring down Luffy. However, Fujitora dropped the rubble from Dress Rosa on the enemy ships as a final thanks to Luffy for what he had done in the kingdom, while Kairos and Rebecca watched from afar and officially began their new life as a family together. After the feast, each of the leading allies received Luffy's Vivre card and parted ways. Bartolomeo then brought the Straw Hats, the Samurais, and Law to his ship, the going Luffy Senpai. After Zoro noticed the Straw Hats increase in bounty from a newspaper, Bartolomeo proudly showed Luffy's group their new wanted posters. Whole Cake Island Saga, Zo Arc. 
During a hailstorm, Luffy learned that the Bardo Club doesn't have a navigator, lack experience in sailing, and they usually call the granny who gives them useless advice. Therefore, Luffy, the other Straw Hats, the Samurais, and Law need to protect the ship. After one week of traversing through the dangers of the New World, the ship finally arrived at Zo. Luffy was astonished to see that Zo is an island on the back of a giant elephant that's over 1,000 years old. After finding the Thousand Sunny, the Bardo Club bid Luffy's group farewell. Proceeding to search for Sanji's group, they climbed the giant elephant's left hind leg with a dragon that Kanjiro conjured. After the samurais explained that they were also searching for their ninja comrade Raizo, Luffy and the others saw something dropping towards them. The thing that was falling towards them happened to be a monkey. The monkey hit Kinemon and Kanjiro, causing them to fall off the dragon. Despite being separated from the group, the samurais assured the Straw Hats that they were alright and will catch up to them eventually. The rest of Luffy's group considered turning back for them, but after they saw the dragon struggling to climb, they decided to continue towards the top. Once they reached the top, the dragon turned back into a drawing and the group went on to explore the island. They discovered a village and Luffy ran ahead of the group, searching for Sanji, Nami, Brook, and Chopper. Luffy later went to the whale forest and got attacked by a bull mink called Rodi for trespassing. They clashed until Wanda and Carrot arrived and stopped them. After Pedro called off the Guardians, Luffy got reacquainted with the Heart Pirates and explained that Law was on the island as well. Wanda then explained to Luffy about a recent attack on Zo before offering to take him to Sanji's group, much to his excitement. While riding Wani, Wanda told Luffy about the climate on Zo and how the seawater from Zunesha's eruption rain is filtered and sent across the country via a system of aqueducts. She and Carrot also explained that the rain also drops plenty of fish, providing them a good food source. As they travel, they went past some wooden stockades used for torturing prisoners. Luffy asked her about the pirate she mentioned earlier and she told him about Jack, explaining that his obituary was in the paper, since he was believed to be killed during a raid on a marine escort. She added that his death wasn't confirmed, so he might still be alive. Right after, Law teleported the rest of Luffy's friends close to their location. Wanda led them into Right Belly Forest. Luffy was overjoyed to be reunited with Nami and Chopper. Nami embraced Luffy as she told him what happened to Sanji. While having a feast with the Mink tribe, Luffy told Zoro not to be rude to the Minks. He was then happy to see Brook again. Brook explained that Momonosuke was safe, but refused to leave his room. He also warned Luffy not to mention Samurai or the Wano country. Before he could explain the reason, he was interrupted by canine minks. After Luffy told Chopper that Law was with his crew, Nami asked him what to do about Sanji. Since Sanji had left the letter, Luffy wasn't too worried, much to Nami's chagrin. Luffy then listened to Nami and Chopper's story about how they escaped the Big Mom pirates, before listening to Wanda's story about how Nami's group saved the mink tribe. After hearing that Prince Ino Arashi awakened from his coma and wanted to meet Zoe's benefactors, Luffy and his group went to meet him. On the way, Wanda began to explain to them about Jack's attack on Zoe in more detail. During her explanation, Wanda revealed that Jack was searching for a Wano ninja known as Raizo. After Wanda finished with her recollection, Brook explained to his crew the reason why they should not mention Samurai or the Wano country. When Luffy blurted out the ninja's name, Nami, Usopp, and Brook swiftly beat him up. They then arrived at the Duke's home where they were introduced to Sicilian, who expressed his gratitude to the crew. After entering the Duke's home, they heard about a weapon Jack used against the Mink tribe. After hearing that the weapon was made by Caesar, Luffy became angry. Ino Arashi then changed the topic of their conversation to how he once met Shanks. Luffy was about to talk more about him, but the Duke suddenly fell asleep since dusk arrived. After Wanda finished recalling the devastation caused by Jack and the Mink Tribe's salvation, Luffy promised to make Jack and Kaido pay one day. Wanda expressed her doubt about Jack being dead as she saw how powerful he was and how he fought. The Straw Hats then decided to visit Nekomamushi and the Guardians, and they traveled to the Whale Forest with Wanda and Carrot. On the way, Nami and Brooke began to explain to the rest of the group what happened when Big Mom's ship arrived at Zo two days before Luffy's group's arrival. Specifically, they informed the rest of the crew of Big Mom's upcoming tea party, which would host a political wedding between Sanji, the third son of the Vinsmoke family, and the 35th daughter of the Charlotte family, Pudding. They also explained that Sanji, after ensuring the safety of Nami, Brooke, and Chopper, chose to leave with the Big Mom pirates in order to settle things with his family. After hearing about the circumstances surrounding Sanji's departure, Luffy was initially excited at the prospect of having another crewmate. However, when Brooke told him that they would become subordinate members of Big Mom's hierarchy if Sanji married her daughter, Luffy became displeased at the idea. Despite this, when Chopper explained the possibility of Sanji severing ties with them in order to avoid this exact scenario, Luffy became worried that Sanji might quit the Straw Hats, which he considered even worse than sailing under Big Mom. Luffy then decided to find Sanji, although his crew objected to confronting Big Mom without a plan. After arriving at the Whale Forest, Pedro then brought Luffy to Pecoms. When Luffy questioned him about the arranged marriage, Pecoms revealed that Sanji's father and Big Mom arranged the wedding to finalize an alliance between their families, and that the Vinsmoke family is a family of killers. Pecoms proceeded to tell them about a mysterious organization known as Germa 66, commanded by the Vinsmokes and headed ultimately by Sanji's father. Luffy then stated that he didn't care and told Pecoms that he wanted the Big Mom pirates to be his underlings, not the other way around. 
Shocked and furious at this statement, Pecoms reminded Luffy of Big Mom's power and status. Once he calmed down, Pecoms explained the reason why Sanji couldn't refuse the invitation. If he did, he would receive the decapitated head of someone close to him. Luffy then asked him how the Big Mom pirates knew so much about Sanji, and Pecoms replied that it was because of the power that all four emperors hold. Pecoms went on to say that the marriage, instead of making the Straw Hats Big Mom subordinates, would automatically result in Sanji leaving the Straw Hats and joining the Big Mom pirates, a revelation to which Luffy did not take kindly. Pecoms said that he will return to the Big Mom pirates once he's recovered. Luffy then told Pecoms to also take him to the tea party to find Sanji, ignoring Pecoms' objections. As he ran outside, he found Zoro listening in on the earlier conversation. Luffy assumed that Zoro was also worried about Sanji, much to Zoro's annoyance. They then met Nekomamashi, who then gave them a warm greeting. Law arrived and introduced his crew to Luffy. Law was then shocked to be informed that Sanji went to Big Mom. Luffy said that he'll bring Sanji back and told him not to attack Kaido until he returns. Law then explains that Kaido might be pursuing them as they speak, and Zoro could be at risk. After the minx felt touched by Law's concerns, Nekomamashi decided to party with Luffy and his group. The next morning, Luffy and his group heard a bell ringing and realized that Kinemon and Kanjiro had arrived. They quickly rushed to find them, fearing what would happen if the mink tribe meets the samurai. The Straw Hats managed to intercept Kinemon, Kanjiro, and Momonosuke just as they arrived at Kurao City and tried desperately to keep them hidden. However, as Nekomamashi and Ino Arashi were fighting, Kinemon and Kanjiro revealed themselves. Contrary to what the Straw Hats expected, the mink tribe welcomed the samurais and revealed that Raizo is safe. The Straw Hats were stunned to learn that the minks knew about Raizo all along and went to great lengths to keep him hidden despite the abuse they suffered. After Momonosuke stopped Ino Kino Arashi and Nakamamashi from continuing their quarrel, Kinemon revealed that Momonosuke was not his son, but was actually the son of Kozuke Oden, which surprised Luffy as Momonosuke and Kinemon looked alike. However, Luffy still didn't take Momonosuke seriously. Ino Arashi and Nakamamashi then took the Straw Hats, Law, and the Samurai to Raizo, and Luffy and the other male pirates were excited to meet him, thinking he would be like a stereotypical ninja. When they met Raizo at a secret room inside the whale-shaped tree, Luffy and his crewmates were shocked by Raizo's appearance, but still begged him to perform very tricks. Raizo refused until the pirates started sulking, which caused him to use some of his ninja arts and the pirates were immediately entranced. Luffy, Usopp, and Chopper then accompanied Kinemon, Kanjiro, and Raizo as they stood outside the whale tree, expressing their sorrows as they saw the state Zo was in after Jack's attack. When Robin deciphered the red poneglyph hidden in the whale tree, Nekomamashi called them back in. Ino Arashi then explained to the Straw Hat about the four road poneglyphs and they listened in anticipation as he revealed how they can lead to Laugh Tale. When Nekomamashi revealed that Kaido and Big Mom each possessed one road poneglyph, Luffy became more eager to fight them. Usopp was delighted to hear that they can copy the information on the poneglyphs using Gyotaku, but Luffy wasn't interested in that approach, much to Usopp's chagrin. The Straw Hats were then surprised when Nekomamashi revealed that Momonosuke's ancestors created the poneglyphs. However, the samurai explained that Momonosuke never inherited the knowledge of the poneglyphs due to the execution of Lord Odin at the hands of Kaido and the Shogun of Wano. The Straw Hats also learned that Odin was part of Roger's crew and had been on Laugh Tale with him as well as the Beast Pirate's objective in obtaining the secret that Odin knew. The samurai explained Odin's will to open Wano country to the world and they went on a journey to gather allies in order to fight Kaido and the Shogun of Wano. Kinemon then requests Luffy's assistance, but Luffy declined, saying that Momonosuke should make the request himself. Momonosuke then declares his will to fight Kaido and protect those dear to him. He bowed and humbly asked for Luffy's help. Seeing Momonosuke's resolve, Luffy accepted the request and formed an alliance with the samurai and the mink tribe. Right after leaving the secret room, Luffy learned that Ino Arashi and Nekomamashi traveled with Odin and had been on the ships of both Whitebeard and Roger. He also learned that the remnants of the Whitebeard pirates were defeated and then forced into hiding by the Blackbeard pirates one year after the Summit War of Marineford. The Alliance decided to split up to accomplish different tasks and meet up again at Wano. Nami, Chopper, and Brooke chose to accompany Luffy in his mission to rescue Sanji. Ramen asked Luffy to make a copy of the poneglyph in Big Mom's possession. However, before they could start their operation, they felt Zo shaking and heard Zunesha crying. As everything shook around them, Luffy heard Zunesha's voice. However, Luffy's own voice couldn't reach it. After Momonosuke revealed that he can hear the elephant's voice as well, Luffy urged him to give the elephant a command, which was to drive Jack away. After Jack's fleet has been sunk, Luffy prepared to disembark Zo. He then went to check up on Pekka 
Pecoms and was shocked to see that the house he was resting in collapsed. He was relieved when Pecoms revealed that he used his devil fruit powers to save himself from further injury. Luffy then carried Pecoms on his back and departed from Zo with the Sanji retrieval team, which also included Pedro. Everyone except the Straw Hat members left behind were shocked when Luffy jumped off Zunesha with his party. As they sailed towards Whole Cake Island on the Thousand Sunny, Luffy scolded Nami, Chopper, and Brook for acting less energetic. Nami pointed out that they were still recovering from the shock of Luffy's stunt at Zo. The group on the Sunny were then surprised to see Carrot had snuck aboard the ship. As she begged them not to turn back, Luffy allowed her to come along. When the crew got hungry, Luffy, in Sanji's absence, insisted on preparing a meal himself after Nami was going to charge them money for the food. While cooking, Luffy and the rest of the Sanji retrieval team learned from a newspaper about the Blackbeard Pirates' attack on the Revolutionary Army's headquarters at Baltigo. Luffy was shocked to see what his father looks like, and also worried for Sabo's life. Pedro assured Luffy that if the Revolutionaries were defeated, it would have been mentioned in the newspaper. Luffy then realized that he forgot to turn off the stove, causing a fire. After passing through a storm, Luffy presented his dish, which his group did not enjoy in the least. Luffy then admitted that he used up all the food they had, and his group suddenly found themselves in a food shortage crisis. Thank you, Luffy. Whole Cake Island Arc a few days later, the group was famished from the lack of food and overheated as they passed through boiling waters. They were saved from starvation when Luffy managed to catch a gigantic fish. Luffy immediately started eating the fish and consumed the fish's toxic skin, which led to Luffy being incapacitated by food poisoning. After they entered Big Mom's waters, the group on the Sunny was approached by a ship belonging to Jerma Double Six. The Straw Hats were approached by two of Sanji's siblings, Vinsmoke Yonji and Vinsmoke Reiju. Reiju proceeded to suck the poison out of Luffy through his mouth, causing him to be revived almost instantly. Luffy thanked Reiju for saving him, as Reiju explained that the Vinsmoke family had been searching for Sanji since he left them as a child. Luffy wanted Reiju to give Sanji back to the crew, but Reiju leaped back onto her ship, and she and Yonji sailed away. The group later docked at Kakao Island, an island close to Whole Cake Island. After seeing buildings made of chocolate, Luffy and Chopper went ahead to explore the island. When they ate at a cafe, a policeman confronted them and was about to arrest them. The owner of the cafe, Charlotte Pudding, arrived and came to their defense, saying that they were hired to dismantle the cafe. After she saved Luffy and Chopper, the team accompanied her to her home, where she offered them food. While conversing with her, Luffy accidentally revealed his name. The Sanji retrieval team was then shocked to learn that the woman they were conversing with was Sanji's betrothed, who in turn was surprised to discover that the group was from the Straw Hat crew. After calming down, Luffy and the team listened as Pudding explained more about the Charlotte family and her thoughts about about Sanji. Luffy and the others was shocked to hear that Sanji turned her down. Pudding then showed them a secret route to Whole Cake Island and told them where to meet her while promising to bring Sanji to them. The Sanji retrieval team then left in a hurry when guards arrived for Pudding and quickly returned to the Thousand Sunny. Pecoms was nowhere to be seen, and they found a message telling them to turn back. Luffy decided to continue forward, saying that things got interesting. After leaving Kakao Island, Luffy wanted to go rescue Pecoms, but Pedro dissuaded him, saying that the mink would be alright. The team sailed on Pudding's route and reached the next island, but Nami decided to stay away from it. Luffy quickly steered the ship starboard, causing the helm to burst into flames, much to Nami's chagrin. Luffy later wanted to go into the kitchen to cook again, but Nami quickly stopped him. A giant aquatic centipede then attacked the Thousand Sunny, and the team began battling it. The team later battled a swarm of giant ants before getting trapped in a frozen sea of syrup as night fell. As they worked to unfreeze the sea, Pedro revealed the giant ants had once eaten his own ship, and Luffy wondered what he did there in the past. Pedro then explained that he once traveled with Pecoms as a pirate, and came to Toto Island searching for Poneglyphs, revealing that his journey met with defeat. However, Pedro was fine with coming back to help the Straw Hats. He told Luffy that since Ino Arashi and Nekomamashi showed him the road poneglyph on Zo, they must believe that he can follow in Goldie Roger's footsteps, as he was the only other stranger to see it, and so they needed to acquire Big Mom's road poneglyph. He then offered to sneak in and steal it while the others rescued Sanji. Luffy agreed to this proposal as the ants returned. The next day, the team reached Whole Cake Island. After docking at the southwestern coast of Whole Cake Island, the team split into two groups, with Pedro and Brook departing to find Big Mom's road poneglyph. Right after Luffy's group disembarked on the island, Luffy saw what appeared to be Sanji in the nearby forest. Luffy, Chopper, and Carrot ran after him, and Nami followed them, but he somehow disappeared. Luffy, Chopper, and Carrot entered the woods to continue searching, although they were often distracted by the sweet environment. The team was nearly eaten by a talking crocodile, and Nami attempted to get everyone to turn back, but Luffy intently pressed on the search for Sanji. They also encountered a man with a gigantic head whose body is buried into the ground. Suddenly, Luffy encountered Big Mom's eighth daughter, Brulee, who was disguised as another version of himself and talked and acted simultaneously with him just like a mirror reflection. The two got angry at each other and started fighting, matching each other's blows exactly, and they told the others to go ahead and look for Sanji. 
Nami, Chopper, and Carrot returned to where Luffy was still fighting Brulee as they were being chased by Randolph. Brulee went with them while Luffy ran in the opposite direction. Luffy attempted to tell them that the real him was not with them, but Brulee stifled him before he could say anything. As night fell over Whole Cake Island, Luffy gathered multiple bound fake versions of Sanji, Pudding, Nami, Chopper, and Carrot into the center of a clearing in the seducing woods. Luffy exclaimed that he found all of them, but that they were all acting strangely. He then asked whose idea was to begin multiplying. Luffy then discovered the real Nami among the fakes and quickly untied her. Luffy realized they did not multiply on purpose as she berated his logic and explained to Luffy about what happened during the encounter with Brulee. While interrogating a buried man named Pound, they learned about a toll that the citizens of Totoland must pay to Big Mom as well as the Emperor's Devil Fruit power, which enables her to give life to many things. The man then reveals that he was one of Big Mom's husbands, who was discarded after having two daughters. Big Mom's tenth son, Charlie Cracker, appeared and confronted the group. As Luffy and Nami confronted Cracker, they were suddenly ambushed by Randolph again, but Cracker knocked him over in anger. Luffy and Nami watched as Cracker argued with Brulee and the guards of the seducing woods. Brulee showed a captured carrot and Chopper trapped in her mirror before shattering the mirror into pieces. Luffy was worried, but Chopper revealed that he and Carrot remained unharmed. When Cracker tried to kill Pound, Luffy blocked his sword. He then kicked Cracker's arm, forcing him to free Pound. Luffy battled Cracker, but was sent flying into a tree homie, and he got up and prepared to give his all against Cracker. Nami asked Luffy to retreat, but he refused and tried to attack Cracker with Elephant Gun. After blocking the attack, Cracker easily overwhelmed Luffy with his swordsmanship, Devil Fruit abilities, and Buso Shoku Haki, sending Luffy flying through several tree homies despite Luffy using Haki himself. Luffy returned and attacked Cracker with Hawk Gatling, but Cracker countered it with his Haki imbued shields, which Luffy stated were harder than any Buso Shoko Haki he had faced before. Cracker slammed Luffy into the ground and drew closer to him, berating Luffy for wanting to take Sanji away from the royal lifestyle. Luffy grew angry at Cracker for claiming that Sanji would tell him and the other Straw Hats that he never wanted to see them again. Luffy then activated Gear 4 and managed to send Cracker flying with Kong Gun. While Cracker was on the ground, Luffy used another Kong Gun and shattered Cracker's biscuit armor. The real Cracker emerged from it, cutting Luffy's right arm with pretzel. Cracker revealed his true Devil Fruit abilities to Luffy as he created multiple biscuit soldiers, which Luffy attacked. However, Cracker had them advance as he leaped out from behind them to attack Luffy, barely missing his head. The battle lasted for 11 hours and Luffy adopted a strategy of fighting, running, and eating Cracker's biscuit soldiers. This made Cracker increasingly exasperated, and Luffy was determined to chip away Cracker's stamina and go to Sanji. Cracker soon produced more biscuit soldiers and sent them charging at Luffy. Nami used Rain Spark and softened the soldiers, which Luffy then devoured. As Luffy was reaching his limit, he used another variation form of Gear 4 called Tank Man, full version. When Cracker tried to pierce Luffy with his sword, Luffy sucked Cracker into his body and sent him flying into Sweet City. After Cracker's defeat, Luffy laid on the ground, exhausted from the battle. He then rested on top of King Bomb's head alongside Nami as they traveled to Big Bomb's castle. On the way, Luffy returned to his normal size and they encountered the Vinsmoke carriage and saw Sanji again. Excited, Luffy leaped onto the carriage and asked Sanji to return with him. In response, Sanji kicked Luffy off the carriage and told him to leave. Luffy refused to listen, so Sanji volunteered to handle Luffy himself. As Sanji approached Luffy, he further insulted the latter before kicking him in the face. Luffy withstood the attack and remained on his feet. Sanji continued the confrontation by repeatedly kicking Luffy until he finally collapsed and lost a tooth. After Sanji returned to his family's carriage, Luffy got back on his feet and yelled to Sanji, saying that he knew that Sanji never meant what he said. Luffy declared that he would wait for Sanji and would gladly starve to death if he doesn't return. Luffy went on saying that he would not eat any food unless it's made by Sanji's hands. After the Vinsmoke family left, Luffy and Nami soon saw the weather changing into a massive storm as an army marched towards their location. Luffy refused to run and hide, so he fought the army head on. As the battle raged on, Luffy managed to defeat most of the army before he was overwhelmed by Charlotte Opera's cream, which scalded his skin, and he raced to attack Opera. However, Charlotte Montdor put Luffy into the setting of one of his books, preventing Luffy from seeing the real world. This prevented Luffy from seeing two Big Mom pirate members, Charlotte Counter and Charlotte Cadenza, from rushing at him, and he was punched from the front and the back with cream punch, sending him crashing down. The Big Mom pirates headed back to Sweet City, and one of them tried to carry Luffy. Luffy tried holding onto the ground in order to stay at his spot, but counter stomped on his head. Luffy and Nami were then imprisoned inside a book. Inside the prisoner library, Big Mom spoke to them through a Denden Mushi. Luffy shouted at her to let him go. Big Mom laughed at his liveliness and said that she thought that she had broken his promise to battle her due to not bringing his entire crew. Luffy replied that he still intended to fulfill that promise, but he was only there to get Sanji back, though he would still fight her if she showed up. Big Mom replied by telling Luffy that he was nothing compared to 
her and that she could have killed him without even needing to show up. Big Mom said that if they gave up on rescuing Sanji, she would free them once the wedding was complete and warn them that if they interfered with her plans, she would give them hell. Big Mom recalled the time Luffy gave her treasure including the legendary box known as the Tamataibako and explained that she had taken a liking to the box and that she would forgive the Fishman Island incident altogether and plan to open the Tamataibako during the wedding ceremony. Luffy shouted at her to be quiet, saying the wedding wouldn't happen and asked to speak to his friend. Pudding. Big Mom laughed incredulously about the Straw Hats being friends with the bride-to-be and then inquired about Lola. Big Mom recounted on how Lola running away from an important political marriage ruined her plans to become Pirate King. Luffy replied that Lola didn't need to be a pawn in Big Mom's rise to power and challenged the Emperor again, saying he would get Sanji back and defeat her in the end. Sometime after the conversation, Pudding came to the prisoner library and requested to talk to Luffy and Nami, and she entered their cell via an opening created by a bookmark. Pudding apologized for the harm her siblings had inflicted on them and apologized for not meeting them on the coast like they agreed. She revealed that Sanji had proposed to her, but stated that she knew he didn't truly want to marry her, and so she wouldn't marry him. She then whispered to Luffy and Nami, saying with a sinister expression that she would kill Sanji during the wedding ceremony and that Luffy and Nami wouldn't leave alive. Pudding then left their cell with tears while telling them goodbye and insulting them. Shocked and angry at what Pudding said, Luffy then struggled to break free, determined not to die, even if it meant tearing off his arms. Before Luffy could further injure himself, Jinbei arrived at the prisoner library and took down opera with a single punch. Luffy and Nami were both overjoyed as Jinbei prepared to free them. Jinbei then released Luffy and Nami by burning the book they were imprisoned in. Luffy then collapsed from hunger but quickly got back up as Big Mom's soldiers were charging into the prisoner library. Luffy dashed out of the prisoner library and went on a rampage throughout the castle, searching for Sanji. During the rampage, Luffy strangled Counter while demanding Sanji's whereabouts. Luffy continued to run through the hallways calling for Sanji until Reiju grabbed him and hit him in the infirmary. Reiju then informed him that Sanji was already aware of Pudding's deception. She also mentioned that she tried to convince Sanji to leave, but he was worried about the chefs at the Baratier and the Straw Hats. Relieved that Sanji was not being deceived, Luffy jumped out of the castle and headed back to the place where he promised to wait for Sanji. Dazed and fatigued, Luffy began his journey through Sweet City in the rain. He later made it back to the promised place where he fell asleep while he waited patiently for Sanji. Luffy woke up when he smelled the bento box Sanji was carrying. Sanji gave the box to him and Luffy happily ate the food. When Luffy once again asked Sanji to leave with him, Sanji explained his reasons why he couldn't. Luffy responded by punching Sanji and demanding him to tell the truth. Sanji broke down in tears, saying that he wanted wanted to return to the crew, but he didn't want to leave his family to die. Luffy then gave Sanji his support, saying that they would ruin the wedding together. Luffy and Sanji were later contacted by Chopper's group through a mirror shard. After Luffy explained his intent to ruin the wedding ceremony, Jinbei explained to Luffy more about Beiji, such as his backstory and him plotting against Big Bomb. Jinbei proposed to Luffy about forming an alliance with Beiji, and Luffy agreed to meet him. Once at Beiji's hideout, Luffy and Sanji were greeted by Vito, who asked them to take a bath, since his boss doesn't like to meet with dirty people. After Luffy and Brooke had their bath, they raided Beiji's fridge for milk, with Luffy regaining his lost tooth and Brooke's cracked skull healing. Luffy and his team soon met Beiji and the negotiations were hectic, with Luffy spotting Caesar Clown among Beiji's crew and wanting to attack Beiji for hurting Pecoms. The brawl was broken up when Jinbei pointed out that the group share a common enemy in Big Mom. Reluctantly, Luffy asked Beiji about his plan, and the latter responded that he already had a perfect one prepared. Beiji proceeded to explain the details, including informing Luffy that he would be the bait to distract Big Mom's subordinates once Beiji triggers one of her tantrums. Despite Nami's and Chiffon's protests, Luffy agreed excitedly, stating that he already had a plan for how to make his entrance at the ceremony. Luffy, Beiji, and Caesar then agreed that their alliance would come to an end once Big Mom was dead and all groups had made their escape. As the meeting adjourned, Luffy asked Beiji for a favor. Luffy requested Beiji to place a mirror inside the wedding cake so he could enter the venue from there, taking everyone by surprise. Planning to take advantage of Brulee's power, Luffy rounded up a bunch of animals from the seducing woods and had her turn them into Luffy's duplicates. Beiji took the alliance members to the tea party in his castle, and Luffy slept for the first time in three days. After the wedding ceremony began, Again, Jinbei had difficulty waking Luffy up, but eventually managed to do so with food. The team then prepared to charge into the venue once they heard the signal. Right after Katakuri's attempted assassination on Sanji failed, multiple duplicates of Luffy emerged from the wedding cake. As chaos erupted at the wedding venue, Luffy identified himself when Big Mom called out to him. Luffy attempted to attack the photo of Carmel, but his attempt was thwarted by Katakuri, who immobilized
mobilized Luffy with his devil fruit power. Jinbei came to Luffy's aid and freed him using black tea. When Jinbei officially declared to Big Mom that he was leaving the Big Mom pirates and joining the Straw Hats, Luffy was worried that Big Mom would take away Jinbei's lifespan. However, Luffy was delighted to see that Big Mom's power had no effect on him due to having no fear towards Big Mom and cheered when he toasted a cup of sake to signify his departure from her. Big Mom then tried to attack Luffy and Jinbei with Prometheus, but the two evaded the attack. Luffy was then overjoyed to see Brook destroying the picture of Carmel. However, Big Mom didn't start screaming after three seconds like they planned. During the ensuing conflict, Beiji pretended to pin Luffy down to avoid suspicion. When Brook was decapitated, his head rolled towards them, but he still survived. Brook then whispered to Luffy that Big Mom was in a state of confusion on what to be mad about, and their best chance was to show her the broken photo of Carmel again. Beiji questioned if there was any point with the plan, but when they were approached by Katakuri, Beiji noticed that he foresaw a horrific future and became confident again that the plan will work out. While Beiji confronted Katakuri, Luffy grabbed Carmel's broken portrait, preparing to show it to Big Mom. Katakuri then went after Luffy and pinned him down with his devil fruit powers. However, Luffy was still able to stretch his arms and showed Caramel's broken portrait to Big Mom, causing her to start her strange scream. Luffy then shielded his ears from Big Mom's voice. After putting on earplugs, Luffy watched as Beiji, Vito, and Gati fired their KX launchers at Big Mom. However, Big Mom's scream detonated the rockets before they could reach her. Shocking Luffy and his allies. With the assassination attempt a failure, Caesar flew into the venue with the escape mirror and Beiji signaled Luffy to retreat. Before they could escape into the mirror, Big Mom's scream shattered it, leaving them trapped in the venue. Luffy then watched in amazement as Beiji transformed into a giant fortress. Luffy then marveled at the fortress as he and his group fled to it. After all the Alliance members and the Vinchmoke family successfully retreated inside, Beiji went on to explain to his allies about the dire situation they were in. Luffy then showed concern when Beiji bled as his fortress sustained damage from Big Mom's attacks. He tried to rush out to attack Big Mom, but was held back by his crew. They were intent on not fighting Big Mom, and Beiji hatched an escape plan. The Vinsmoke family went out to cover for the alliance, but when Reiji was overwhelmed, Luffy and Sanji went out and blocked Big Mom's attack, with Luffy doing so against Sanji's orders. As Sanji dragged Luffy away, Big Mom taunted Luffy by using his previous threats to her before calling him spineless. In response, Luffy activated Gear 4 and tried to strike Big Mom, who easily blocked his attack. Before falling back, Luffy told Big Mom that he would be coming after her after Kaido is defeated. Before they could escape, Luffy, Sanji, and the Vinsmoke family were subdued by the Charlotte family. Big Mom was going to execute them, but the Tamate Bako dropped to the base of the Whole Cake Chateau and exploded, causing the castle to topple over. As the castle collapsed, Luffy's group, Beiji's crew, and the Vinsmoke family got away. The Sanji Retrieval Team and the Fire Tank Pirates rendezvous at the northwest part of Whole Cake Island, where Luffy and Beiji agreed to go their separate ways. After Brook and Chopper separated from the group to retrieve the sharks emerged, the rest head for the Thousand Sunny. As they approached the seducing woods, Luffy was surprised to see King Bomb alive and stitched back together. Nami then revealed that she still possessed part of Big Mom's river card and used it to control King Bomb again, forcing him to transport the fleeing team. However, before they reached the seducing woods, a crazed Big Mom, while riding on Zeus, caught up to them. Using Napoleon in its sword form, Big Mom unleashed an air slash that cut off part of King Bomb. Luffy noted that the attack was similar to Dory and Brogy's combination attack. As Big Mom prepared to attack again, Luffy prepared to fight, but Nami interrupted him and diverted Zeus's attention by using thunderclouds, causing the cloud homie to veer off course and drop Big Mom. When Luffy and his group reached the seducing woods, Big Mom ordered the tree homies to stop the straw hats, but King Bomb charged through them. Luffy and his group were later forced to jump off King Bomb when Prometheus attacked and burned King Bomb for his betrayal. As the Sanji retrieval team continued with their escape, Jinbei explained about Big Mom's eating disorder to Luffy as she resumed her pursuit. Prometheus caught up to them, and Luffy attacked the fire homie to avenge King Bomb, but he was unable to harm the living flames with hockey punches. After Jinbei stunned Prometheus with blasts of water, several Big Mom pirates caught up to their captain and clashed with the Sanji retrieval team. Along the way, Luffy stopped Carrot from separating from the group. The team pulled out of the conflict quickly, knowing that they couldn't split up there. When Zeus ate one of Nami's weather eggs and grew massively and became storm, me, Nami took the opportunity to summon a massive lightning bolt that struck the Big Mom pirates pursuing them. Nami's attack left Big Mom laying at the bottom of a crater. To the Straw Hat's shock, Big Mom was barely affected and continued to move. She ate through the ground as she moved back up and the team started running again. They were then approached by Pudding and Chiffon. Luffy was angry to see Pudding again as she tried to tell Sanji about their mission to make a cake. To Luffy's confusion, her mood swings went from being in love with Sanji to wanting to kill him and back. Chiffon took the lead as she petitioned for Sanji to help them make a cake to satiate Big Mom's eating disorder, and Sanji readily agreed to assist them. Big Mom then got back on her feet and unleashed another devastating air slash, and the two groups parted ways with Sanji heading to Kakao Island with Pudding and Chiffon, while Luffy and his group continued fleeing to the Thousand Sunny. 
putting use their devil root powers to send memories flooding into the souls in the homies, allowing the Straw Hats to make it to the coast without any trouble. The Sanji retrieval team made it back to the ship, but they got into a conflict with Perospero and Katakuri, who were on board. Luffy was also surprised to find Chopper and Brook trapped in candy. Perospero sent a spiked candy Iron Maiden at the Straw Hats, but Luffy destroyed it with a Red Hawk. Upon reaching the ship, Luffy clashed against Katakuri. After Perispero trapped the ship in candy, Luffy watched in shock as Pedro attempted to take out Perispero with a massive suicidal explosion. As the team completed preparations for their gateway, Katakuri once again made his move and subdued Carrot when she tried to attack him. Luffy then grabbed Katakuri and dragged him into the mirror world. Once there, Luffy smashed the mirror to the Sunny and prepared to continue his fight with the Sweet Commander. With the Sunny fleeing from Big Mom and her fleet, Luffy and Katakuri commenced their fight, with Katakuri claiming that he had out matched Luffy in both speed and power. After Luffy attacked with Hawk Gatling, Katakuri countered with several mochi tendrils hardened into fists before proceeding to warn Luffy that anything Luffy can do, he could do better. Luffy then asserted that Rubber would never lose the mochi, but his subsequent Hawk Stamp was dodged and Katakuri kicked him into a wall. Luffy then tried using Elephant Gun, but Katakuri created an even larger fist with mochi and pushed Luffy into the wall with tremendous power, overwhelming Luffy. With Luffy lying on the floor, Katakuri then ordered Brulee to find another mirror on the Sunny and use the portal to set the Sunny on fire. After Jaskarpone and Mascarpone arrived with a mirror, Luffy rushed towards them, but Katakuri stopped him and reminded him of his promise to fight one on one. Katakuri then resumed attacking Luffy, warning him not to lay a hand on his younger brothers and sisters. Luffy successfully dodged the attack and made contact with Nami through a mirror shard, ordering her to break all the mirrors on the Sunny so that he can focus solely on fighting Katakuri. Luffy showed concern for his group when he heard that Big Mom sunk the Thousand Sunny. While the Big Mom pirates were puzzled by the mirrors leading to the Sunny breaking one by one, Luffy was contacted by his team after the surviving after they survived Big Mom's assault. As Luffy distanced himself from the nearby Big Mom pirates, his group told him to find a mirror connecting to Kakao Island so they can meet him there. Luffy was then further assaulted by Katakuri and Luffy covered his mouth to prevent his team from knowing that he was sustaining injuries. In a brief moment, Luffy told his team to hurry on to Kakao Island. As Katakuri prepared to kill him, Luffy declared that he didn't plan on dying. As Luffy continued to struggle against Katakuri, Brulee started bragging about Katakuri's legendary strength. Luffy then tried to punch her, but Katakuri grabbed his fist and slammed him into a wall. After pondering on how he should maim Luffy, Katakuri then began to attack with his trident Mogura. In the midst of this, Katakuri noted on how Luffy dodged his strikes more so than anyone and revealed his awakened powers to trap the Straw Hat Captain. As Luffy was restrained, he prepared to resort to using Gear 4. Before Luffy could activate his Gear 4, Katakuri prevented him from activating it by engulfing him with Mochi. Growing tired of the battle making his snack time late, Katakuri turned much of the surrounding mirror world into Mochi and piled it onto Luffy in order to suffocate him. While Katakuri was feasting on some snacks, Luffy escaped by eating through the mochi and located Katakuri inside a nearby mochi house using his Kenbun Shoku Haki. He then broke into his house and saw Katakuri in the state of eating. This made Katakuri furious, and he quickly dispatched his chefs before attacking Luffy, overwhelming him with strong Busoshoku Haki. However, Luffy managed to land a kick on Katakuri's jaw, and Katakuri was incredulous when Luffy stated he had figured out his weakness. Luffy then activated Gear 4 and struck Katakuri with Kong Gun, which Katakuri blocked. Luffy gained the upper hand against Katakuri, landing several Gear 4 attacks on him. However, once Katakuri regained his composure, he resumed dodging Luffy's attacks and landed a powerful strike on Luffy, knocking him back. With Luffy losing the advantage, Katakuri went on the offensive. When Katakuri mentioned that Luffy would deflate, Luffy realized that his Gear 4 would wear out soon and retreated. His Gear 4 wore out as he was fleeing, with Katakuri chasing after him. Once he came across Brulee, he grabbed her and escaped the mirror world before Katakuri could catch him. Luffy and Brulee then arrived at Nuts Island and found Big Mom rampaging there. After he was spotted by Big Mom, Luffy ran away while still carrying Brulee. Perispero blocked Luffy's path with a candy wall, and Luffy tried to destroy it with a Gigant pistol, which had no effect. He then dodged an attack from Amande, jumped over the candy wall, and continued running with Big Mom pursuing him. Luffy then escaped from Big Mom and traveled from island to island through the mirror world. While hiding inside a building with the captured Brulee, Luffy wondered on how to defeat Katakuri. He then remembered about Rayleigh's lessons and expressed an interest in seeing into the future before declaring that he would surpass Katakuri. Eventually, Luffy confronted Katakuri again, clashing with him once more. Though Katakuri pummeled him many times, Luffy kept getting back up. Luffy then calmed his mind and remembered what Rayleigh told him. He began to see into the future when he attempted to counter against a giant mochi fist. Katakuri tried to deter Luffy from continuing the battle, but Luffy refused to give up, saying that his friends were believing in him. Knowing that Luffy's Kenbon Shoku Haki was improving dramatically, Katakuri tried to end the battle quickly. Just as Luffy was about to attempt to dodge his opponent's next attack, a projectile pierced his thigh, 
breaking his balance, allowing Katakuri the opportunity to deal a devastating blow. Luffy briefly cried out in pain before Katakuri kicked him into a wall. He then tried to strike Luffy again with his mochi spear, but Luffy dodged it. Finally, Katakuri unleashed a barrage of mochi fists, pummeling Luffy into the floor. While lying down, Luffy thought back to his training with Rayleigh and got back on his feet. Flampe tried to shoot Luffy with her silent blowgun, but he dodged the shot. After Katakuri injured himself and revealed his place to Flampe while berating her for her interference, both Luffy and Katakuri unleashed a blast of house shokuhaki, knocking out Flampe and her subordinates. With no one meddling in their fight, Luffy resumed his battle with Katakuri. They continued to trade blows with each other, and as they were getting worn out from the battle, Luffy activated another variation of Gear 4, Snake Man. With his increased speed and ability to home in on his targets, Luffy was able to land more hits on Katakuri. However, Katakuri countered with his spiked mochi attacks. After trading more blows with each other, both fighters claimed that they would end the battle before engaging in a massive clash. After the clash, Luffy's Gear 4 wore off, and he fell into the hole created by the impact. As Luffy later climbed out of the hole, Katakuri stood and asked Luffy if he would return to defeat Big Mom. Luffy replied that he would, and Katakuri collapsed and fell unconscious. With Katakuri defeated, Luffy covered his fanged mouth with his extra hat before walking away. Pekoms, while in disguise, then approached him with the captured brulee and told Luffy that he planned to help him escape to honor Pedro's sacrifice. While traveling to the mirror leading to Kakao Island, Pekoms explained to Luffy about the Sulong form and his plan to help Luffy escape. While exiting the mirror world, Pekoms sandwiched Luffy between himself and brulee to hide the straw hat. Pekoms transformed, but he was viciously attacked, causing Luffy to be exposed. Sanji then grabbed Luffy and attempted to escape through the air, but they were smashed into the ground by Charlotte Yuen. Luffy and Sanji were cornered, but they were saved by the arrival of Jerma Double Six. As Sanji's siblings shielded them from bullets, Sanji was told to escape with Luffy, who lost consciousness. After Sanji kicked through several of the Big Mom pirates, Brulee revealed to them of Katakuri's defeat at Luffy's hands, causing them to become furious. In response, an enraged Oven attempted to attack Sanji and Luffy, but Ichiji repelled Oven as Sanji and Luffy fled into the air. Yun tried to attack Sanji once more, but Yonji interfered. Sanji was then shot at by several snipers, and one of them fired a missile. Niji grabbed Sanji before he was caught in the explosion, and while holding on to Sanji and Luffy, Niji traveled at high speed and took down several pirates with his sword. Niji then threw Sanji and Luffy towards the Thousand Sunny, sending them flying over the Big Mom pirate's fleet. As the group on the Sunny sailed past the port, Sanji told his captain that their ship was within sight. Luffy and Sanji returned to the Sunny, and Chopper quickly tended to Luffy's injuries. The group was then besieged by Smoothie's fleet, but Judge came to the rescue. As the Sunny passed by Judge's castle, Judge asked Luffy why he risked his life to rescue Sanji. Instead of answering his question, Luffy thanked him. The Sunny group later saw enemy ships approaching them from the front, and when the situation grew more dire, they were surprised when Maratsumi appeared and attacked the enemy. The Sun Pirates cleared a path for the Sunny. Luffy thanked them, and Aladdin asked Luffy to take care of Jinbei. However, despite their efforts, the Sunny was intercepted and attacked by the Queen Mama Chanter. Watatsumi saved the Sunny by switching it with the Sun Pirate ship and hid the Sunny in his mouth. Watatsumi tried swimming away, but Oven attacked him with heat waves, forcing him to spit out the Sunny. As the Sun Pirates held back the Big Mom Pirates, Jinbei decided to stay behind to help them. Luffy consented to Jinbei's decision, but reminded him that as an official member of the Straw Hats, Jinbei must survive and meet up with the rest of the crew at Wano. After Jinbei joined his former crew in battle, the Sunny group sailed far away from Kakao Island. With the Big Mom Pirates unable to pursue, the Sunny group successfully escaped Totaland. After some rest, Sanji cooked a meal for them. Reverie Arc After Sanji realized that he received a raid suit from Niji during the escape from Kakao Island, Luffy and Chopper begged him not to throw it away. Carrot received a newspaper and the group read it. Luffy became depressed when he misread his new bounty as 150 million berry. Brooke later took a closer look at the poster and told Luffy that he misread the amount. The group was then shocked to hear that Luffy's bounty actually increased to 1.5 billion berry. Wano Country Arc as the Thousand Sunny continued towards Wano Country, the group was informed of the Levely through a newspaper. They later encountered an unusual weather disturbance in their direction, followed by an octopus on their ship as well as a school of huge carp on their side. After a bumpy ride across a river, the ship climbed up a waterfall. After reaching the top, they came across a whirlpool. Luffy helped his group escape but was held back by the octopus before he could leave the ship. Luffy and the Thousand Sunny later washed up on a beach at Kuri and Luffy woke up when a crab pinched his nose. He then encountered a Koma Inu and a baboon wielding a katana. While the Koma Inu and the baboon were fighting, two beast pirate scouts were riding nearby. When they spotted Luffy and the Sunny, they tried to attack Luffy, but the latter easily defeated them and saved the little girl they had captured in the process. One of the pirates ordered the baboon, known as Hihimaru, to attack Luffy, but the latter stopped the baboon with a glare. The little girl Tama then knocked out the enemy pirate, and the girl managed to tame Hihimaru by feeding him Kibidango, created from her own cheek. 
Tom explained to Luffy where he was and what had happened to her, and after taking Sunny to a secure location, she offered to feed him as thanks. She took him to her master's house where she made him some rice dishes. After he ate, Luffy was confronted by Tom's master, who was angered that he ate the rice that she rarely got due to having spent her whole life weaving casas every day. Tom explained to her master that she gave Luffy the rice to thank him, but she then got sick due to having drank some of the river water that was contaminated by Kaido's factories. Her master revealed that she had decided to continue living in Kuri to wait for Ace, who had promised to return there. Luffy then informed them that Ace died, causing Tama to become upset and pass out. Hitatsu berated Luffy for saying it so directly, and told him about Ace's visit as well as the destruction of Tama's village. Luffy then offered to take Tama to the town to see the doctor, and Hitetsu told him to look for his allies. After changing his clothes, Luffy took the sword Nidai Katetsu with him, and Hitetsu tried to stop him due to fearing its curse, but was unsuccessful as Luffy left with Tama. As Komachiyo gave them a ride through the bamboo forest, Tama accused Luffy of lying and explained about the promise Ace made to her. They later entered a wasteland and Tama explained about the terrible environment created by the beast pirate before falling unconscious again. Luffy later spotted Zoro saving a woman from Kaido's thugs. He then reunited with his crewmate, but they were confronted by Hawkins shortly afterward. Hawkins then read Luffy and Zoro's fortune, saying that they had 19% chance of surviving at the end of the month. As they prepared to fight, Zoro noticed the sword Luffy was carrying and asked to hold onto it, but Luffy decided to use it. As Hawkins' men attacked, Luffy used a pinch instead of attacking with a blade. One of the giant lizards tried to bite Luffy, but he dodged it, grabbed it, and threw it at Hawkins, who caught it with his straw sword. Luffy was then surprised when Zoro attacked Hawkins with a flying slash to the face, but the damage was redirected to one of his men. After explaining about his Wada Wada no Mi, Hawkins conjured a giant straw entity. After he drew a card that made his men attack each other, Komachio dragged Luffy and Zoro away from the battle. Hawkins' straw figure pursued them until Zoro sliced it in two. After getting away from Hawkins, the woman that Zoro saved earlier introduced herself as Suru. Upon seeing Tama in critical condition, she asked the two straw hats to bring Tama to her tea shop so she could help her. They later arrived at Okobore Town. While Tama was healed by Suru's medicine, Luffy ate some food. After Luffy heard Suru's story about Okobore Town, Suru was attacked by the gifter Batman. During the confusion, Tama was abducted by Gazelle Man. Luffy, Zoro, Kiku, and Komachio quickly pursued the gifter and they headed for Bakura Town. At the town's gates, Luffy yelled out Tama's name and the group were confronted by swordsmen, but Luffy knocked them out with a Haoshoku Haki. While traveling through the town, Kiku told Luffy and Zoro about the town's history. A defeated sumo wrestler was suddenly hurled towards them, but Luffy caught him with one hand. They then came across a sumo wrestling tournament where Urashima was winning matches. As Urashima's men were taking Kiku to him, Luffy was amazed when Kiku sliced off Urashima's top knot with her sword. When Urashima tried to attack Kiku in a fit of rage, Luffy intercepted him and engaged him in a sumo match. Luffy dodged his opponent's attack and sent him flying out of the ring and crashing into a building. Many enemies then came to confront the group. Luffy fought back, demanding the boss of the town to show up. Hold'em later arrived at the scene while holding Tama hostage. As Hold'em accused the group of being part of the group of thieves, Kiku warned Luffy not to anger Hold'em carelessly. She also informed Luffy and Zoro that Jack was the ruler of the Kuri region and attacking Hold'em would have serious repercussions. When the headliner Speed arrived with a wagon of food, Luffy and Zoro decided to steal it. Luffy quickly attacked Hold'em and grabbed Tama while Zoro struck down the beast pirates escorting the wagon. Once he heard how Hold'em harmed Tama, Luffy dropped Tama in midair and turned around to attack Hold'em and struck him in the face with a powerful Red Hawk punch. With Hold'em taken down, Luffy then grabbed Tama again and tried to ride on the back of Speed, thinking she was a horse. Speed got angry, but when Tama offered some kibidango from her body, she ate it and became subservient to Luffy and Tama, carrying them out of Bakura Town as they made their way to Okobore Town. They later picked up Law along the way, and once they arrived at Okobore Town, they delivered the food to the citizens and Luffy crushed three gifters who tried to stop them. As Tama ate an apple, Luffy promised her that she would not be hungry again. After scolding Luffy and Zoro for their reckless behavior, Law decided to take them to the ruins of Odin's castle. Luffy then parted ways with Tama but decided to keep the sword he took from Hitetsu. Luffy, Zoro, Law, and Kiku rode on Komachio as they traveled to the castle ruins. As they approached the castle, Zoro wandered off somewhere and Kiku ran away in tears. When they reached the top of the mountain, Law showed Luffy the gravestones for the Kozuki family, including Kinemon, Momonosuke, Kanjiro, and Raizo. Luffy was surprised and initially thought they were dead, but Kinemon and Momonosuke then came out to meet him and Kiku returned to embrace Kinemon. The group then sailed to Wano with Luffy, arrived at the ruins as well, and Law took them inside to talk. There, Kinemon revealed that he, Momonosuke, Kanjiro, and Raizo had escaped from Orochi's takeover by traveling 20 years forward in time. Luffy then listened as Kinemon explained more about the past, such as the story of Odin, 
the time of his execution, the rumor about Toki, and what Kinemon's group did right after arriving at present time. Kinemon then went over a plan to attack Onigashima, the island where Kaido resided, in two weeks. Kinemon explained about the fire festival and how the decisive battle would play out. After giving the group specific tasks to do, Kinemon gave them new clothes and summoned Shinobu and summoned Shinobu to guide them. When Kaido arrived at the Kuri region, Law alerted Luffy to his presence. Seeing Kaido above Okobori Town, Luffy rushed off with Law following him. After Kaido destroyed Odin Castle, Luffy responded by attacking Kaido with a Gear 3 attack. The attack knocked Kaido to the ground with an enormous crash. Luffy then proceeded to run towards Odin Castle to check out his friends. But he came across a badly injured Speed, who told him that she tried to get Tama to safety. But Kaido intercepted and attacked them, leaving Tama's fate unknown. Law tried to tell Luffy to flee, but an enraged Luffy decided to once again engage the Emperor. Kaido unleashed his fire breath at them, but Luffy dodged and struck Kaido with Elephant Gatling. This dropped Kaido to the ground again, and he entered his human form while laying down. Luffy activated Gear 4 and unleashed an aggressive barrage of attacks on him. The attacks were ineffective and Kaido retaliated with Raime Hake, rendering Luffy unconscious with a single blow. Kaido then ordered his men to imprison Luffy, deciding to break his spirit and turn him into a subordinate. As Kaido's men surrounded Luffy, he instinctively knocked out some of them with Haushoku Haki. On the next day, Luffy was taken to prison at Udon and thrown into a cell next to Kid. Both Luffy and Kid swore payback against Kaido before Luffy noticed Kid next to him. A few days later, both of them were competing over who could do more work at the prisoner mine. Dobon then confronted the two over the amount of Kibidango rations they acquired. He prepared to discipline them as he had his hippo put them into its mouth. However, Luffy and Kid quickly knocked out Dobon and his hippo. Luffy also picked up an injured old man and carried him on his shoulder. On the next day, the old man that Luffy helped expressed his gratitude to Luffy, who then gave Hyo some of his meal tickets in an act of kindness. While Luffy was working, Raizo appeared beside him and informed him that he had located the keys to Luffy's sea stone handcuffs, but it was heavily guarded. Raizo then asked Luffy to wait a little longer before vanishing. Caribou approached Luffy and tried to talk to him with the intention of allying and escaping from the prison, but Luffy rejected him, telling Caribou to go ally with Kid. Caribou began to tell Luffy about the rumors of how Kid lost an arm until Kid appeared and interrupted him. After Kid explained his side of the story, Luffy and Kid began arguing over who would defeat Kaido. After news of Kid's escape from the prisoner mines was announced, Alpaca Man tormented Luffy by spitting on him and questioned if he had helped Kid escape. When Luffy saw one of the guards attacking Hyogoro, he rushed to attack the guard. Luffy then kicked the guard in the face and knocked him down, causing an uproar in the prison. The warden stepped in and attacked Luffy. Afterwards, Luffy continued with his defiance by trying to escape. Luffy and Hyogoro were then caught and brought before Queen, who attempted to convince Luffy to join the Beast Pirates, only for Luffy to reject the offer. Luffy and Hyogoro were sentenced to fight in death matches called the Sumo Inferno. Both of them were forced to wear collars that will behead them if they step out of the ring, but they were allowed to have their handcuffs removed for combat. As the first group of opponents attacked them, Luffy instantly knocked them out with Haushoku Haki. As he defeated more opponents, Luffy tried to learn an advanced application of Busoshoku that would allow him to emit the armament to a short distance. Luffy and Hyogoro were eventually confronted by Alpaca Man and Madillo Man. During the fight, Luffy told Hyogoro how to dodge their attacks. When Luffy told Hyogoro about trying to learn an advanced Busoshoku Haki technique, hoping to use it to break through Kaido's scales, Hyogoro demonstrated this technique and defeated Alpaca Man with it. Luffy affirmed that this was the exact technique he wanted to learn and asked Hyogoro to teach it to him. Hyogoro tried to teach Luffy, but he continued defeating opponents without making any progress. The Sumo Inferno was put on hold when night came, but Luffy and Hyogoro were left in the ring as the Beast Pirates retired for the rest of the day. After knocking out the nearby guards with Haushoku Haki, Luffy told Hyogoro his reason for wanting to defeat Kaido. Afterwards, Raizo and Katabu approached the ring. Katabu told Luffy he wanted to become his subordinate, and Luffy decided to accept his help. When Hyogoro revealed the potential allies within the prison, Luffy became eager to rally them. During the night, Luffy and Hyogoro ate Oshiruko that were stolen from Queen, but overate and grew fat. On the next day, as the Beast Pirates gathered around the ring, Luffy and Hyogoro prepared for the next set of matches, but Queen went to turn on the filming pond Tanishi. Luffy then witnessed the execution of Shimotsuki Yasuie. When Luffy commented that no one should laugh when someone dies, Hyogoro explained about the side effect of the smile fruits. As his crewmates were causing chaos at the execution site, Luffy cheered for them. He was then surprised to see that Kid had been recaptured while attempting to rescue Kamazo, who was revealed to be Killer. 
after Queen subjugated Kid and Killer to water torture and threatened to leave them submerged until Luffy and Hyogoro die, Luffy attempted to attack Queen, but he easily caught his punch and threw it aside. As tensions between Luffy and Queen began to heat up, they heard a loud noise coming from outside the gate. Luffy was then surprised to see an amnesiac Big Mom breaking into the prison. As Big Mom and Queen argued about Oshiruko, Luffy told them to pull Kid and Killer out of the water. Luffy was then surprised to see Big Mom overpowering Queen. He was relieved to see Kid and Killer saved from drowning after Queen crashed into the contraption holding them. When Big Mom didn't find any Oshiruko, Luffy unwittingly admitted that he ate the Oshiruko that Big Mom was looking for. Big Mom directed her anger towards Luffy and pushed him and Hyogoro out of the ring. Fortunately, Luffy managed to remove the collars. Hyogoro stayed in Big Mom's path, hoping that Luffy could become stronger by fighting her. To protect Hyogoro, Luffy prepared to face Big Mom head on. Luffy realized that what he did to remove his and Hyogoro's death collars was the same technique that he saw Rayleigh use to remove Kami's exploding collar at Sabaudi Archipelago two years ago on Sabadi Archipelago two years ago. However, since he used it in the heat of the moment, Luffy wasn't sure how to activate it at will. Luffy attempted to have his hockey flow through his hands, but Big Mom instantly sent him and Hyogoro crashing into a wall. Luffy worldly apologized to Hyogoro as he pulled him out of the wall, and Hyogoro revealed that he used hockey just in case. Hyogoro told Luffy more about the advanced uses of Bosushoku Haki before he and Luffy were separated by Big Mom who pursued Luffy into the neighboring prisoner iron factory. After running through the prisoner mines, he led Big Mom back to where he started, and Queen attempted another attack on Big Mom. Afterwards, Big Mom regained her memories and fell asleep. Queen and most of his subordinates quickly took Big Mom on a ship heading for Onigashima, leaving Babanuki to lead the small remainder of the crew in the prison. With communications cut off, Luffy decided to take down Babanuki and his forces and take over the prison. Luffy excitedly took on the beast's pirates rushing to attack him as he worked to advance his Busushoku Haki at will. Babunuki then ordered the prisoners to help subdue Luffy and they obeyed his command. Luffy wondered why they were following Babunuki's orders and they replied that they had no hope in overcoming Kaido and Orochi, having tried and failed to rebel against them 20 years ago and losing everything in the process. Kawamatsu shouted from inside his cell encouraging Luffy to tell the prisoners about their hope. After Raizo freed Kawamatsu, Kiku came and forced the prisoners off of Luffy. Having reunited with Chopper and Kiku, who was revealed to have been born a boy, Luffy prepared to fight once more. Luffy and his group fought against the Beast's pirates, but they were soon cornered by prisoners who were infected by the mummy virus. Luffy fearlessly made contact with the infected carriers and ignited the prison spirit by showing that their agonizing infected situation was no different from their life as slaves in Udon, and he promised them that he and his group would liberate Wano country from Kaido's oppression. Babanuki prepared to use an excitement shell, but Luffy's advanced Kenbun Shokuhaki enabled him to stop Babanuki in time by tangling the trunk of his elephant, causing the shell to explode inside Babanuki's body. After the prison takeover, Luffy's condition worsened. As Chopper worked to treat him, Luffy reunited with Tama and Momonosuke. Luffy made Momonosuke angry by calling him useless. Chopper successfully developed a cure and treated Luffy and all those infected. Upon meeting the four Yakuza bosses, they threatened Luffy for speaking casually to Hyogoro, but Hyogoro vouched for him. As the day of the fire festival drew closer, Luffy continued training his Bosushoku Haki with Hyogoro supervising him. Luffy eventually learned how to use advanced Bosushoku Haki, and he returned to Amigasa Village with Tama and Chopper two days before the decisive battle. Luffy was excited to be given new armor by Hitetsu. He then wondered about Jinbei's fate, but he was certain that Jinbei would eventually arrive at Wano Country. On the day before the raid in Onigashima, Luffy spoke with Kinemon before the latter headed out with his group. Luffy later practiced his advanced Bosushoku Haki on a tree as he expressed eagerness to fight Kaido again. On the day of the Fire Festival, the Straw Hats, Heart Pirates, and Kid Pirates arrived at Port Tokage and entered the battle with the Beast's Pirates. After rescuing Kinemon's group, the Straw Hats were informed by the Beast's Pirates of how the rebels were prevented from gathering at Port Tokage and that Kaido formed an alliance with Big Mom. Undeterred, Luffy, Law, and Kid then destroyed a Beast's pirate ship together. Afterwards, Luffy was excited to see that Denjiro arrived along with all of Ninja Pirate Mink Samurai Alliance allies. While Kanjiro fled to Onigashima with Momonosuke, Luffy was shocked to learn that Kanjiro was a spy working for Orochi. After Momonosuke ordered the alliance to press forward without worrying about him, Luffy was impressed and promised to rescue Momonosuke. As the alliance was attacked by a beast pirate ship with long-range cannons, Luffy was overjoyed to see Jinbei arriving and joining the battle. With Jinbei officially part of the crew, the Straw Hats proceeded to take over the port in front of Onigashima. The crew then arrived at Onigashima with the rebels. After disembarking, Luffy received a beast pirate disguise from Kinemon. When the kid pirates went ahead into Onigashima, Luffy tried to follow them. 
While searching for Kid, Luffy became enraged when some Beasts Pirates members callously wasted some Oshiroku, remembering how happy Tama was to receive some. In a fit of rage, Luffy struck with them a Gear 3 attack. Zoro then found Luffy and berated him for causing a scene, but when Luffy explained his reasons, Zoro went along with him. During the ensuing chaos, the two Straw Hats were confronted by the surrounding Beast Pirates. Apu attacked and injured the duo with his Devil Fruit powers, forcing them to retreat. They were saved from Apu when Kid landed a surprise attack on his former ally. The situation became more chaotic as a number entered the fray. As Luffy, Zoro, Kid, and Killer ran to the castle, they were able to defend against Apu's next attack by covering their ears. As Luffy fought his way through inside Kaido's castle, he ran into Ulti and Page One. When Luffy said he was going to become the Pirate King, Ulti angrily responded that Kaido would take that title as she headbutted him. After a brief clash, Ulti managed to send Luffy crashing into the floor, but she sensed that he was unharmed, and so transformed into her Pachycephalosaurus hybrid form. Luffy emerged from his crater and rushed towards Ulti and Page One, and before he could react, he grabbed hold of Ulti's horns and used them to slam her into the ground before defeating Page One with Elephant Gun. Ulti then grabbed Luffy's arms and prepared to headbutt him in her hybrid form, while Luffy prepared to transform into his Gear 4. But Yamato rushed in and struck Ulti with his Kanabo. Yamato then picked Luffy up and ran away as the Beast Pirates began chasing after them. And he introduced himself to Luffy while trying to take him to a private spot. Luffy had no desire to meet with Yamato and so attacked him. But Yamato managed to counter his attacks before the duo engaged in a powerful and destructive clash. In the immediate aftermath of the clash, Yamato took Luffy to the attic and was able to get him to stay and talk for five minutes. As Yamato took off his mask and revealed his real appearance, he told Luffy about his devotion to Odin, and asked him to fight with him to achieve the legendary samurai's dream of opening Wano's borders. During their conversation, Yamato revealed to Luffy not only why he left Onigashima, despite him wanting to do so, but also his desire to sail with Luffy's crew. They then listened to Kaido's speech, but they fell out of the attic when the floor below them collapsed. Luffy urged Yamato to show him the way to Momonosuke before he could be executed. As they fought through the Beast's pirates, Luffy informed Yamato that Momonosuke and his retainers were alive the whole time. Luffy then removed Yamato's handcuffs and tossed them away before they detonated and caused a huge explosion that sent them flying to the performance stage. Even though Kaido and Momonosuke were in sight, Luffy waited for the scabbards to start the all-out attack. During the raid, Big Mom saw Luffy and confronted him again. When Big Mom mocked Luffy of his mission to bring Kaido down, Luffy stated his actual goal was to bring both of them down along with their followers in this all-out war. After Kaido transformed into his dragon form and took the scabbards with him to the roof of the Skull Dome, Luffy told Kinemon that he would catch up with them later. After Luffy watched Sanji assist Shinobu in freeing Momonosuke, he became worried when King drove Sanji through a wall. Luffy decided to have Yamato assist Shinobu in protecting Momonosuke. Big Mom then resumed her attack on Luffy, further enraged that Luffy had interfered too much lately with all the festivities she tried to enjoy. Luffy realized he had to deal with Big Mom first before he could deal with Kaido. As the battle at the live stage unfolded, Luffy told Shinobu to trust Yamato. He then attempted to jump to the roof of the Skull Dome along with Zoro, but Queen prevented their advance. When the other Straw Hats arrived, the crew assembled on the live stage. The samurai fought to open a path for the Straw Hats, but they struggled to bring one of the numbers down. So Zoro sliced its club and Jinbei saved some samurai from the falling piece while Luffy went on to attack the number with Gear 4. At this moment, he encountered Diaz Drake, who struck down another of the numbers. Afterwards, Drake offered to join forces with him. Unlike Zoro, Frankie, and Jinbei, Luffy immediately accepted Drake's help. As Luffy and Sanji rushed to reach Kaido, Apu tried to attack them, but they quickly covered their ears. When Hantra arrived, Sanji told Luffy to ignore him so they didn't waste time with a pointless fight. As they continued on, Sanji had to constantly keep Luffy from engaging in pointless fights. They were confronted by Briscola, but Jinbei arrived to aid them. After defeating Briscola, Jinbei offered to escort Luffy and Sanji to the roof. The trio reached the first level of the castle, and they got past two Shinuchis along the way. As they went through the third level, Sanji separated from Luffy and Jinbei. The two ran into rebels from Udon, and they built a ladder to the fourth level. At the fourth level, Luffy separated from Jinbei, who decided to remain on the floor to hold back Who's Who and his subordinates. At the fifth level, Luffy found that the Mink tribe had cleared his way to the roof. Once he arrived there, he joined up with Zoro, Law, Kid, and Killer as they prepared to fight Kaido and Big Mom. Luffy briefly ignored the two emperors to check up on Kinemon and his group, who were wounded but still alive. Luffy agreed to take Wano's fate upon his shoulders and asked Law to send the scabbard somewhere safe. After Law did so, Luffy dodged an attack by Kaido and struck back with a new and powerful Gear 3 attack called Gomu Gomu no Red Rock that made Kaido bleed. 
shocking both emperors. Kaido then struck back by attacking with his club. Luffy managed to avoid the full brunt of the attack, but was still grazed by Kaido. Big Mom attempted to attack Luffy with Prometheus, but Zoro stepped in and cut the sun homie in two. Kaido tried attacking Luffy again, but Law teleported Luffy to another spot. After Law berated Luffy for making it look like Law was taking orders from him, Luffy then challenged Law and Kid to a game of chicken when Big Mom launched an attack at the three captains. Not moving an inch, the three captains took the attack head on. They quickly recovered and attacked Kaido together, but the Emperor transformed and joined Big Mom in the sky, ready to launch a counterattack. Kaido then used a roar to unleash several wind blades on the five members of the worst generation. Luffy dodged them and struck Kaido with Gomu Gomu no Kong rifle, which injured him. Right after Killer got struck by Big Mom's Indra, Kaido tried to chomp on Killer, but Luffy kicked Kaido away with Rhino Schneider. Kaido prepared to use Bolo Breath on Luffy, but Zoro had Law teleport him in front of Kaido so he could defend Luffy by cutting Kaido's flames. Big Mom unleashed Tenmon Daijizai's Tenjin on Luffy and his allies. Luffy got struck but was unharmed due to his body being rubber. He then got hit by Kaido's Bolo Breath, but to Kaido's surprise, Luffy came out unscathed, claiming it was his guts that protected him. He then struck Kaido with Gomu Gomu no Kong Gatling. Eventually, Luffy got exhausted from the stress of using Gear 4 and reverted back, forcing Zoro to protect him from both Kaido and Big Mom's attacks. Luffy then watched as Kaido transformed into his human beast form. Luffy eventually recovered from the effects of Gear 4 and resumed fighting. Insisting that the attacks so far were being effective, Luffy kept stubbornly assaulting Kaido and Big Mom, who repeatedly struck him away as the other supernovas discussed a way to separate the two emperors. When Kaido and Big Mom prepared a devastating combined attack, Luffy was able to see into the future the range and scope of the shockwave, alerting the others about it. After Zoro managed to delay the attack for an instant and Law teleported everybody to safety, Luffy attempted to punch Kaido once more giddily noticing that the Emperor was weakened enough to start dodging attacks instead of enduring them, thus confirming his suspicions from before. Kaido countered Luffy's punch with a series of attacks of his own, managing to knock the Straw Hat Captain out. Like the prior confrontation at Kuri, Luffy kept glaring at Kaido even while unconscious, something that Kaido noted. Luffy didn't stay down for long, and in fact was able to deduce the secret behind Kaido's immense power and defenses after observing the Emperor's latest attack and reminiscing his own training with Hyogoro. Telling Kaido that he was fighting for his Wano friends and would refuse to submit to him, Luffy learned how to coat his body with Hao Shokuhaki, allowing him to defend and counterattack Kaido's strikes without even making contact with the Emperor. Confident now that he had a reliable way to hurt Kaido, Luffy declared to Law and an unconscious Zoro that he would defeat him. After Law left the battlefield with Zoro and Zeus, Kaido got up and, admitting that both he and Luffy were enjoying this fight, clashed once more with the Straw Hat Captain. However, Luffy lacked skill in his use of Haushoku coding and was soon overpowered and defeated by Kaido. The unconscious Luffy was thrown off the flying Onigashima and fell towards the sea. As he sunk into the depths, the Kaido disappointedly noted that Luffy was not able to become Joy Boy. However, as Luffy sunk into the sea, he used the voice of all things to transmit a message to Momonosuke, to tell his crew that he will be back and that he will win against Kaido. He also used it to call the Heart Pirates who were aboard the Polar Tang to come and rescue him. After they brought him into the ship and pushed the water out of his lungs, he awoke and began demanding meat. Having reached Tokage Port, even after Luffy ate the Heart Pirates' entire stock of food, he demanded more, which they fortunately managed to procure thanks to Caribou being nearby, with months worth of provisions stored within his swamp. As he ate, he reunited with a sobbing Momonosuke, who just recently landed on the mainland thanks to Shinobu's kite, and had not long ago witnessed Kiku and Kinemon fall before his eyes. Luffy told the boy to stop crying and to transform into his dragon form and fly him back to Onigashima. Thanks to Caribou's provisions, Luffy regained his strength back and was later amazed to see Momonosuke in his adult dragon form thanks to Shinobu's devil fruit powers, asking Momonosuke to fly to Onogashima and get another chance at beating Kaido. Still, Luffy was angry at Momonosuke's fear of heights, which in his eyes should be over now that he's become an adult dragon. Momonosuke then gradually overcame his fears descending towards Onigashima, with Luffy barely hanging onto his horn. They would both pass through several parts of the castle while leaving everybody in shock about a second dragon on Onigashima. When they finally reached the roof and spotted Kaido, Luffy was quick to transform into his Gear 4, Snake Man, and attack Kaido with Jet Culverin. 
unknowingly striking simultaneously with Yamato, who had been stalling Kaido the whole time. Upon noticing each other, the two were happy to see each other again at last. Shortly thereafter, Kaido transformed into his dragon form, preparing to face all three of them at once, with Luffy standing above Momonosuke, confirming his name and dream of becoming Pirate King when asked by Kaido. After Momonosuke barely dodged Kaido's attack, Luffy would then take over the first strike at Kaido, but not before telling Momonosuke to bite Kaido, hitting Kaido with Elephant Gun and sending him headfirst into the ground. When Kaido was preparing to attack Momonosuke after being bitten by the latter, Luffy came to Momonosuke's rescue, punching Kaido while using Haoshoku Infusion and sending him into the ground headfirst once again. Thanks to a hidden Mary on the roof, Luffy was able to transmit his message to all of Onigashima to declare that he would defeat Kaido, boosting the morale of his allies and crew. As Kaido transformed into his human beast form, the Emperor swung his kanabo, and Luffy met it with his punch, both of them infusing their attacks with Haoshoku Haki and clashing with enough force to split the sky above Onigashima, revealing the full moon previously hidden above it. Soon after the sky splitting clash, Luffy told Yamato to take Momonosuke and flee, wanting a chance to defeat Kaido 1v1. When Kaido attempted to stop them from retreating, Luffy restrained the Emperor by wrapping his legs around Kaido's neck. Both Luffy and Kaido then resumed their fight, once again using Haoshoku Infusion, trading blows with each other before Luffy sent Kaido back with his Gomu Gomu no Rock Gun, simultaneously falling back. However, both quickly got up, started laughing, and commented on the fight finally becoming fun. To Luffy's annoyance, Kaido would then start drinking alcohol, although he stated that he has to become stronger as he finally acknowledged Luffy's power. When Luffy attempted to strike at Kaido, the latter went through several stages of a special state called Shuron Hake due to his alcohol consumption. In his Wadai Jogo state, he dealt a severe blow to Luffy with Ragnarok that created a large crack in the roof of Onigashima. Kaido entered the Ochakomi Jogo mode in his dragon form and lamented over not being able to protect Onigashima and the time it would take to rebuild it before using Tatsumaki Kaifu on an approaching Luffy. He then shifted to his Naki Jogo state and returned to his hybrid form, crying as he prepared to use Rame Hake on Luffy. However, Luffy was successful in dodging this attack and landed a reverse Haoshoku infused kick on Kaido's chin. The Emperor, still crying profusely, grabbed Luffy's leg with his tail and attempted to headbutt him. The two combatants had a headbutt clash powered by Haoshoku Haki, with their foreheads not touching. Kaido won out the clash as Luffy remarked that Kaido's Haki was growing stronger as he was sent reeling. Kaido then entered the final stage of Shuran Hake, Okori Jogo, and angrily fired off two Boro breaths before he met Luffy's Gomugomudo Rock Gatling with Gondari Ryusei Gun. However, during the flurry of attacks, Luffy blocked the swing of Kaido's Hasakai with Haoshoku Haki and managed to strike the Emperor's abdomen with a Haoshoku infused kick, bolstered by Gear 2 and Gear 3, seemingly damaging Kaido significantly. When Big Mom was defeated, the two pirates were in the midst of a clash of Haki-infused attacks, with Luffy being pushed back. Sensing that Lin Lin lost her battle, Kaido emitted his Haoshoku Haki in rage, though Luffy expressed how impressed he was that Law and Kid managed to win. Kaido then recalled how the first two met, before entering his Naki Jogo mode and bursting into tears. Though Luffy responded by entering Gear 4 Snake Man and barraging Kaido with Gomu Gomu no Hydra, stating that Kaido's ambition meant nothing to him how this was his final Gear 4 and how he wasn't stopping till he drove the King of Beasts out of Wano. Kaido was seemingly unable to respond to the omnidirectional Hydra attack and contemplated how such an attack should be impossible due to the innate nature of rubber. As he slowly transitioned to his Amai Jogo mode, Kaido managed to escape the attack using Nusubito Jogo and Advanced Kenbon Shoku before transforming into his full beast form grabbing Luffy in his mouth and flying high into the sky. He then let go of Luffy before firing a point-blank bolo breath straight down, which blasted the Straw Hat Captain all the way through Onigashima. Thankfully, Luffy managed to only escape the attack by transitioning into his Bound Man form and flying back to the top of the island. He then got above Kaido and landed a Gomu Gomu no Over Kong gun on the Emperor, which disrupted the bolo breath the dragon was preparing to fire. However, Kaido quickly recovered, entering his hybrid form and using Satsuriki Jogo mode to floor Luffy with Horai Hake. With Luffy resolving to end this with one final hit, he quickly bounced back and charged at the Emperor with another Overkong gun. With Kaido dashing at him whilst preparing another Horai Hake, 
However, CP0 agent Guernica suddenly appeared and locked Luffy's attacking arm by grabbing onto it and using Tekai, allowing Kaido to knock the Straw Hat Captain down. Guernica escaped the strike, releasing just before the Emperor hit, whilst Kaido can only attack in despair as he relived another exciting battle being sabotaged by outside influences, just like during his duel against Odin leading to Luffy passing out and laying on the ground as Kaido descended towards the live floor after dealing with the Guernica. However, shortly afterwards, Luffy's body seemed to transform as he was seen smiling during the transformation. Luffy was then monologuing about how he could hear his heartbeat and still stand despite being defeated by Kaido. He then jumped into the air, being transformed into a new form, awakening his devil fruit while calling the new form Gear 5. In this form, he emitted a huge blast of House Shokohaki, taking out several beast pirates on the live floor before he enlarged his arm and grabbed Kaido in his entire dragon form, dragging him onto the rooftop. He then tightly wrapped his arm around Kaido, swinging him around before slamming him back and forth on the surface. Kaido then retaliated, shooting a bolo breath at Luffy. Luffy, however, grabbed the ground beneath him, turning it into rubber and thus reflected Kaido's attack at him while constantly laughing due to his devil fruit being awakened. Kaido then recovered and apologized for the CP0 agent's intervention, with Luffy accepting the apology and wanting to finish his fight with Kaido properly. While watching Luffy bouncing up and down, Kaido told him he awakened his devil fruit since he was turning the ground into rubber like himself, yet he felt like the transformation was akin to that of a Zoan fruit, which confused him. Nevertheless, he bit down on Luffy and swallowed him, only for Luffy to bounce around in his insides before using Gomu Gomu no Fusen to inflate both his and Kaido's body, causing him discomfort as the two floated up into the sky. Kaido tried to figure out how Luffy was able to make his body being like rubber just as Luffy was about to stretch his arms through Kaido's eyes to launch himself out of Kaido's body using Gomu Gomu no Dashutsu rocket, which caused additional discomfort to Kaido. Luffy then launched himself higher into the air and made himself a giant to step on Kaido, but Kaido evaded and chomped down on Luffy's torso. But Luffy grabbed his head and tail and started using him like a jump rope until Kaido used Bolo Breath to blast him far away. As Luffy recovered and ran back to him, Kaido changed into his hybrid form and struck Luffy with Kosanze Ragnaraku, slamming his head through the roof. As Luffy pulled his head back, Kaido remarked that their fight looked like something out of a picture book, but believed Luffy is at the end of his rope, which was confirmed when his awakened state wore off. Though Kaido himself fell to one knee, he told Luffy that after he died, he will tell everyone how valiantly he fought, but Luffy rejected this notion and changed back, assuring Kaido that he wasn't afraid of dying. Kaido managed to slam Luffy with Hasaikai a few times before Luffy bounced off a rock at Kaido while spinning his arms like a repeller. Kaido tried to block his attack while also trying to figure out what Luffy's power was, claiming no one is capable of taking him down, only to get punched straight through the face by Luffy and knocked onto his back. Kaido picked himself back up and asked Luffy who he was, to which Luffy answered that he was the one who will surpass him and become the Pirate King. Kaido acknowledged that Luffy still hasn't lost his spirit and how ridiculous his power was. He admitted he has lost a lot in this war, but believed Luffy has too, only for Luffy to retort that he'll take it all back. He used Gundari Ryusei gun on Luffy, but got hit multiple times by Luffy as well, whose punches stretched through him again. He then noticed smoke coming from the bottom of the roof and believed that the whole castle was on fire, and everyone would burn to death. But Luffy responded that he trusts his friends to handle the problem as Kaido fired a Kaifu attack that Luffy dodged. He then watched as Luffy grabbed a bolt of lightning with a smile on his face. Luffy used Gomu Gomu no Kaminari to throw the bolt of lightning at Kaido, but he sidestepped and slammed Luffy from the side, sending him flying far away again. Luffy used another lightning bolt to propel himself back to attack Kaido again, but he quickly dodged the attack and struck Luffy on the head. As he did so, he told Luffy that having a strong devil fruit isn't enough to conquer the seas. Roger himself didn't have one, yet he still became the Pirate King. And Kaido said that such hurdles can only be overcome with Haki, as he hit Luffy with Dai Toku Rame Hake, knocking him into the air again. However, Luffy grabbed Kaido while being past the storm clouds, and Kaido tried to shake Luffy off, first by hitting his arm with Hasaikai, then changing into his full dragon form to hit him with Tatsumaki Kaifu and Bolo Breath. His efforts were futile as not only did Luffy hang on, but inflated his other fist to a humongous size to finish Kaido off. Seeing Luffy's giant fist, Kaido decided to take it head on as he enveloped himself in fire, which finally caused Luffy to let go of him, a move Kaido said was the right call. He told Luffy that Odin was burned to death, and ever since then, the people of Wano desperately clinged into the hope their savior would come. He also told Luffy that his fist would never hit him because his fire would vaporize it. 
However, Luffy only retorted at Kaido that he now knew how to actually hurt him, thanks to Hyogoro's teaching at Udon, replying to Kaido that he would send him to the bottom of hell. Before Kaido met, Luffy's Gomu Gomu no Bajarangan with his Shoryu Kai and Hake. As they clashed, Kaido commended Luffy for coming so far, but believed he couldn't change the world. He did ask though what kind of world Luffy wanted to create, and he answered that he wanted to make a world where his friends could eat as much as they want, as his fist tore through Kaido's attack and punched Kaido so hard in the face, he got hurled deep into the ground in front of the flower capital before Luffy himself passed out midair from exhaustion due to the fight. As Kaido sank deeper into the ground and fell into a lava pit, Luffy exited out of Gear 5 and dropped from the sky, where he was caught by Yamato, who smiled and congratulated him and Momonosuke on their incredible feats. The impact from Kaido landing in the pit destabilized an underwater volcano, which caused it to erupt, catching Kaido and Big Mom, who had also fallen into the pit in the resulting explosion. A bandaged Luffy smiled as he was finally declared the winner of the final battle in the skies of Wano. Yamato caught Luffy as he fell and both he and Zoro were tended to by Chopper later on, but not before he told Momonosuke to not reveal his name to the people of Wano, as he would then be treated as a hero for defeating Kaido. A week later, both Luffy and Zoro woke up and immediately demanded meat and booze respectively. As the crew celebrated their recovery, Luffy was shocked to see Momonosuke in his adult form for the first time, after initially not recognizing him. After the crew learned that there was going to be a massive festival to celebrate Wano's liberation, Luffy became excited to hear of it and decided to go to the baths with his friends before partying. As promised, Momonosuke didn't reveal his name to Wano, so the citizens came to know him as Joy Boy, but believed he had already left the country. Luffy proceeded to enjoy the festival with his crew and the rest of the Ninja Pirate Mink Samurai Alliance, along with Law and Kid's crews as well. Luffy then called for a toast, celebrating the end of the long fight and the festival, when suddenly Kid barged in trying to attack him. Luffy didn't acknowledge his attack, however, and simply wrapped his arm around his fellow supernova as he continued to celebrate. Kid quickly shook Luffy off and showed him the day's newspaper, which contained the formal declaration of the new four emperors of the sea, Shanks, Blackbeard, Luffy, and Buggy, much to Luffy's shock. After Admiral Ryokugyu retreated from Wano when Shanks intimidated him with his Haoshokuhaki, we see Luffy, Zoro, Sanji, and Jinbei sitting and acknowledging the Admiral's departure, Momonosuke's braveness, and the strong hockey they felt. Sanji says that they didn't need to lend a hand after all, and Zoro asks about whose hockey that was. Luffy then says that a familiar face just popped up in his head. Yamato then approached them and stated his intention of not leaving with the Straw Hats, but staying on the island for their peace of mind, since with Kaido now gone, threats like Ryokugyu may appear more often. Luffy reluctantly agreed when Marco flew up to say goodbye, having found a ship close by, the Red Hair Pirates, who were willing to take him home. Luffy tried to give his thanks for helping him during the Summit War of Marineford, though Marco coolly shrugged it off, instead stating how proud Ace would be if he could see Luffy now, with the Straw Hat Captain grinning proudly at the praise. Later, Robin revealed that the ancient weapon Pluton was on the island, but Luffy had no interest in acquiring it. Tama then appeared with Shinobu, having become the Kunoichi's apprentice, with the girl requesting to join the crew if she was strong enough next time they met, with Luffy happily agreeing. A few days later, at Tokage Port, the Straw Hats decided to depart with Luffy, Kid, and Law, deciding to sail to separate islands as indicated by the three log pose needles. Law chose to go to the northeast, with Luffy and Kid drawing lots to go east, which Luffy lost, setting the Straw Hats heading to the southeast. Kid, while expressing his annoyance at the Emperors, started talking about Buggy's new crew, Cross Guild, which now has Crocodile and Dracula Mihawk supposedly under him, though Luffy heavily doubting this claim. Kid goes on to explain how Cross Guild was putting out bounties for Marines, now making them the hunted. After Kid received Poneglyph markings from Law, he and Killer started talking about looking for the man with the burn mark, which got Luffy's attention. As the Straw Hats prepared to depart, Momonosuke charged at them in his dragon form before tackling Luffy as a human. And though Kinemon started scolding the Straw Hat captain, the young Shogun broke down in tears, begging Luffy to stay. Luffy then had Usopp pass him a flag, which he, in turn, passed on to Momonosuke. He then stated that they were waiting for Momonosuke and knowing how childish he was on the inside, granted the Shogun his Jolly Roger, telling him that in times of strife, to think on their adventure, and if anyone came to pick a fight, to show them the flag, as it indicates that they are also picking a fight with the Straw Hat Pirates. They then set sail, but not before Luffy gave Kinemon, Momonosuke, and Yamato an open invitation to join his crew should they ever wish to become pirates. The Sunny and the Polar Tang set course to Mogura Port, 
where there's a gondola which could safely transport them to sea. However, after Kid taunted the other two captains for taking the safe route, Luffy and Law took control of their respective ships and, despite their crew's protests, sailed over the koi climbing waterfall with the Kid Pirates, with the resulting fall breaking one of the Sunny's looms. Egghead Arc once the Sunny landed at the bottom of Wano Country's waterfall and the Straw Hats recovered, Luffy was severely beaten by Nami and placed in a cage. He apologized for his reckless actions and pleaded to be let out. Later, Luffy was released and learned from the newspaper that Nefertari Vivi was missing. Her father, Nefertari Cobra, was dead and Sabo was credited with his killing. Luffy grew angry and distressed at this, proclaiming that Sabo would never do something like that and wanting to go to Mary Joaz to rescue Vivi. However, Zoro talked him down saying it would be foolish to attack the city and that they needed to let Vivi live her own life until they knew for sure it was necessary to act. Robin then revealed the news that Buggy was now one of the four emperors, which a surprise Luffy believed was a mistake. She offered to share more news regarding the other people Luffy knew, but Luffy declined unless it was truly bad. Luffy then reaffirmed Sabo's innocence and revealed the dream he had shared to Sabo and Ace 12 years ago. The revelation of this dream provoked a strong response from the Straw Hats, with reactions ranging from delighted laughter to stunned silence. However, everyone supported it and expressed the drive to find the final road poneglyph that would allow them to reach Laugh Tale. Days later, the Straw Hats entered a bitterly cold area as they drew closer towards their next island. Luffy saw a gigantic warm eddy and then noticed something inside of it, causing Zoro to cut it open. The strong winds blew Chopper overboard and Luffy stretched out to grab him, but was swept overboard as well. The mysterious figure then emerged from the eddy, revealing herself to be a child jewelry Bonnie. Luffy stretched out his other arm to grab Bonnie, but they were then attacked by a giant mecha shark living in the water, causing the three of them to fall into the ocean. Jinbei dove in to save them and was forced to take them deep down to escape the mecha shark. They made their way to a cave in the coast of the island where they dried their clothes and Bonnie explained to Luffy that she was a fellow member of the worst generation. Luffy wished to look for a restaurant to get food, but Bonnie said he wouldn't find one as this was the future island Egghead, which contained Vegapunk's laboratory. Bonnie revealed that she came here to take revenge on Vegapunk for turning her father into a mindless cyborg. Luffy, Chopper, Jinbei, and Bonnie ventured into the cave and accessed Egghead's surface via a ladder, where they found themselves surrounded by futuristic machines. However, Luffy found that a lot of the creatures and food around him were nothing more than holographic illusions. Atlas, a satellite of Vegapunk, then appeared and Luffy punched her to see if she was real, causing her to get angry and punch him back. However, he landed against the cooking machine which could make any food on demand which he, Chopper, and Bonnie gorged on. When Jinbei asked Atlas who she was, she responded that she was Vegapunk, which Luffy and Chopper took at face value. Once the group had eaten their fill, Atlas departed and Luffy discovered a machine which gave him new clothes. The rest of the group used the machine as well, but were then approached by a police pacifista which attacked them for using the cooking and clothing machines without paying. Luffy moved to launch a counterattack against it, but was kicked away by Bonnie, who believed that the pacifista was her father, Kuma. Knowing this wasn't the case, Luffy rushed to save her from its laser attack. Following the blast, Bonnie used her Devil Fruit ability to change everyone's ages, causing the pacifista to no longer recognize them. As they recovered, they talked with Bonnie about Kuma's past and how he came into the world government service. Luffy's group resumed exploring Egghead and came to the ruins of a very old mecha in a big scrap heap. While trying to get it to activate, a sudden burst happened as an old man, the original Vegapunk, appeared with half of his body inside the mecha due to a failed teleportation experiment. Luffy pulled him out and noticed that he was floating, which Vegapunk revealed was a function of the DOM shoes that they were all wearing. However, their attempts to activate this caused them to blast high into the air. Following this, Vegapunk explained more about himself to the pirates, including how he split his consciousness into six satellites, which included Atlas. Bonnie then tried attacking Vegapunk with his beam saber invention, but fainted after the beam attracted a horde of bugs. Vegapunk talked to Luffy about Momonosuke and his dragon transformation, revealing it was the result of his artificial devil fruit creation. Luffy then asked about the mecha, and Vegapunk revealed that it was the Iron Giant, which had been built 900 years ago and attacked Mary Joie's 200 years ago. Vegapunk then asked Luffy to take him off of Egghead. When Luffy asked why, Vegapunk revealed his main dream of creating a free and abundant energy source for the whole world, an energy which once powered the Iron Giant centuries ago. 
However, this research caused him to delve too deep into forbidden history, resulting in the world government now looking to eliminate him. Vegapunk then noted that CP0 was now on Egghead, and reiterated his request to sail with Luffy. Luffy agreed because he liked the scientist's funny looking head, and Vegapunk requested he take Bonnie to the Labo phase above the clouds before this area became a war zone, saying he would meet them up there as he suddenly disappeared into thin air. As Luffy's group started heading to the requested location, they ran into Rob Lucci, who had just taken down Atlas using Rokugan. Initially ambivalent toward Lucci, Luffy became angry upon seeing what had happened to Atlas due to Atlas giving him food, and activated Gear 5 to fight the CP0 agent. Lucci countered by activating his awakened Leopard Zoan form, and the two of them engaged in a fierce battle. In the midst of their sparring, Sentamaru arrived with the Seraphim S-Snake, S-Hawk, and S-Bear to counter CP0's invasion, but was struck down by Luchi while distractedly conversing with Luffy. Sentamaru managed to remain conscious to prevent CP0 from assuming control over the Seraphim, and Luffy used his environment and awakened abilities to keep Luchi away from him, overwhelming the CP0 agent. Sentamaru told Luffy to go and get Vegapunk off Egghead, and Luffy joined Chopper, Jinbei, and a now-conscious Bonnie as they took the vacuum rocket up to the Labo phase which they reached in seconds. Bonnie quickly raced into the Labo phase, still intent on getting revenge on Vegapunk, and Luffy and Chopper raced after her to stop her. He, Chopper, and Jinbei reunited with Nami, Usopp, Sanji, Robin, and Frankie, but lost track of Bonnie and Vegapunk in the process. Luffy and Chopper went to look for the two of them, but couldn't find them even after searching the entire Labo phase. Returning to the control room with the rest of the Straw Hats, all six of the Vegapunk satellites, and undercover CP0 agent slash Vegapunk ally Stussy, who had incapacitated Luchi and Kaku. Satellite Chaka noted that they had lost control over the Frontier Dome that protected the Labo phase from outside attack, meaning they were unable to get out of it. He told the group to do what they could to find the main Vegapunk, and as they all dispersed, Luffy remained in the room along with Zoro to recover from his exhaustion and watch over Luchi and Kaku. Originally able to hear everyone through a headset, the signal cut out, and Luffy went to Shaka to find out what was going on. Shaka revealed that the camera feeds around the Labo phase were being rapidly cut off, meaning there was an enemy on the loose inside the Labo phase. Zoro then called for help, and Luffy and Shaka raced to him to find S-Hawk and S-Bear had arrived. The two Seraphim began attacking despite Shaka's orders, making him realize that one of the Vegapunks had ordered them to attack. Now conscious, Luchi and Kaku proposed that Luffy and Zoro free them from their sea stone shackles so they could team up against the Seraphim, which the two Straw Hats found unappealing. Kaku promised they would go back in handcuffs once they were finished, and Luffy believed this, forcing Zoro to explain Kaku was lying. However, Luffy ultimately agreed to free them, saying he would beat them if they tried going after his friends. Luffy activated Gear 4 and he and Luchi performed a combined attack against S-Bear, while Zoro and Kaku attacked S-Hawk. Despite their powerful combined attacks, the Seraphim were able to get up little worse for wear. However, Zoro did notice that their physiologies were similar to King, who was a member of the rare Lunarian tribe. As the battle raged on, Shaka departed to join the search for the main Vegapunk. With the knowledge that the Seraphim strength was dependent on the flames on their back, Luffy's group moved to diminish those flames, to little initial success. S-Hawk then disappeared suddenly, and Lucha revealed that it was going to eliminate its weakest targets first. Zoro raced after it, and Luffy told Kaku to go with Zoro before turning his attention back to S-Bear. The following day, the culprit York was eventually found and outmatched by the Straw Hat pirates and their allies, who subdued and chained her to the ground. With Usopp and the others now unpetrified, due to Luffy mistaking S-Snake for Boa Hancock and asking her to undo her power, which she surprisingly agreed to due to her seeming affection for Luffy. The entire group then listened in on York's forced conversation with the five elders. After York had revealed she had been captured by the Straw Hats, surprising the elders and everyone else listening, Luffy stated while eating that he didn't fully understand the situation, but was prepared to use York as a shield against the Marines, prompting Bonnie to state that they were in a hostage situation. Luffy then introduced himself to the five elders and stated he and his crew were Vegapunk's allies, and that if they cared about York's safety, they should call off the Marine fleet at the shore, surprising everyone in the room. Just as he was about to tell the elders who was alive in the Labo phase with him, Robin stopped him from telling him too much. Luffy then apologized and asked him to nicely back down, with Usopp angrily telling him to quit dreaming. 
Later in the Labo phase, when Vegapunk talked to Nami about their next destination, Luffy and Usopp both got excited when Vegapunk stated that one of the needles Nami's log pose was pointing towards was leads to Elbaf. They then made plans with Vegapunk to escape Egghead using Vegaforce 01 to carry the Sunny over the Marine Fleet, and then use Coup de Burst to finish escaping. But first, they need to deactivate the Frontier Dome. When Vegapunk tasked Lilith with piloting the robot, Frankie, Luffy, and Bonnie went with her to the robot and the Sunny. With Lilith happy that she finally gets to leave the island, Luffy and Bonnie both stated that they would miss the food, but Luffy then told her that Sanji would just cook for them exciting Bonnie. When Luffy asked Bonnie why she's in such a good mood, she told him that she feels better now that she no longer wants Vegapunk dead. And we are now caught up, well, <laughs> until more chapters get released before this video gets edited, but we are fairly caught up to One Piece.